Section 10 of History of New England, 1630 to 1649. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of New England, 1630 to 1649 by John Winthrop. Section 10. From A Short Story of the Rise, Reign, and Ruin of the Antinomians. Footnote. The portion which we quote is on pages 59 to 66 of the original, pages 217 to 233 of Mr. C. F. Adams' Prince Society volume, Antinomianism in the Colony of Massachusetts Bay, Boston, 1894, in footnote. The reference in the last sentence is to the short story of the rise, reign, and ruin of the antinobians and libertines that infected the churches of New England, London, 1644, some extracts from which are here introduced. Although Savage maintained to the day of his death that the short story was the work of Thomas Weld, who from his Roxbury pastorate had gone to England in 1641 as agent of the colony, all other important authorities, Charles Dean, Samuel G. Drake, J. G. Pelfrey, Joseph B. Felt, and Charles Francis Adams assert confidently that it was a work of Winthrop, accepting the preface to which Thomas Weld signed his name. Mr. Adams in particular, who edited the document in 1894 for the Prince Society, appending to it two important papers, The Examination of Anne Hutchinson and The Trial of Mrs. Hutchinson Before the Church in Boston, treats the subject elaborately in his introduction, declaring that the short story is as much a part of the journal as the journey to the Hebrides is part of Boswell's Life of Samuel Johnson, and that separation is as inappropriate in one case as the other. In this edition, the conclusion of the scholars mentioned is accepted. Savage's persistent attribution of the authorship to Weld is to be regarded as a characteristic instance of that tenacity, which, though often serviceable, was sometimes perverted and ran into unreasonable obstinacy. The limits of this work forbid consideration of the question of the authorship of the short story, and also the printing of the document entire. We give only the more interesting and significant part, referring to the seeker for fuller knowledge to books easily found. The whole text of the short story can be best studied in C.F. Adams' reprint, where the contemporary tracts bearing upon the matter are also given. In the same author's three episodes of Massachusetts history, the case of Anne Hutchinson is again treated in the second division. Peter Oliver, Puritan Commonwealth, and Brooks Adams, Emancipation of Massachusetts, handle the subject without sympathy for the party in power, while the intolerant fathers receive at the hands of Palfrey treatment more judicial, and are sturdily championed by Henry M. Dexter, as to Roger Williams and his banishment from the Massachusetts plantation, and John A. Vinton, the antinomian controversy of 1637. A facsimile of the title page of the short story is given in the present volume. Mistress Hutchinson, being banished and confined till the season of the year might be fit and safe for her departure, she thought it now needless to conceal herself any longer, neither would Satan lose the opportunity of making choice of so fit an instrument, so long as any hope remained to attain his mischievous end in darkening the saving truth of Lord Jesus and disturbing the peace of his churches. Therefore she began now to discover all her mind to such as came to her, so that her opinions came abroad and began to take place among her old disciples, and now some of them raised up questions about the immortality of the soul, about the resurrection, about the morality of the Sabbath, and diverse others, which the elders finding to begin to appear in some of their churches they took much pains, both in public and private, to suppress. And following the scent from one to another, the root of all was found to be in Mistress Hutchinson, whereupon they resorted to her many times, laboring to convince her, but in vain. Yet they resorted to her still, to the end that they might either reclaim her from her errors, or that they might bear witness against them if occasion were. For in a meeting of the magistrates and elders, about suppressing these new-sprung errors, the elders of Boston had declared their readiness to deal with Mistress Hutchinson in a church way, if they had sufficient testimony. For though she had maintained some of them sometimes before them, Yet they thought it not so orderly to come in as witnesses, whereupon other of the elders, and others collecting which they had heard from her own mouth at several times, drew them in to several heads, and sent them to the church of Boston, whereupon the church, with leave of the magistrates, because she was a prisoner, sent for her to appear upon a lecture day, being the fifteenth of the first month, and though she were at her own house in the town, yet she came not into the assembly till the sermon and prayer were ended, pretending bodily infirmity. 
When she was come, one of the ruling elders called her forth before the assembly, which was very great from all parts of the country, and telling her the cause why the church had called her, read the several heads, which were as follows. 1. That the souls of all men, in regard of generation, are mortal like the beasts. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 8. 2. That in regard of Christ's purchase they are immortal, so that Christ hath purchased the souls of the wicked to eternal pain, and the souls of the elect to eternal peace. Third, those who are united to Christ have in this life new bodies and two bodies, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. She knows not how Jesus Christ should be united to this, our fleshly bodies. Fourth, those who have union with Christ shall not rise with the same fleshly bodies, 1 Corinthians fifteen forty four. Fifth, and that the resurrection mentioned there and in John five twenty eight is not meant of the resurrection of the body, but of our union here and after this life. Sixth, that there are no created graces in the saints after their union with Christ, but before there are, for Christ takes them out of their hands into his own. Seventh, there are no created graces in the human nature of Christ, but he was only acted by the power of the Godhead. Eighth, the image of God wherein Adam was made, she could see no scripture to warrant that it consisted in holiness, but conceived it to be in that he was made like to Christ's manhood. Ninth, she had no scripture to warrant that Christ's manhood is now in heaven, but the body of Christ is his church. Tenth, we are united to Christ with the same union that his humanity on earth was with the deity. John seventeen twenty one. Eleventh, she conceived the disciples before Christ's death were not converted. Matthew eighteen three. Twelfth, there is no evidence to be had of our good estate, either from absolute or conditional promises. Thirteenth, the law is no rule of life to a Christian. Fourteenth, there is no kingdom of heaven in scripture, but only Christ. Fifteenth, there is first engrafting into Christ before union, from which a man may fall away. Sixteenth, the first thing God reveals to assure us is our election. Seventeenth, that Abraham was not in the saving state till the 22nd chapter of Genesis, when he offered Isaac, and saving the firmness of God's election, he might have perished notwithstanding any work of grace that was wrought in him till then. Eighteenth, that union to Christ is not by faith. Nineteenth, that all commands in the word are law, and are not a way of life, and the command of faith is a law, and therefore killeth. She supposed it to be a law from Romans 3.27. Twentieth, that there is no faith of God's elect but assurance. There is no faith of the dependence, but such as a hypocrite may have and fall away from, proved John 15, for by that she said they are in Christ, but Christ is not in them. 21st, that a hypocrite may have Adam's righteousness and perish, and by that righteousness he is bound to the law, but in union with Christ, Christ comes to the man, and he retains the seed and dies, and then all manner of grace in himself, but all in Christ. 22nd, there is no such thing as inherent righteousness. 23rd, we are not bound to the law, no, not as a rule of life. 24th, we are dead to all acts and spiritual things and are only acted by Christ. 25th, not being bound to the law, it is not transgression against the law to sin or break it, because our sins, they are inward and spiritual, and so are exceedingly sinful and only are against Christ. 26th, Sanctification can be no evidence at all of our good estate. 27th, that our particular revelations about future events are as infallible as any part of Scripture, and that she is bound as much to believe them as a Scripture, for the same Holy Ghost is the author of them both. 28th, that so far as a man is in union with Christ, he can do no duties perfectly, and without the communion of the unregenerate part with the regenerate. 29th, that such exhortations as these, to work out our salvation with fear, to make our calling and election sure, etc., are spoken only to such as are under a covenant of works. All which she did acknowledge she had spoken, for a copy of them had been sent to her diverse days before, and the witness's hand subscribed, so as she saw it, it was in vain to deny them. Then she asked by what rule such an elder could come to her pretending to desire light, and indeed to entrap her, to which the same elder answered that he had been twice with her, and that he had told her indeed at St. Ives, that he had been troubled at some of her speeches in the court, wherein he did desire to see light for the ground and meaning of them, but he professed in the presence of the Lord that he came not to entrap her, but in compassion to her soul, to help her out of those snares of the devil, wherein he saw she was entangled, 
and that before his departure from her he did bear witness against her opinions and against her spirit and did leave it sadly upon her from the word of god and then presently she grew into passion against her pastor footnote john wilson in footnote for his speech against her at the court after the sentence was passed which he gave a full answer unto showing his zeal against her heirs whereupon she asked for what heirs she had been banished professing withal that she held none of these things she was now charged with before her imprisonment supposing that whatsoever should be found amiss would be imputed to that but it was answered as the truth was that she was not put to durance but only a favorable confinement so as all of her family and diverse others resorted to her at their pleasure but this allegation was then proved false and at her next convention more fully for there were diverse present who did not know she spake untruth her answer being demanded to the first article she maintained her assertion that the souls were mortal etc alleging the place in the ecclesiastes cited in the article in some other scriptures nothing to the purpose she insisted much that in genesis one in the day thou eatest etc thou shalt die she could not see how a soul could be immortally miserable though it might be eternally miserable neither could she distinguish between the soul and the life and though she were pressed by many scriptures and reasons alleged by the elders of the same and other churches so as she could not give any answer to them yet she stood to her opinion till at length a stranger footnote the stranger was probably the reverend john davenport at the time a guest of john cotton he came to new england in sixteen thirty seven reaching boston on the twenty sixth of june in the midst of the antinomian excitement he took an active part in the cambridge synod of the following september but in march sixteen thirty eight at the time of the occurrences of the events referred to in the text having perfected all his arrangements was about to migrate to connecticut in company with many of those who had come with him from england being in the language of cotton mather more fit for zebulon's ports than for issachar's tents c f adams in footnote being desired to speak to the point and he opening to her the difference between the soul and the life the first being a spiritual substance and the other the union of that with the body she then confessed she saw more light than before and so with some difficulty was brought to confess her error in that point wherein was to be observed that though he spake to very good purpose and so clearly convinced her as she could not gainsay yet it was evident she was convinced before but she could not give the honor of it to her own pastor or teacher nor to any of the other elders whom she had so much slighted then they proceeded to the third fourth and fifth articles about the body and the resurrection of the dead which she maintained according to the articles and though she was not able to give any reasonable answer to the many places of the scripture and other arguments which were brought to convince her yet she still persisted in her error giving froward speeches to some that spake to her as when one of the elders used this argument that if the resurrection were only our union with christ then all that are united are the children of the resurrection and therefore are neither to marry nor to give in marriage and so by consequence there ought to be a community of women she told him that he spake like the pharisees who said that christ had a devil because that abraham was dead and the prophets and yet he had said that those which eat his flesh should never die not taking the speech in the true meaning so did he said she who brought the argument for it is said there they should be like the angels etc the elders of boston finding her thus obstinate propounded to the church for an admonition to be given her to which all the church consented except two of her sons who because they persisted to defend her were under admonition also mr cotton gave the admonition and first to her sons laying it sadly upon them that they would give such way to their natural affection as for preserving her honor they should make a breach upon the honor of christ and upon their covenant with the church and withal tear the very bowels of their soul by hardening her in her sin in this admonition to her first he remembered her of the good way she was in at her first coming in helping to discover to diverse the false bottom they stood upon in trusting to legal works without christ then he showed her how by falling into these gross and fundamental errors she had lost the honor of her former service and done more wrong to christ and his church than formerly she had done good and so laid her sin to her conscience with much zeal and solemnity he admonished her also of the height of spirit then he spake to the sisters of the church and advised them to take heed of her opinions and to withhold all countenance and respects from her lest they should harden her in her sin so she was dismissed and appointed to appear again that day seven night 
The court had ordered that she should return to Roxbury again, but upon intimation that her spirit began to fall, she was permitted to remain at Mr. Cotton's house, where Davenport was also kept, who before her next appearing did both take much pains with her and prevailed so far that she did acknowledge her error in all the articles except the last, and accordingly she wrote down her answers to them all. When the day came, and she was called forth and the articles read again to her, she delivered in her answers in writing, which were also read, and being then willing to speak to the congregation for their further satisfaction, she did acknowledge that she had greatly erred, and that God had left her to herself wherein, because she had so much under-natured his ordinances, both in slighting the magistrates at the court and also the elders of the church, and confessed that when she was at the court she looked only at such failings as she apprehended the magistrates' proceedings, without having regard to the place they were in, and that the speeches she then used about her revelations were rash and without ground, and she desired the prayers of the church for her. Thus far she went on well, and the assembly conceived hope of her repentance, but in her answers to the several articles she gave no satisfaction, because in diverse of them she answered by circumlocutions, and seemed to lay all the faults in her expressions, which occasioned some of the elders to desire she might express herself more clearly, and for that ever she was demanded about the article, whether she were not, or had not been of that judgment, that there is no inherent righteousness in the saints, but those gifts and graces which are ascribed to them that are only in Christ as the subject, to which she answered, that she was never of that judgment, however by her expression she might seem to be so. And this she affirmed with such confidence as bred great astonishment in many, who had known the contrary, and diverse alleged her own sayings and reasonings, both before her confinement and since, which did manifest to all that were present, that she knew that she spake on truth, for it was proved that she had alleged that an essay, footnote, Isaiah, in footnote, 53, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, which he had maintained to be meant of a knowledge in Christ, and not in us. So likewise that in Galatians, footnote, chapter 2, verse 20, and footnote, I live by the faith of the Son of God, which he said was the faith of Christ, and not any faith inherent in us. Also that she had maintained that Christ is our sanctification in the same sort that he is our justification, and that she had said that she would not pray for grace, but for Christ, and that, when she had been pressed with the verse scriptures which spake of washing and creating a new heart, and writing the law in the heart, etc., she had denied that they did mean any sanctification in us. There were diverse women also with whom she had dealt about the same point, who, if their modesty had not restrained them, would have borne witness against her herein, as themselves after confessed. Wherefore the elders pressed her very earnestly to remember herself, and not to stand so obstinately to maintain so manifest an untruth, but she was deaf of that care, and would not acknowledge that she had been at any time of that judgment, howsoever her expressions were. Then Mr. Cotton told the assembly that whereas she had been formerly dealt with for matter of doctrine, he had, according to the duty of his place being the teacher of that church, proceeded against unto admonition, but now the case being altered, and she being in question for maintaining of untruth, which is matter of manners, he must leave the business to the pastor, Mr. Wilson, to go on with her, but withal declared his judgment in the case from that in Revelation 22, that such as make and maintain a lie ought to be cast out of the church. And whereas two or three pleaded that she might first have a second admonition, according to that in Titus chapter 3, verse 10, footnote, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, in footnote. He answered that that was only for such as erred in point of doctrine, but such as shall notoriously offend in matter of conversation, ought to be presently cast out, as he proved by Ananias and Sapphira, footnote, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, in footnote, and the incestuous Corinthian, footnote, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, in footnote, and as appears by that of Simon Magus, footnote, Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 24, in footnote. And for her own part, though she heard this, moved in her behalf, that she might have a further respite, yet she herself never desired it. So the pastor went on, and propounding it to the church, to know whether they were all agreed that she should be cast out, and a full consent appearing after the usual manner by their silence. After a convenient pause, he proceeded, and denounced the sentence of excommunication against her, 
and she was commanded to depart out of the assembly. In her going forth, one standing at the door said, The Lord sanctify this unto you, to whom she made answer, The Lord judgeth not if man judgeth, better to be cast out of the church than to deny Christ. Thus it hath pleased the Lord to have compassion of his poor churches here, and to discover this great impostor, an instrument of Satan, so fitted and trained to his service for interrupting the passage of the kingdom in this part of the world, and poisoning the churches here planted, as no story records the like of a woman, since that mentioned in the Revelation, it would make a large volume to lay down all passages, I will only observe some few, which were obvious to all that knew her course. First, in her entrance I observe, one, her entrance, two, her progress, three, her downfall. First, the foundation she laid was, or rather seemed to be, Christ and free grace. Second, rule she pretended to walk by was only the scripture. Third, the light to discern this rule was only the Holy Ghost. Fourth, the persons she conversed with were, for the most part, Christians in church covenant. Fifth, her ordinary talk was about the things of the kingdom of God. Sixth, her usual conversation was in the way of righteousness and kindness. Thus she entered and made up the first act of her course. In her progress, I observe, first, her success, she had in a short time insinuated herself into the hearts of many of the people, yea, of many of the most wise and godly, who grew into so reverent an esteem of her godliness and spiritual gifts as they looked at her as a prophetess, raised up of God for some great work now at hand, as the calling of the Jews, etc., so as she had more resort to her for counsel about matters of conscience and clearing up men's spiritual estates than any minister, I might say all the elders, in the country. Secondly, pride and a reigning of her spirit. First, in framing a new way of conversation and evidencing thereof, carried along in the distinction between the covenant of works, which she would have no otherwise differenced but by an immediate revelation of the Spirit. Second, in despising all, both elders and Christians, who went not her way, and laying them under a covenant of works. Third, in taking upon her infallibly to know the election of others, so as she would say, that if she had but one half hour's talk with a man, she would tell whether he were elect or not. Fourth, her impatience of opposition, which appears in diverse passages before. Thirdly, her skill and cunning to devise. First, in that she still pretended she was of Mr. Cotton's judgment in all things. Second, in covering her errors by doubtful expressions. Third, in shadowing the true end and abuse of her weekly meetings under the name of repeating Mr. Cotton's sermons. Fourth, in her method of practice to bring the conscience under a false terror by working that an argument of a covenant of works which no Christian can have comfort without viz of sanctification or qualifications, as she termed it. Fifth, in her confident profession of her own good estate and the clearness and comfort of it obtained in the same way of waiting for immediate revelation which she held out to others. In her downfall there may be observed the Lord's faithfulness in honoring and justifying his own ordinances. First, in that he made her to clear the justice of the court by confessing the vanity of her revelations, etc., and her sin in despising his ministers. Second, in that the judgment and sentence of the church hath concurred with that of the court in her rejection, so that she is cast out of both as an unworthy member of either. Third, the justice of God in giving her up to those delusions, and to that impudency in venting and maintaining them, as should bring her under that censure which, not long before, she had endeavored and expected to have brought upon some other who opposed her proceedings. Fourth, that she who is in such esteem in the church for soundness of judgment and sincerity of heart, but a few months before, should now come under admonition for many foul and fundamental errors, and after be cast out for notorious lying. Fifth, that she who is wont to be so confident of her spiritual good estate, and ready, undesired, to hold it forth to others, being pressed now at her last appearance before the church to give some proofs of it, should be wholly silent in that matter. Sixth, whereas upon the sentence of the court against her she boasted highly of her sufferings for Christ, etc., it was noted by one of the elders who bear witness against her errors that the spirit of glory promised in Peter, footnote, first Peter, chapter 3, verse 17, chapter 4, verse 14, in footnote, to those who suffer for well-doing did not come upon her, but a spirit of delusion and damnable air, 
which it has it had possessed her before, so it became more effectual and evident by her sufferings. Seventh, here is to be seen the presence of God and his ordinances, when they are faithfully attended according to his holy will, although not free from human infirmities. This American Jezebel kept her strength and reputation, even among the people of God, till the hand of civil justice laid hold on her, and then she began evidently to decline, and the faithful to be freed from her forgeries. And now in this last act, when she might have expected, as though most likely she did, by receiving repentance of her errors, and confessing her undervaluing of the ordinances of magistracy and ministracy, to have redeemed her reputation in point of sincerity, and yet have made good all her former work, and kept open a back door to have returned to her vomit again, by her paraphrastical retractions, and denying any change in her judgment, yet such was the presence and blessing of God in his own ordinance, that the subtlety of Satan was discovered to her utter shame and confusion, and to the setting at liberty of many godly hearts, that had been captivated by her to that day, and that church which by her means was brought under much infamy, and near to dissolution, was hereby sweetly repaired, and a hopeful way of establishment and her disassembled repentance clearly detected, God giving her up since the sentence of excommunication to that hardness of heart, as she is not affected with any remorse, but glories in it, and fears not the vengeance of God, which she lies under, as if God did work contrary to his own word, and loosed from heaven, while his church had bound upon the earth. Footnote. As to the accounts in the history and the short story, Mr. Adams remarks, the inference is strong that both accounts were prepared by the same hand, but while that in the short story was written at once and hurried off to England in some vessel then about to sail, that in the history was set down subsequently and more at leisure. This also would account for the greater warmth of expression in the short story, a thing not characteristic of Winthrop, in footnote. Winthrop's journal resumed. After this, many of the Church of Boston, being highly offended with the governor for this proceeding, footnote, the proceedings of the court against the Hutchinsonians, in footnote, were earnest with the elders to have called them to account for it, but they were not for it in it, and himself, understanding their intent, thought fit to prevent such a public disorder, and so took occasion to speak to the congregation to this effect. First, that if he had been called, etc., he would have desired, first, to have advised with the elders whether the church had power to call in question the proceedings of the civil court. Second, he would have consulted with the rest of the court whether he might discover the counsels of the court to this assembly. Third, though he knew that the elders and some others did know that the church could not inquire into the justice and proceedings of the court, etc., yet for the satisfaction of such as did not and were willing to be satisfied, he would declare his mind herein. Fourth, he showed that, if the church had such power, they must have it from Christ, but Christ had disclaimed it in his practice and by rule, as Luke blank, Matthew blank, and the scripture holds not out any rule or example for it, and though Christ's kingly power be in his church, yet that is not that kingly power whereby he is king of kings and lord of lords, for by that kings reign and princes, etc. It is true indeed that magistrates, as they are church members, are accountable to the church for their failings, but that is when they are out of their calling, for we have examples of the highest magistrates in the same kind as Uzziah, when he would go offer incense in the temple, the officers of the church called him to account and withstood him. But when Asa put a prophet in prison, and when Salem put out Abiathar from the priesthood, the one being a good act and the other ill, yet the officers of the church did not call either of them to account for it. If a magistrate shall in a private way take away a man's goods or his servants, etc., the church may call him to account for it, but if he doth thus in pursuing a course of justice, though the thing be unjust, yet he is not accountable, etc. Fifth, for himself he did nothing in the cases of the brethren, but by the advice and direction of our teacher and other of the elders. For in the oath which was administered to him and the rest, etc., there was inserted by his advice this clause, In all causes wherein you are to give your vote, etc., you are to give your vote, as in your judgment and conscience you shall see to be most for the public good, etc., and so for his part he was persuaded that it would be most for the glory of God and the public good to pass sentence as they did. Sixth, he would give them one reason, which was a ground for his judgment, and that was, for that he saw that those brethren, etc., 
were so divided from the rest of the country in their judgment and practice, as it could not stand with the public peace that they should continue against us. So by the example of Lot in Abraham's family, and after Hagar and Ishmael, he saw that they must be sent away. Footnote. Winthrop's justification of himself is interesting as coming from one naturally candid and gentle, who in a great strait in a fierce contest between liberal and illiberal minds, provides for the public good as well as he can according to his lights. In footnote. End of section 10. Section 11 of History of New England, 1630 to 1649. This is a LibriVox recordings. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of New England, 1630 to 1649, by John Winthrop. Section 11, 1638. Month 11, January. The church at Roxbury dealt with the verse of their members, who had their hands to the petition, and spent many days in public meetings to have brought them to see their sin in that, as also in the corrupt opinions which they held, but could not prevail with them. So they proceeded to two or three admonitions, and, when all was in vain, they cast them out of the church. In their dealing with them, they took some of them in plain lies and other foul distempers. Ninth, Diverse of the elders went to Weymouth to reconcile the differences between the people and Mr. Jenner, whom they had called thither with intent to have him their pastor. They had good success of their prayers. Thirteenth, about thirty persons of Boston going out in a fair day to Spectacle Island to cut wood, the town being in great want thereof. The next night the wind rose so high at northeast with snow, and after at northwest for two days, and then it froze so hard as the bay was all frozen up save a little channel. In this twelve of them got to the governor's garden, and seven more were carried in the ice in a small skiff out at Broad Sound, and kept among Brewster's rocks without food or fire two days. And then the wind forbearing, they got to pull in point to a little house there of Mr. Aspinwall's. Three of them got home the next day over the ice, but their hands and feet frozen. Some lost their fingers and toes, and one died. The rest went from Spectacle Island to the main, but two of them fell into the ice, yet recovered again. Footnote. Since most of the localities of Boston Harbor retained the old names, the story will be easily followed. In footnote. In this extremity of weather, a small pinnace was cast away upon Long Island by Natascott, but the men were saved and came home upon the ice. Sixteenth. The powder and arms of the country, which were kept at Boston, were, by order of the last court, carried to Roxbury and Newtown. This year a plantation was begun at Tecticut by a gentlewoman, an ancient maid, one Mrs. Poole. She went late thither, and endured much hardship, and lost much cattle, called after Taunton. Footnote. The foundress is still held in honor in Taunton. Another plantation was begun, and called Sandwich, about fifteen miles beyond Plymouth, towards Cape Cod, by many families which removed from Sagus, otherwise Lynn. Upon occasion of the centuries of the court, upon Mrs. Hutchinson and others, diverse other foul errors were discovered, which had been secretly carried by way of inquiry, but afterward maintained by Mrs. Hutchinson and others, and so many of Boston were tainted with them, as Mr. Cotton, finding how he had been abused, and made, as himself said, their stocking horse, for they pretended to hold nothing but what Mr. Cotton held, and himself did think the same, did spend most of his time, both publicly and privately, to discover those errors and to reduce such as were gone astray. And also the magistrates, calling together such of the elders as were near, did spend two days in consulting with them about the way to help the growing evils. Some of the secret opinions were these, that there is no inherent righteousness in a child of God, that neither absolute nor conditional promises belong to a Christian, that we are not bound to the law, not as a rule, etc., that the Sabbath is but as other days, that the soul is mortal till it be united to Christ, and then it is annihilated, and the body also, and a new given by Christ, that there is no resurrection of the body. Month 12, February. Diverse gentlemen and others, being joined in a military company, desired to be made a corporation, etc., but the council, considering, from the example of the Praetorian band among the Romans and the Templars in Europe, how dangerous it might be to erect a standing authority of military men, which might easily, in time, overthrow the civil power, thought fit to stop it betimes. 
yet they were allowed to be a company but subordinate to all authority. Footnote. Here we have the origin of the ancient and honorable artillery company, still a cherished and flourishing organization. In footnote. About this time the Indians, which were in our families, were much frightened with Habamak, as they called the devil, appearing to them in diverse shapes, and persuading them to forsake the English, and not to come at the assemblies, nor to learn to read, etc. 26. Mr. Pierce, in the Salem ship, The Desire, returned from the West Indies after seven months. He had been at Providence, footnote, in the Caribbean. We have here plain evidence of a trade in slaves, in footnote, and brought some cotton and tobacco and negroes, etc., from thence, and salt from Tertugos. Dry fish and strong liquors are the only commodities for those parts. He met there two men of war, set forth by the lords, etc., of Providence, footnote, see Ante, page 228, note 1, in footnote, with letters of Mart, who had taken diverse prizes from the Spaniard and many negroes. Month 1, March. While Mrs. Hutchinson continued at Roxbury, Diverse of the elders and others resorted to her, and finding her to persist in maintaining those gross errors before mentioned, and many others, to the number of thirty or thereabout, some of them wrote to the church at Boston, offering to make proof of the same before the church, etc. 15. Whereupon she was called, the magistrates being desired to give her license to come, and the lecture was appointed to begin at ten. The general court being then at Newtown, the governor and the treasurer being members of Boston, were permitted to come down, but the rest of the court continued at Newtown. When she appeared, the errors were read to her. The first was that the souls of men are mortal by generation, but after made immortal by Christ's purchase. This she maintained a long time, but at length she was so clearly convinced by reason and scripture, and the whole church agreeing that sufficient had been delivered for her conviction, that she yielded she had been in an error. Then they proceeded to three other errors. First, that there was no resurrection of these bodies, and that these bodies were not united to Christ, but every person united hath a new body, etc. These were also clearly confuted, but yet she held her own, so as the church, all but two of her sons, agreed she should be admonished, and because her sons would not agree to it, they were admonished also. Mr. Cotton pronounced the sentence of admonition with great solemnity, and with much zeal and detestation of her errors and pride of spirit. Footnote. Nothing in Cotton's life is so hard to excuse as his pronouncing sentence at this time upon Anne Hutchinson. Her affection for him brought her across the sea. It was under his ministrations that her ideas developed. While condemning the teaching of the ministers in general, she always made an exception of him. On his side, too, his sympathy with her was so strong that his standing had been much imperiled. It would be wrong to believe that in turning against her now he was selfishly thinking of himself. In his honest opinion, she had gone too far, endangering the material and spiritual welfare of her environment. The situation is full of pathos. The strong, well-purposed man, bound by many limitations, yearning no doubt toward the pupil he had molded, but alarmed at her perverseness, sits in the judgment seat confronting the enthusiast against whom the world is turning. Though many of her utterances are scarcely intelligible to modern readers, an occasional light breaks forth of wisdom before her age. She was brave, sincere, and possessed of womanly sweetness. The world will always with tender thoughts follow her sad fortunes to their tragic close. In footnote. The assembly continued till eight at night, and all did acknowledge the special presence of God's spirit therein, and she was appointed to appear again the next lecture day. While the general court sat, there came a letter directed to the court from John Green of Providence, who, not long before, had been imprisoned and fined for saying that the magistrates had usurped upon the power of Christ in his church, and had persecuted Mr. Williams and another, whom they had banished for disturbing the peace by divulging their opinions against the authority of the magistrates, etc. But upon his submission, etc., his fine was remitted, and now, by his letter, he retracted his former submission, and charged the court as he had done before. Now, because the court knew that diverse others of Providence were of the same ill affection to the court, and were probably suspected to be confederate in the same letter, the court ordered that if any of that plantation were found within our jurisdiction, he should be brought before one of the magistrates, and if he would not disclaim the charge in the said letter, he should be sent home, and charged to come no more into this jurisdiction upon pain of imprisonment and further censure. Footnote. From John Green was descended the revolutionary general Nathaniel Green. In footnote.
At this court, diverse of our chief military officers, who had declared themselves favorers of the familistical persons and opinions, were sent for, and being told that the court having some jealousy of them for the same, and therefore did desire some good satisfaction from them, they did ingenuously acknowledge how they had been deceived and misled by the pretense, which was held forth of advancing Christ and debasing the creature, etc., which since they have found to be otherwise, and that their opinions and practices tended to disturbances and delusions, and so blessed God, that had so timely discovered their error and danger to them. At this court a committee was appointed, of some magistrates, some ministers, and some others, to compile a body of fundamental laws. Also the elders, who had been requested to deliver their judgments concerning the law of adultery, about which three had been long kept in prison, returned their answer with the reasons thereof to this effect that if the law had been sufficiently published they ought to be put to death footnote the references to a law passed in october sixteen thirty one providing death for both parties in footnote whereupon the court considering that there had been some defect in that point and especially for that it had been oft questioned among the deputies and others whether that law were of force or not being made by the court of assistance by allowance of the general court Therefore it was thought safest that these three persons should be whipped and banished, and the law was confirmed and published. The castle island being found to be very chargeable to maintain the garrison there, and of little use, but only to have some command of ships, which should come hither with passengers, etc., there was appointed a committee to dispose of the ammunition there, etc. 22nd. Mrs. Hutchinson appeared again. She had been licensed by the court, in regard she had given hope of her repentance to be at Mr. Cotton's house, that both he and Mr. Davenport might have the more opportunity to deal with her. And the articles being again read to her, and her answer required, she delivered it in writing, wherein she made a retraction of near all, but with such explanations and circumstances as gave no satisfaction to the church, so as she was required to speak further to them. Then she declared that it was just with God to leave her to herself, as he had done, for her slighting his ordinances, both magistracy and ministry, and confessed that what she had spoken against the magistrates at the court by way of revelation was rash and ungrounded, and desired the church to pray for her. This gave the church good hope of her repentance, but when she was examined about some particulars, as that she had denied inherent righteousness, etc., she affirmed that it was never her judgment, and though it was proved by many testimonies that she had been of that judgment, and so had persisted, and maintained it by argument against diverse, yet she impudently persisted in her affirmation to the astonishment of all the assembly. So that, after much time and many arguments had been spent to bring her to see her sin, but all in vain, the church, with one consent, cast her out. Some moved to have her admonished once more, but, it being for manifest evil in matter of conversation, it was agreed otherwise, and for that reason also the sentence was denounced by the pastor, matter of manners belonging properly to his place. After she was excommunicated, her spirits, which seemed before to be somewhat dejected, revived again, and she gloried in her sufferings, saying that it was the greatest happiness, next to Christ, that ever befell her. Indeed, it was a happy day to the churches of Christ here, and to many poor souls, who had been seduced by her, who, by what they heard and saw that day, were, through the grace of God, brought off quite from her errors, and settled again in the truth. At this time the good providence of God so disposed, diverse of the congregation, being the chief men of the party, her husband being one, were gone to Naragneset to seek out a new place for plantation, and, taking liking of one in Plymouth patent, they went thither to have it granted them, but the magistrates there, knowing their spirit, gave them a denial, but consented they might buy of the Indians an island in the Naragneset Bay. Footnote. Here we find the beginnings of the colony of Rhode Island as distinguished from Providence, to which we have seen Roger Williams depart. In footnote. After two or three days, the governor sent a warrant to Mrs. Hutchinson to depart this jurisdiction before the last of this month, according to the order of the court, and for that end set her at liberty from her former constraint, so as she was not to go forth of her own house till her departure, and upon the twenty-eighth she went by water to her farm at the mount, where she was to take water, with Mr. Wheelwright's wife and family, to go to Pascataquack, but she changed her mind, and went by land to Providence, and so to the island in the Naragansett Bay, which her husband and the rest of that sect had purchased of the Indians, 
and prepared with all speed to remove unto. For the court had ordered that, except they were gone with their families by such a time, they should be summoned to the general court, etc. 30th. Mr. Davenport and Mr. Pruden, and a brother of Mr. Eaton, being ministers also, went by water to Quinepiac, and with them many families were removed out of this jurisdiction to plant in those parts, being much taken with the opinion of the fruitfulness of that place, and more safety, as they conceived, from danger of a general governor who is feared to be sent this summer, which, though it were a great weakening to these parts, yet we expected to see a good providence of God in it, for all possible means had been used to accommodate them here. Charlestown offered them largely, Newbury their whole town, the court any place which was free, both for possessing those parts which lay open for an enemy, and for strengthening our friends at Connecticut, and for making room here for many, who were expected out of England this year, and for diverting the thoughts and intentions of such in England as intended evils against us, whose designs might be frustrated by our scattering so far, as such as were now gone that way were as much in the eye of the state of England as we here. Footnote. New Haven must be distinguished from the enterprise of Hooker and Haynes at Hartford or Connecticut. In footnote. There came letters from Connecticut to the governor of the Massachusetts to desire advice from the magistrates and elders here about Siquin and the Indians of the river, who had, underhand, as was conceived, procured the Pequods to do that onslaught at Wethersfield the last year. The case fell out to be this. Sequin gave the English land there, upon contract that he might sit down by them and be protected, etc. When he came to Wethersfield and had set down his wigwam, they drave him away by force. Whereupon, he not being of strength to repair this injury by open force, he secretly draws in the Pequods. Such of the magistrates and elders as could meet on the sudden return this answer, viz., that if the case were thus, Sequin might, upon this injury first offered by them, write himself either by force or fraud, and that by the law of nations, and though the damage he had done them had been one hundred times more than what he had sustained from them, that it is not considerable in a point of just war, neither was he bound, upon such an open act of hostility publicly maintained, to seek satisfaction first in a peaceable way. It was enough that he had complained of it as an injury and breach of covenant. According to this advice, they proceeded and made a new agreement with the Indians of the river. Another plantation was now in hand at Maddox Skees, footnote, later Yarmouth, in footnote, six miles beyond Sandwich. The undertaker of this was one Mr. Bachelor, late pastor at Sagus, since called Lynn, being about seventy-six years of age, yet he walked thither on foot in a very hard season. He and his company, being all poor men, finding the difficulty, gave it over, and others t undertook it. 27th. The Indians of Block Island sent three men with ten fathom of wampum for part of their tribute. The wife of one William Dyer, a milliner in the New Exchange, a very proper and fair woman, and both of them notoriously infected with Mrs. Hutchinson's airs, and very censorious and troublesome, she being of a very proud spirit and much addicted to revelations, had been delivered of a child some few months before October 17th, and the child buried, being stillborn, and viewed of none but Mrs. Hutchinson and the midwife, one Hawkins' wife, a rank familist also, and another woman had glimpse of it, who, not being able to keep counsel, as the other two did, some rumor began to spread that the child was a monster. One of the elders, hearing of it, asked Mrs. Hutchinson when she was ready to depart, whereupon she told him how it was, and said she meant to have it chronicled, footnote, Public registration of births, marriages, and deaths was maintained in the Bay Colony with great care, in footnote, but excused her concealing of it till then, by advice, as she said, of Mr. Cotton, which coming to the governor's knowledge, he called another of the magistrates and that elder, and sent for the midwife, and examined her about it. At first she confessed only that the head was defective and misplaced, but being told that Mrs. Hutchinson had revealed all, and that he intended to have it taken up and viewed, she made this report of it, viz. It was a woman child, stillborn, about two months before the just time. Having life a few hours before, it came hipplings till she turned it. It was of ordinary bigness, it had a face but no head, and the ears stood upon the shoulders and were like an ape's. It had no forehead, but over the eyes four horns, hard and sharp. Two of them were above one inch long, and the other two shorter, the eyes standing out and the mouth also. 
The nose hooked upward, all over the breast and back, full of sharp pricks and scales like a thorn back. The navel and all the belly, with the distinction of the sex, were where the back should be, and the back and hips before, where the belly should have been. Behind, between the shoulders, it had two mouths, and in each of them a piece of red flesh sticking out. It had arms and legs as other children, but instead of toes, it had on each foot three claws like a young fowl with sharp talons. The governor, speaking with Mr. Cotton about it, he told him the reason why he advised them to conceal it. First, because he saw a providence of God in it, that the rest of the women who were coming and going in the time of her travail should then be absent. Second, he considered that, if it had been his own case, he would have desired to have it concealed. Third, he had known other monstrous births, which had been concealed, and that he thought God might intend only the instruction of the parents, and such other to whom it was known, etc. The like apology he made for himself in public, which was well accepted. Footnote. The repulsive notion that the displeasure of heaven was revealed by monstrous births was entertained by men of the best intelligence. In footnote. 2. April. The governor, with advice of some other of the magistrates and of the elders of Boston, caused the said monster to be taken up, and though it were much corrupted, yet most of those things were to be seen, as the horns and claws, the scales, etc. When it died in the mother's body, which was about two hours before the birth, the bed whereupon the mother lay did shake, and withal there was such a noisome savor, as most of the women were taken with extreme vomiting and purging, so as they were forced to depart, and others of them their children were taken with convulsions, which they never had seen before nor after, and so were sent for home, so as by these occasions it came to be concealed. Another thing observable was the discovery of it, which was just when Mrs. Hutchinson was cast out of the church. From Mrs. Dyer going forth with her, a stranger asked what young woman it was. The others answered, it was a woman which had the monster, which gave the first occasion to some that heard it to speak of it. The midwife, presently after this discovery, went out of the jurisdiction, and indeed it was time for her to be gone, for it was known that she used to give young women oil of mandrakes and other stuff to cause conception, and she grew into great suspicion to be a witch, for it was credibly reported that when she gave any medicines, for she practiced physic, she would ask the party if she did believe she could help her, etc. Another observable passage was that the father of this monster coming home at this very time was the next Lord's Day by an unexpected providence, questioned in the church for diverse monstrous heirs, as for denying all inherent righteousness, etc., which he maintained and was for the same admonished. Footnote. The putting to death of Mary Dyer at the Quakeress, who now in this sad fashion emerges into history, is the tragedy of a later time. Her execution took place in 1660. In footnote. 12. A general fast was kept through all the churches, by advice from the court, for seeking the Lord to prevent evil, that we feared to be intended against us from England by a general governor, for the safe arrival of our friends from thence, very many being expected, and for establishment of peace and truth amongst us. 21st. How Samakin, the sachem of Akuamek, on the side Connecticut, came to the governor and brought a present of eighteen skins of beaver from himself and the sachems of Mohegan beyond Connecticut and Packentucket. The occasion was, as he said, it was reported that we were angry with him and intended to war upon them, so they came to seek peace. The governor received the present, and having none of the other magistrates at hand to advise with, answered them that if they had done no wrong to the English, nor aided our enemies, we would be at peace with them, and accordingly signified so much to the magistrates at Connecticut. They took this answer well and departed with the letter. 23rd. This was a very hard winter. The snow lay from November 4th to March 23rd, half a yard deep about the Massachusetts, and a yard deep beyond Merrimack, and so the more north the deeper, and the spring was very backward. This day it did snow two hours together, after much rain from northeast, with flakes as great as shillings. This was in the year 1637. 24. The governor and deputy went to Concord to view some land for farms, and going down the river about four miles, they made choice of a place for 1,000 acres for each of them. They offered each other the first choice, but because the deputy's was first granted, and himself had store of land already, the deputy yielded him the choice. So, at the place where the deputy's land was to begin, 
There were two great stones, which they called the two brothers, in remembrance that they were brothers by their children's marriage, and stood so brotherly agree, and for that a little creek near these stones was to part their lands. At the court in that fourth month after, two hundred acres were added to the governor's park. Footnote. The two brothers still hold their place on the river bank. See photograph in Augustine Jones, Thomas Dudley. The reconciliation between Winthrop and Dudley seems to have been complete. In footnote. 26. Mr. Coddington, who had been an assistant from the first coming over of the government, being, with his wife, taken with familistical opinions, removed to Aquaday Island in the Naragnaset Bay. 3. May 2nd. At the court of elections, the former governor, John Winthrop, was chosen again. The same day, at night, he was taken with a sharp fever, which brought him near death. But many prayers were put up to the Lord for him, and he was restored again after one month. This court, the name of Newtown, was altered, and it was called Cambridge. Footnote. Savage estimates that there were forty or fifty Cambridge men dwelling in the colony, and not a few from Oxford. The college was established by order of the general court in October 1636. Reverend John Harvard died later in this year, 1638. The name Harvard College was bestowed in March 1639 in recognition of his bequest. In footnote, the spring was so cold that men were forced to plant their corn two or three times, for it rotted in the ground. But when we feared a great dearth, God sent a warm season, which brought on corn beyond expectation. 4. June 1. Between three and four in the afternoon, being clear warm weather, the wind westerly, there was a great earthquake. It came with a noise like a continued thunder or the rattling of coaches in London, but was presently gone. It was at Connecticut, at Narragansett, at Pascagaquack, and all of the parts round about. It shook the ships which rode in the harbor and all the islands, etc. The noise and the shakings continued about four minutes. The earth was unquiet twenty days after by times. 5th. Uncas, alias Okoko, the Mohegan Sachem in the twist of Pequod River. Footnote. The Mohegans lay west of the Pequot territory as the Naragnasets lay to the east. In footnote. Came to Boston with 37 men. He came from Connecticut with Mr. Haynes and tendered the governor a present of 20 fathom of wampum. This was at the court, and it was thought fit by the council to refuse it, till he had given satisfaction about the Pequods he kept, etc. Upon this he was much dejected, and made account we would have killed him, but two days after, having received good satisfaction of his innocency, etc., and he promised to submit to the order of the English touching the Pequods he had, and the differences between the Naragnasets and him, we accepted his present, and, about half an hour after, he came to the governor, and entertained him with these compliments. This heart, laying his hand upon his breast is not mine but yours i have no men they are all yours command me any difficult thing i will do it i will not believe any indian's words against the english if any man shall kill an englishman i will put him to death were he never so dear to me so the governor gave him a fair red coat and defrayed his and his men's diet and gave them corn to relieve them homeward and a letter of protection to all men etc and he departed very joyful Many ships arrived this year, with people of good quality and estate, notwithstanding the council's order, that none such should come without the king's license, but God so wrought that some obtained licenses and others came away without. The troubles which arose in Scotland about the Book of Common Prayer and the canons, which the king would have forced upon the Scotch churches, did so take up the king and council that they had neither heart nor leisure to look after the affairs of New England. Yet upon report of the many thousands which were preparing to come away, the archbishop caused all the ships to be stayed. But upon the petition of the masters and suggestion of the great damage it would be to the commonwealth in hindering the Newfoundland trade, which brought in much money, etc., they were presently released. And in this and other passages it plainly appeared that near all the lords of the council did favor this plantation, and all the officers of the custom house were very ready to further it, for they never made search for any goods, etc., but let men bring what they would without question or control. For sure the Lord awed their hearts, and they and others who savored not religion were amazed to see men of all conditions, rich and poor, servants and others, offering themselves so readily for New England when, for furnishing of other plantations, they were forced to send about their stalls, footnote, decoys, in footnote, 
and when they had gotten away, they were forced to keep them as prisoners from running away. Month 6th, August 3rd. In the night was a very great tempest, or hurricano, at southwest, which drove a ship on ground at Charleston, and brake down the windmill there, and did much other harm. It flowed twice in six hours, and about an aragneset, it raised the tide fourteen or fifteen foot above the ordinary spring tides upright. Janimo, the sachin of Neantic, footnote, the Neantics were a tribe near and closely allied to the Naragnesets, in territory towards which the English were now departing, in footnote, had gone to Long Island and rifled some of those Indians, which were tributaries to us. The Sachem complained to our friends of Connecticut, who wrote us about it, and sent Captain Mason with seven men to require satisfaction. The governor of the Massachusetts wrote also to Mr. Williams to treat with me and Tenema about satisfaction, or otherwise to bid them look for war. Upon this, Janimo went to Connecticut and made his peace and gave full satisfaction for all injuries. Two ships which came over this year much pestered, lost many passengers and some principal men, and many fell sick after they were landed, and many of them died. Four servants of Plymouth ran from their masters, and, coming to Providence, they killed an Indian. He escaped, after he was deadly wounded in the belly, and got to other Indians. So, being discovered, they fled and were taken at the Isle Aquaday. Footnote. Aquaday, Aquidneck, or Rhode Island, now becoming important as a seat of the new plantation beyond Providence. In footnote. Mr. Williams gave notice to the governor of Massachusetts and desired advice. He returned answer that, seeing they were of Plymouth, they should certify Plymouth of them, and if they would send for them, to deliver them. Otherwise, seeing no English had jurisdiction in the place where the murder was committed, neither had they at the island any government established, it would be safest to deliver the principal, who is certainly known to have killed the party, to the Indians his friends, with caution that they should not put him to torture, and to keep the other three to further consideration. After this, Plymouth men sent for them, but one had escaped, and the governor there wrote to the governor here for advice, especially for that he heard they intended to appeal into England. The governor returned answer of encouragement to proceed notwithstanding, seeing no appeal did lie, for that they could not be tried in England, and that the whole country here were interested in the case, and would expect to have justice done. Footnote. See Bradford, pages 344 to 346. The Plymouth governor at this time was Thomas Prince. In footnote whereupon they proceeded, as appears after. Many of Boston and others, who were of Mrs. Hutchinson's judgment and party, removed to the Isle of Aquaday, and others, who were of rigid separation and savored anabaptism, removed to Providence, so as those parts began to be well peopled. There came over the summer twenty ships and at least three thousand persons. Footnote, the immigration, which two years later suddenly ceased, was now at its height. In footnote, so as they were forced to look out new plantations. One was begun at Merrimack, and another four or five miles above Concord, and another at Winnicawit. The three prisoners, being brought to Plymouth, and there examined, did all confess their murder, and that they did it to get his wampum, etc. But all the question was about the death of the Indian, for no man could witness that he saw him dead. But Mr. Williams and Mr. James of Providence made oath that his wound is mortal, etc., at last two Indians, who, with much difficulty, were procured to come to the trial, for they still feared that the English were conspired to kill all the Indians, made oath after this manner viz, that if he were not dead of that wound, then they would suffer death. Upon this they three were condemned and executed. Two of them died very penitently, especially Arthur Peach, a young man of good parentage and fair condition, and who had done very good service against the Pequods. The fourth escaped to Pascataquack. The governor sent after him, but those of Pascataquack conveyed him away, and openly withstood his apprehension. It was their usual manner, some of them to countenance, etc., all such lewd persons as fled from us to them. 7. September. The general court was assembled, in which it was agreed that, whereas a very strict order was sent from the Lord's Commissioners for Plantations for the sending home our patent, upon pretense that judgment had passed against it upon a quo warranto, a letter should be written by the governor, in the name of the court, to excuse our not sending of it, for it was resolved to be best not to send it, because then such of our friends and others in England would conceive it to be surrendered, and that thereupon we should bound to receive such a governor, and such orders, as should be sent to us, in many bad minds, yea, and some weak ones among ourselves, would think it lawful, if not necessary, to accept a general governor. 
The copy of the letter is reserved, etc., in form of a petition. See the after folio 74. Footnote. It was important in this age that a charter should be beyond the control of the grantor, not lightly to be set aside, but only after quo warranto proceedings embarrassing to those in power. See Brooks Adams, Emancipation of Massachusetts, page 17. Winthrop refers to a page in a second notebook where Savage found nothing. In footnote. At this court, a law was made about such as should continue excommunicated six months, and for public thanksgiving for the arrival of the ships, and for the coming on of harvest beyond expectations, etc., this law was after repealed. At this court, also, Captain Underhill, being about to remove to Mr. Wheelwright, petitioned for three hundred acres of land promised him formerly, by occasion whereof he was questioned about some speeches he had used in the ship lately, in his returns out of England, viz., that he should say that we were zealous here, as the scribes and Pharisees were, and as Paul was before his conversion, etc., which he denying, they were proved to his face by a sober godly woman, whom he had seduced in the ship and drawn to his opinions, but she was after freed again. Among other passages, he told her how he came to his assurance, and that was thus. He had lain under a spirit of bondage in a legal way five years, and could get no assurance till at length, as he was taking a pipe of tobacco, the spirit set home an absolute promise of free grace, with such assurance and joy, as he never since doubted of his good estate, neither should he, though he should fall into sin. He would not confess or deny this, but took exceptions at the court for crediting one witness against him, etc., and withal said that he was still of the same opinion he had been, etc. Whereupon he was demanded if he were of the same opinion he had been in about the petition of remonstrance. He answered yes, and that this retraction was only of the manner, not of the matter. Whereupon his retraction, which he had lately delivered to the governor to be presented to this court, was read, wherein he professeth how the Lord had brought him to see his sin in condemning the court, and passing the bounds of modesty and submission, which is required in private persons, etc., and in what spirit of trouble he had been for it, etc. Upon this the court committed him for abusing the court with a show of retraction, and intending no such thing, and the next day he was called again and banished. The Lord's day following he made a speech in the assembly, showing that, as the Lord was pleased to convert Paul as he was in persecuting, etc., so he might manifest himself to him as he was taking the moderate use of the creature called tobacco. He professed withal that he knew not wherein he had deserved the sentence of the court, and that he was sure that Christ was his, etc. The elders reproved him for this speech, and Mr. Cotton told him that he break a rule in condemning publicly the magistrates of the court before he privately convinced the magistrates, or some of them, and told him also that although God doth often lay a man under a spirit of bondage when he is walking in sin as Paul was, yet he never sends such a spirit of comfort but in an ordinance, as he did to the same Paul by Ananias, and ergo advised him well to examine the revelation and joy which he had. The next Lord's Day the same Captain Underhill, having been privately dealt with upon suspicion of incontinency with a neighbor's wife and not hearkening to it, was publicly questioned and put under admonition. The matter was, for that woman being young and beautiful, and withal of a jovial spirit and behavior, he did daily frequent her house, and was diverse times found there alone with her, the door being locked on the inside. He confessed it was ill, because it had an appearance of evil in it, but his excuse was that the woman was in great trouble of mind and sore temptations, and that he resorted to her to comfort her, and that when the door was found locked upon them, they were in private prayer together. But this practice was clearly condemned also by the elders, affirming that it had not been of good report for any of them to have done the like, and that they ought, in such case, to have called in some brother or sister, and not to have locked the door, etc. They also declared that once he procured them to go visit her, telling her that she was in great trouble of mind, but when they came to her, taking her, it seems, upon the sudden, they perceived no such thing. Footnote. This passage makes it plain that the Hutchinsonian doctrines admitted of a perilous interpretation. John Underhill was a dangerous character in the community. As a successful soldier of the colony, he had great prestige, and his bad example would work evil. Being a subject of the covenant of grace, he made it a cloak for licentiousness. His acknowledgments of sin and professions of repentance were justly held in suspicion. He was long an object of fear in New England. In footnote. 
see the issue of this, 9, 1638, and 10, 1338. Mrs. Hutchinson, being removed to the Isle of Aquidae in the Ragnuset Bay, after her time was fulfilled, that she expected deliverance of a child, was delivered of a monstrous birth, which, being diversely related in the country, and in the open assembly at Boston upon a lecture day declared by Mr. Cotton to signify her error in denying inherent righteousness, but that all was Christ in us, and nothing of ours in our faith, love, etc. Hereupon the governor wrote to Mr. Clark, a physician and a preacher to those of the island, to know the certainty thereof. Footnote. The repulsive details which Winthrop took pains to gather are here omitted. They are not inaccessible, and they only show how far bigotry could carry a mind naturally noble and magnanimous. In footnote. 21. A ship of Barnstable arrived with about twenty passengers near all western people. There came with them a godly minister, one Mr. Matthews. Here arrived a small Spanish frigate with hides and tallow. She was a prize taken by Captain Newman, who was sent out with letters of mart by the lords, etc., of the Isle of Providence. Footnote. The context always shows, when Providence is named, whether the spot in New England or that in the Caribbean Sea is intended. See Ante, page 228, note 1, in footnote. This year there came a letter from Mr. Thomas Mutis, clerk of the council in England, directed to Mr. Winthrop, the present governor, and therein an order from the Lord's Commissioners for Foreign Plantations, being all of the council, wherein they straightly required that the patent be sent home by the first ship, etc. This letter and order were produced at the general court last past, and they agreed not to send home the patent, but to return answer to the lords by way of humble petition, which was drawn up and sent accordingly. These instruments are all among the governor's papers, and the effect of them would be here inserted. Footnote. See Hubbard's New England, pages 268 to 271 for their text, in footnote. Being the third day of the week, and two days before the change, the wind having blown at northeast all the day, and rainy in the night, was a mighty tempest, and withal the highest tide which had been since our coming into this country, but through the good providence of God it did little harm. About fourteen days after, the wind having been at northwest and then calm here, came in the greatest eastern sea which had been in our time. Mr. Pierce, who came in a week after, had that time a very great tempest three days at northeast. A remarkable providence appeared in a case, which was tried at the last court of assistance. Diverse neighbors of Lynn, by agreement, kept their cattle by turns. It fell out to the turn of one gillow to keep them, and, as he was driving them forth, another of these neighbors went along with him, and kept him so earnestly in talk that his cattle strayed and got in the corn. Then this other neighbor left him, and would not help him recover his cattle, but went and told another how he had kept gillow in talk that he might lose his cattle, etc., the cattle, gang it into the Indian corn, eat so much air they could be gotten out, that two of them fell sick of it, and one of them died presently, and these two cows were that neighbors who had kept Gillo and talk, etc. The man brings his action against Gillo for his cow, not knowing that he had witness of his speech, but Gillo, producing witnesses, etc., barred him of his action, and had good costs, etc. The court taking into consideration the great disorder general through this country and costliness of apparel, and following new fashions, sent for the elders of the churches, and conferred with them about it, and laid it upon them, as belonging to them, to redress it, by urging it upon the consciences of their people, which they promised to do. But little was done about it, for diverse of the elders' wives, etc., were in some measure partners in this general disorder. Aper, October. About two years since one Mr. Bernard, a minister at Batcombe in Somersire in England, sent over two books in writing, one to the magistrates, and the other to the elders, wherein he laid down arguments against the manner of our gathering our churches, etc., which the elders could not answer till this time, by reason of the many troubles about Mrs. Hutchinson's opinions, etc. Mr. Cotton also answered another book sent over in defense of set form of prayer. This, I suppose, was Mr. Ball's book. About this time was very much rain and snow, and six weeks together, scarce two days without rain or snow. This was observed by some as an effect of the earthquake. 9. November 8th. A church was gathered at Dedham with good approbation, and 28th Mr. Peck ordained teacher at Hingham. By order of the last general court, the governor wrote a letter to Mr. Burdett, footnote, Burdett was a minister who, finding the Salem atmosphere too strict, went north 
to Piscataqua, there joining Wigan, agent of the Puritans, Lord Sandbrook, who had the power of a governor thereabouts, in footnote. Mr. Wiggins and others of the plantation of Piscataquack to this effect, that whereas there had been good correspondency between us formerly, we could not be but sensible of their entertaining and countenancing, etc., some that we had cast out, etc., and that our purpose was to survey our utmost limits and make use of them. Mr. Burdett returned a scornful answer and would not give the governor his title, etc. This was very ill taken, for that he was one of our body and sworn to our government, and a member of the Church of Salem. So as the governor was purposed to summon him to appear at our court to answer his contempt, but advising with the deputy about it, he was dissuaded from it, the rather for that, if he should suffer in this cause, it would ingratiate him more with the archbishops, with whom he had intelligence, etc., but his counsel is rather to undermine him by making him thoroughly known, etc., to his friends in Pascataquack, and to take them from him. Whereupon the governor wrote to Edward Hilton, declaring his ill-dealing, and sent a copy of his letter, and advising them to take heed how they put themselves into his power, etc., but rather to give us a proof of their respect towards us, etc. He intimated withal how ill it would relish if they should advance Captain Underhill, whom we had thrust out for abusing the court with feigning a retraction both of his seditious practice and also of his corrupt opinions, and after denying it again and for casting reproach upon our churches, signifying withal that he was now found to have been an unclean person, for he was charged by a godly young woman to have solicited her chastity under pretense of Christian love, and to have confessed to her that he had his will oftentimes of the cooper's wife, and all out of strength of love. And the church had sent for him, and sent him a license to come and go, under the hands of the governor and deputy, but he refused to come, excusing himself by letters to the elders, that the license was not sufficient, etc., and by letters to the governor that he had no rule to come and answer to any offense except his banishment were released, but to the matter he was charged with he gave no answer but sought an evasion. Pascataquack men had chosen him their governor before the letter came to them. Thirteenth, the governor went by water to Salem, where he was entertained with all the respect that they could show him. The twelfth he returned by land, and they sent six of their chief military officers with carbines to guard him to Boston. Seventeenth, Roger Hurlicadin, footnote, This young magistrate, whose promise for usefulness was so prematurely blighted, was of noble lineage, his line running to the Plantagenets. His sister Maybell married John Haynes, governor of Massachusetts and Connecticut, from which union came a long and distinguished line. In footnote, one of our magistrates, about thirty years of age, second son of Blank, Earl Ackenden of Earls Colne and Essex, Esquire, died at Cambridge of the smallpox. He was a very godly man, and of good use both in the commonwealth and in the church. He was buried with military honor because he was a lieutenant colonel. He left behind a virtuous gentlewoman and two daughters. He died in great peace and left a sweet memorial behind him of his piety and virtue. 10. December 2nd. Ezekiel Rogers, son of Richard Rogers of Wethersfield and Essex, a worthy son of so worthy a father, lying at Boston with some who came out of Yorkshire with him, where he had been a painful preacher many years, being desirous to partake in the Lord's Supper with the Church of Boston, did first impart his desire to the elders, and having given them satisfaction, they acquainted the church with it, and before the sacrament, being called forth by the elders, he spoke to this effect, viz., that he and his company, viz. diverse families who came over with him this summer, had of a good time withdrawn themselves from the church communion of England, and that for many corruptions which were among them. But first he desired, that he might not be mistaken, as if he did condemn all there, for he did acknowledge a special presence of God there in three things. One, in the soundness of doctrine and all fundamental truths, two, in the excellency of ministerial gifts, third, in the blessing upon the same for the work of conversion for the power of religion, in all which there appeared more, etc., in England, than in all the known world besides. Yet there are such corruptions as, since God let them see some light therein, they could not, with safe conscience, join any longer with them. The first is their national church, second, their hierarchy, wholly anti-Christian, third, their dead service, fourth, their receiving, nay, compelling, all to partake of the seals, fifth, their abuse of excommunication, wherein they unwrap many a godly minister by causing him to pronounce their sentence, etc., they not knowing that the fear of excommunication lies in that. 
Hereupon they bewailed before the Lord their sinful partaking so long in those corruptions, and entered a covenant together, to walk together in all the ordinances, etc. Footnote. Ezekiel Rogers stood a powerful figure in the New England church. Rowley, of which he was the first minister, took its name from the Yorkshire village from which he came, and his influence was felt far and wide. He is especially commemorated in the Magnalia of Cotton Mather. The ensuing item of 1639 is inserted by Winthrop out of place to complete the story. In footnote, 1639, 10 December 3rd, being settled that rally, they renewed their church covenant, and their call blank of Mr. Rogers to the office of pastor according to the course of other churches, etc. 10 December 6. Dorothy Telby was hanged at Boston for murdering her own daughter, a child of three years old. She had been a member of the Church of Salem, and of good esteem for godliness, etc., but falling at difference with her husband through melancholy or spiritual delusions, she sometimes attempted to kill him and her children and herself by refusing meat, saying it was so revealed to her, etc. After much patience and diverse admonitions not prevailing, the church cast her out, whereupon she grew worse, so its magistrate caused her to be whipped, whereupon she was reformed for a time and carried herself more dutifully to her husband, etc., but soon after she was so possessed with Satan that he persuaded her, by his delusions which she listened to as revelations from God, to break the neck of her own child that she might free it from future misery. This she confessed upon her apprehension, yet at her arraignment she stood mute a good faith, till the governor told her she should be pressed to death, and then she confessed the indictment. When she was to receive judgment, she would not uncover her face nor stand up, but as she was forced, nor give any testimony of her repentance, either then or at her execution. The cloth, which should have covered her face, she plucked off and put between the rope and her neck. She desired to have been beheaded, giving this reason, that it was less shameful and less painful. After a swing or two, she catched at the ladder. Mr. Peter, of her late pastor, and Mr. Wilson went with her to the place of execution, but could do no good with her. Mr. Peter gave an exhortation to the people to take heed of revelations, etc., and of despising the ordinance of excommunication as she had done, for when it was to have been denounced against her, she turned her back, and would have gone forth if she had not been stayed by force. One Captain Newman, being set forth with commission from the Earl of Holland, governor of the Westminster Company, and the Earl of Warwick, and others of the same company, footnote, the company of the Isle of Providence, see pages 228, note 1, and footnote, to spoil the Spaniard within the limits of their grant in the West Indies, after he had taken many of their small vessels, etc., returned home by the Massachusetts in a small pinnace, with which he had taken all his prizes, for his great ship was of no use for that purpose. He brought many hides and much tallow. The hides he stole here for 17.10 pounds a score, the tallow at 20 shillings, the hundred, and set sail for England, he was after cast away at Christopher's with very rich prize in the great Hurricano, 1642. 13th. A general fast was kept upon the motion of the elders to the governor and council. The chief occasion was, the much sickness of pox and fever spread throughout the country, yet it was to the east and south also, the apparent decay of power of religion, and the general declining of professors to the world, etc., Mr. Cotton, in his exercise that day at Boston, did confess and bewail as the churches, so his own security, sloth, and credulity, whereupon so many and dangerous errors had gotten up and spread in the church, and he went over all the particulars, and showed how he came to be deceived, the errors being framed in words, so near the truths which he had preached, and the falsehood of the maintainers of them, who had usually denied to him what they had delivered to others, etc., he acknowledged that such as had been seducers of others, instancing in some of those of the island, though he named them not, had been justly banished. Yet he said that such as had been only misled and others, who had not done anything out of a misguided conscience, not being grossly evil, should be born withal, and first referred to the church, and that if that could not heal them, they should rather be imprisoned, fined, or etc., than banished, qua, it was likely no other church would receive them. Footnote. In this passage we see the mental suffering of Cotton. Such cases as that of Underhill no doubt appalled him, and he was driven to strictness. The concluding sentences show that his heart was tender towards those who wandered, and averse to severe discipline. In footnote, those who were gone with Mrs. Hutchinson to Aquaday fell into new errors daily. 
One Nicholas Easton, a tanner, taught that gifts and graces were the Antichrist mentioned Thessalonians, and that which withheld, etc., was the preaching of the law, and that every of the elect had the Holy Ghost and also the devil indwelling. Another, one Hearn, taught that women had no souls, and that Adam was not created in true holiness, etc., for then he could not have lost it. Those who went to the falls at Pascataquac gathered a church and wrote to our church to desire us to dismiss Mr. Wheelwright to them for an officer, but because he desired it not himself, the elders did not propound it. Soon after came his own letter with theirs for his dismission, which thereupon was granted. Others likewise, upon their request, were also dismissed thither. The governor's letter to Mr. Hilton about Mr. Burdett and Captain Underhill was by them intercepted and opened, and thereupon they wrote presently into England against us, discovering what they knew of our combination to resist any authority that should come out of England against us, etc., for they were extremely moved by the governor's letter, but could take no advantage by it, for he made account, when he wrote it, that Mr. Hilton would show it them. And upon this, Captain Underhill wrote a letter to Mr. Cotton, full of high and threatening words against us, but he wrote another, at the same time, to the governor in very fair terms, entreating an obliterating of all that was past, and a bearing with human infirmities, etc., disavowing all purposes of revenge, etc. The devil would never cease to disturb our peace and to raise up instruments one after another. Amongst the rest, there was a woman in Salem, one Oliver, his wife, who had suffered somewhat in England for refusing to bow at the name of Jesus, though otherwise she was conformable to all their orders. She was, for ability of speech and appearance of zeal and devotion, far before Mrs. Hutchinson, and so the fitter instrument to have done hurt, but that she was poor and had little acquaintance. She took offense at this, that she might not be admitted to the Lord's Supper without giving public satisfaction to the church of her faith, etc., and covenanting or professing to walk with them according to the rule of the gospel, so as upon the sacrament day she openly called for it and stood to plead her right, though she were denied, and would not forbear before the magistrate Mr. Endicott did threaten to send the constable to put her forth. This woman was brought to the court for disturbing the peace of the church, etc., and there she gave such peremptory answers as she was committed till she should find sureties for her good behavior. After she had been in prison three or four days, she made means to the governor and submitted herself and acknowledged her fault in disturbing the church, whereupon he took her husband's bond for her good behavior and discharged her out of prison. But he found after that she still held her former opinions, which were very dangerous as, one, that the church is the heads of the people, both magistrates and ministers, met together, and that these have power to ordain ministers, etc. Two, that all that dwell in the same town, and will profess their faith in Christ Jesus, ought to be received to the sacraments there, and that she was persuaded that, if Paul were at Salem, he would call all the inhabitants their saints. Three, that excommunication is no other but when Christians withdraw private communion from one that hath offended. About five years later, this woman was adjudged to be whipped for reproaching the magistrates. She stood without tying, and bare her punishment with a masculine spirit, glorying in her suffering. But after, when she came to consider the reproach, which would stick by here, etc., she was much dejected about it. She had a cleft stick put on her tongue half an hour for reproaching the elders. At Providence, also, the devil was not idle. For whereas, at their first coming thither, Mr. Williams and the rest did make an order that no man should be molested for his conscience. Now men's wives and children's and servants claim liberty hereby to go to all religious meetings, though never so often, or through private upon the weekdays, and because one baron refused to let his wife go to Mr. William so oft as she was called for, they were required to have him censured. But there stood up one Arnold, a witty man of their own company, and withstood it, telling them that, when he consented that order, he never intended it should extend to the breach of any ordinance of God, such as the subjection of wives to their husbands, etc., and gave diverse solid reasons against it. Then one Green, who hath married the wife of one beggarly, whose husband is living, and no divorce, etc., but only it was said that he had lived in adultery and had confessed it, he replied that, if they should restrain their wives, etc., all the women in the country would cry out of them, etc. Arnold answered to him thus, Did you pretend to leave the Massachusetts? because you would not offend God to please men, and you would now break an ordinance and commandment of God to please women? Some were of opinion that if Varon would not suffer his wife to have her liberty, 
the church should dispose her to some other man who would use her better. Arnold told them that it was not the woman's desire to go so off from home, but only Mr. Williams and others. In conclusion, when they would have censured Varon, Arnold told them, then it was against their own order, for Varon did that he did out of conscience, and their order was that no man should be censured for his conscience. Another plot the old serpent had against us by sowing jealousies and differences between us and our friends at Connecticut and also Plymouth. This latter was about our bounds. They had planted situate and had given out all the lands to Connie Hassett. We desired only so much of the marshes there as might accommodate Hingham, which being denied, we caused Charles River to be surveyed, and found it come so far southward as it would fetch and situate and more, but this was referred to a meeting between us. The differences between us and those of Connecticut were diverse, but the ground of all was their shyness of coming under our government, which, though we never intended to make them subordinate to us, yet they were very jealous, and therefore, in the Articles of Confederation, which we propounded to them, and whereby order was taken, that all differences which might fall out should be ended by way of peace, and never come to a necessity of, or danger of force, they did so alter the chief article, as all would have come to nothing. For whereas the article was, that upon any matter of difference, two, three, or more commissioners of every of the Confederate colony should assemble, and have absolute power, the greater number of them, to determine the matter, they would have them only to meet, and if they could agree so, if not, then to report to their several colonies, and to return with their advice, and so to go on till the matter might be agreed, which, besides that it would have been infinitely tedious and extremely chargeable, it would never have attained the end, for it was very unlikely that all the churches and all the plantations would ever have accorded upon the same propositions. Footnote. Though the relations of Connecticut with the parent colony were here inharmonious, the immigrants at first remembered with affection their old homes. Hartford was originally called Newtown, from whence most of the settlers were drawn. Windsor was Dorchester, and Westfield, Watertown. In footnote, these articles, with their alterations, they sent to our general court at Newtown, the blank of the fifth, by Mr. Haynes, Mr. Pinchion, and John Steele. The court, finding their alteration and the inconveniences thereof, would take the like liberty to add an altar, for the articles were drawn only by some of the council and never allowed by the court. This they accepted against, and would have restrained us of that liberty which they took themselves, and some of their three commissioners, falling in debate with some of our deputies, said that they would not meddle with anything that was within our limits, which being reported to the court, they thought it seasonable we should stand upon our right, so as, though we were formerly willing that Aguam, now Springfield, should have befallen into their government, yet seeing they would not be beholden to us for anything, we intended to keep it, and accordingly we put it in as an article, that the line between us should be one way the Pequod River, viz. south and north, and the other way, viz. east and west, the limits of our own grant. In this article we added, that we, etc., should have liberty passed to and fro upon Connecticut, and they likewise. To these articles all their commissioners offered to consent, but it was thought by our court, because of the new articles, that they should first acquaint their own court with it, and so their commissioners departed. After this, we understood that they went on to exercise the authority at Agawam. Footnote. Agawam, or Springfield, also the Indian name of Ipswich. Whereupon the governor wrote to them to desire them to forbear until the line was laid out with advice about some other things, as by the copy of the letter appears. After a long time, Mr. Ludlow, in the name of their court, returned answer, which was very harsh, and in fine declared that they had thought it not fit to treat any further before they had advice from the gentlemen of Saybrook, etc. The governor acquainted the council and magistrates with this letter, and because they had tied our hands in a manner from replying, he wrote a private letter to Mr. Haynes, whereupon he lays open their mistakes, as he called them, and the apparent causes of offense which they had given us, as by disclaiming to the Narragansetts to be bound by our former agreement with them, which they would never make till the wars were ended, by making a treaty of agreement with the Narragansetts and Monhegans without joining us or mentioning us to that end, though we had by letter given them liberty to take us in, and by binding all the Indians who had received any Pequods to pay tribute for them all to them at Connecticut, etc. All these things are clearly to be seen in the letters." These and the like miscarriages in point of correspondency were conceived to arise from these two errors in their government. One, they chose diverse scores of men, who had no learning nor judgment, which might fit them for those affairs, though otherwise men holy and religious. 
too, by occasion hereof, the main burden for managing of state business fell upon some one or other of their ministers, as the phrase and style of these letters will clearly discover, who, though they were men of singular wisdom and godliness, yet stepping out of their course, their actions wanted that blessing which otherwise might have been expected. Footnote. Savage's note here gives an idea of the care with which his transcript, adopted in the present edition, was made. These lines were so effectually erased that, for some years, my desire of deciphering them was baffled, but after twice abandoning the task, I gradually obtained, with the aid of a gentleman much skilled in reading difficult manuscripts, a sufficient confidence in all but one word. In footnote. August 28, 1638. In my letter to Mr. Hooker, I complain of three things. One, that they told the Naragnesets that they were not tied to the agreement we made with the Indians, and that they did this to advance their own reputation with the Indians and to abase ours, that it was a point of state policy in them not to dissent, while the war was at their doors, for they had need of our help, etc., that it was done without any pressing occasion, that it was done unseasonably, after their own commissioners had propounded that before the Indians we should in all things appear as one. Second, that they altered the Articles of Confederation in the most material point, and all because some preeminence was therein yielded to the Massachusetts, and being agreed, again, only referred to consent, etc., in three months we had no answer from them, that the way which they would have taken of referring differences to the churches would occasion infinite trouble and expense, and yet leave the issue to the sword. I expostulated about the unwarrantableness and unsafeness of referring matter of counsel or judicature to the body of the people, qua the best part is always the least, and of that best part the wiser part is always the lesser. The old law was, choose ye out judges, etc., and thou shalt bring the matter to the judge, etc. That they did still exercise jurisdiction at Egawam, though one of their commissioners disclaimed to intermeddle in our line, and thither we challenged our right, and it was agreed so, and I had wrote to them to desire them to forbear until, etc., that Mr. Pinchion had small encouragement to be under them, that if his relation were true, I could not see the justice of the proceeding against him, etc. That the end of my writing to him was that he might help quench these sparks of contention, that I did open our grievances with him in their most true and reasonable in intendment, that though I be strict for our right in public, qua their magistrates are so, yet I am willing to listen to advice, and my aim is a common good. Footnote. This passage was written by Winthrop in another part of the manuscript volume, but we are apparently warranted in treating it as a portion of the journal. The letter here summarized, though described as addressed to Hooker, not Haynes, is plainly a part of the correspondence missioned in the paragraph to which we have subjoined this extract. In footnote. Fifteenth. The wind at northeast, there was so great a tempest of wind and snow all the night and the next day, as had not been since our time. Five men and youths perished between Mattapan and Dorchester, and a man and a woman between Boston and Roxbury. Anthony Deck, in a bark of thirty tons, cast away upon the head of Cape Cod. Three were starved to death with the cold, and other two got some fire and so lived there, by such food as they saved seven weeks till an Indian found them, etc., Two vessels bound for Quinnipiac were cast away at Aquidae, but the people saved. Much other harm was done in staving of boats, etc., and by the great tides which exceeded all before. This happened the day after a general fast, which occasioned some of our ministers to stir us up to seek the Lord better, because he seemed to discountenance the means of reconciliation. Whereupon the next journal court, by advice of the elders, had agreed to keep another day, and to seek further the causes of such displeasure, etc., which accordingly was performed. End of section 11. Section 12 of History of New England, 1630 to 1649. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of New England, 1630 to 1649 by John Winthrop. Section 12, 1639. 11. January 14th. The earthquake, which had continued at times since the first of the fourth, was more generally felt, and the same noise heard in many places. 30. A church was gathered at Weymouth with approbation of the magistrates and elders. It is observable this church, having been gathered before, and so that of Lynn, could not hold together, nor could have any elders join or hold with them. The reason appeared to be because they did not begin according to the rule of the gospel 
which when Lin had found and humbled themselves for it, and began again upon a new foundation, they went on with a blessing. The people of this town of Weymouth had invited one Mr. Linthal to come to them, with intention to call him to be their minister. This man, though of good report in England, coming hither, was found to have drank in some of Mrs. Hutchinson's opinions, as of justification before faith, etc., and opposed the gathering of our churches in such a way of mutual stipulation as was practiced among us. From the former he was soon taken off upon conference with Mr. Cotton, but he stuck close to the other, that only baptism was the door of entrance into the church, etc., so as the common sort of people did eagerly embrace his opinions, and some labored to get such a church on foot as all baptized ones might communicate in without any further trial of them, etc. For this end they procured many hands in Weymouth to a blank, intending to have Mr. Linthal's advice to the frame of their call, and he likewise was very forward to become a minister to them in such a way, and did openly maintain the cause. But the magistrates, hearing of this disturbance and combination, thought it needful to stop it betimes, and ergo they called Mr. Linthal, and some of the chief of the faction, to the next general court in the first month, where Mr. Linthal, having before conferred with some of the magistrates and of the elders, and being convinced both of his error in judgment, and of his sin in practice to the disturbance of peace, etc., did openly and freely retract, with expression of much grief of heart for his offense, and did deliver his retraction in writing, under his hand, in the next open court, whereupon he was enjoined to appear at the next court, and in the meantime to make and deliver the like recantation in some public assembly at Weymouth. So the court stopped for any further censure by fine or etc., though it was much urged by some. At the same court, one smith was convicted and fined twenty pounds for being a chief stirrer in the business, and one Sylvester was disfranchised, and one Briton, who had spoken reproachfully of the answer, which was sent to Mr. Barnard, his book against our church covenant, and of some of our elders, and had sided with Mr. Linthal, etc., was openly whipped, because he had no estate to answer, etc. Month 1, March. A printing house was begun at Cambridge by one day, at the charge of Mr. Glover, who died on sea hitherward. The first thing which was printed was the Freeman's Oath, the next was an almanac made for New England by Mr. William Pierce, Mariner. The next was the Psalms newly turned into meter. Footnote. See R. F. Roden, The Cambridge Press, 1638 to 1692, New York, 1905. William Pierce, maker of the almanac, was the active and versatile captain of the Lion and other ships, which has been often mentioned. Though this was the first press of New England, the Spaniards had been printing in Mexico since 1539. In footnote. A plantation was begun by Sandwich, and was called Yarmouth, in Plymouth jurisdiction. Another plantation was begun upon the north side of Merrimack, called Sarisbury, now Colchester, footnote, now Salisbury, in footnote. Another at Winnicoet, called Hampton, which gave occasion of some difference between us and some of Pascatiquac, which grew thus. Mr. Wheelwright, being banished from us, gathered a company and sat down by the falls of Pascatiquac, and called their town Exeter, and for in their enlargement they dealt with an Indian there, and bought of him Winnicowit, etc., and then wrote to us what they had done, and that they intended to lot out all these lands and farms, except we could show a better title. They wrote also to those whom we had sent to plant Winnicowit to have them desist, etc. These letters coming to the general court, they returned answer, that they looked at this their dealing as against good neighborhood, religion, and common honesty, that, knowing we claimed Winnicawa as within our patent, or as vacuum domicilum, and had taken possession thereof by building an house there above two years since, they should now go and purchase an unknown title, and then come to inquire of our right. It was in the same letter also manifestly proved, that the Indians having only a natural right to so much land as they had or could improve, so as the rest of the country lay open to any that could and would improve it, as by the said letter more at large doth appear." In this year, when James Everall, a sober, discreet man, and two others, saw a great light in the night at Muddy River. Footnote. Muddy River became Brookline, Massachusetts. In footnote. When it stood still, it flamed up, and was about three yards square. When it ran, it was contracted into the figure of a swine. It ran as swift as an arrow towards Charlton, and so up and down about two or three hours. They were come down in their lighter about a mile, and when it was over, they found themselves carried quite back against the tide to the place they came from. 
Diverse other credible persons saw the same light after about the same place. The general court in the seventh month, September last, gave order to the governor to write to them of Pascataquac, to signify to them that we looked at it as an unneighborly part, that they should encourage in advance such as we had cast out from us for their offenses, because they had inquired of us the cause, etc. The occasion of this letter was that they had aided Mr. Wheelwright to begin a plantation there, and intended to make Captain Underhill their governor in the room of Mr. Burdett, who had thrust out Captain Wigan, set in there by the lords, etc. Upon this, Captain Underhill, being chosen governor there, wrote a letter to a young gentleman, who sojourned in the house of our governor, wherein he reviles the governor with reproachful terms and imprecations of vengeance upon us all. This letter being showed to the governor and council, the governor, by advice, wrote the letter to Edward Hilton, as is before mentioned, page blank, month thin, December 13th. The captain was so nettled with this letter, and especially because his adulterous life with the cooper's wife at Boston was now discovered, and the church had called him to come and make answer to it, but he made many excuses as want of liberty being a banished man, yet the governor and council had sent him a safe conduct, and upon his pretense of the insufficiency of that, the general court sent him another for three months. But, instead of coming, he procured a new church at Pascataquac of some few loose men, who had chosen one Mr. Knowles, footnote. This was Hansard Knowles, famous among the early Baptists, a Lincolnshire man of Cambridge training. He found a patron in the liberal Bishop Williams of Lincoln, through whom he obtained a living as a Church of England priest. Becoming a separatist, he fled to New England and appears in Winthrop's journal as minister of Dover on the Piscataqua. Returning to England after a few disturbed years of sojourn, he found the tolerant spirit of the commonwealth congenial. As schoolmaster and preacher, he was successful and obtained offices lucrative and influential. After the restoration, he was persecuted, undergoing banishment, imprisonment, and confiscation of property. He lived to the age of 92, preaching even when he could no longer stand and writing much. Though stigmatized as weak, he played a conspicuous part and was buried in Bunhill Fields with many other great nonconformists. See Gordon in the Dictionary of National Biography. He appears to poor advantage in Winthrop, who could hardly be a candid judge of such a man. In footnote, a weak minister lately come out of England and rejected by us for holding some of Mrs. Hutchinson's opinions, to write to our church in Boston in his commendation, wherein they style him the right worshipful, their honored governor, all which notwithstanding the church of Boston proceeded with him, and in the meantime the general court wrote to all the chief inhabitants of Pascataquack, and sent them a copy of his letters, wherein he professeth himself to be an instrument ordained of God for our ruin, to know whether it were with their privity and consent that he sent us such a defiance, etc., and whether they would maintain him in such practices against us, etc. Those of Pascataquack returned answer to us by several letters. Those of the plantation disclaimed to have any hand in his miscarriages, etc., and offered to call him to account, etc., whensoever we would send any to inform against him. The others at the river's mouth disclaimed likewise, and showed their indignation against him for his insolences, and their readiness to join in any fair course for our satisfaction. Only they desired us to have some compassion of him, and not to send any forces against him. After this, Captain Underhill's courage was abated, for the chiefest in the river fell from him, and the rest little regarded him, so as he wrote letters of retraction to diverse and to show his wisdom he wrote a letter to the deputy in the court, not mentioning the governor, wherein he sent the copies of some of the governor's letters to Pascataquack, supposing that something would appear in them either to extenuate his fault or to lay blame upon the governor. But he failed in both, for the governor was able to make good what he had written. Sixteenth. There is so violent a wind at south-south-east and south, as the like was not since we came into this land. It began in the evening and increased till midnight. It overturned some new strong houses, but the Lord miraculously preserved old wheat cottages. It tore down fences. People ran out of their houses in the night, etc. There came such a rain withal as raised the waters at Connecticut twenty feet above their meadows, etc. The Indians near Aquaday began powwowing in this tempest. The devil came and fetched away five of them. Quare. Footnote. Quare. Here is the interpolation of a later hand. In footnote. At Providence, things grew still worse, for a sister of Mrs. Hutchinson, the wife of one Scott, being infected with Anabaptistry and going last year to live at Providence, 
Mr. Williams was taken, or rather emboldened, by her to make open profession thereof, and accordingly was rebaptized by one holy man. Footnote. Ezekiel Holliman, one of eleven who founded the first Baptist church in America, a helper of Roger Williams and an honored man. Magistracy was not wholly rejected either in Providence Plantation or on Rhode Island, though government was in most particulars reduced to its lowest terms. In footnote, a poor man late of Salem. Then Mr. Williams rebaptized him and some ten more. They also denied the baptizing of infants and would have no magistrates. At Aquaday, also, Mrs. Hutchinson exercised publicly, and she and her party, some three or four families, would have no magistracy. She sent also an admonition to the Church of Boston, but the elders would not read it publicly because she was excommunicated. By these examples we may see how dangerous it is to slight the censures of the Church, for it was apparent that God had given them up to strange delusions. Those of Aquaday also had entertained two men, whom the Church of Roxbury had excommunicated, and one of them did exercise publicly there. For this the Church of Boston called in question such of them as were yet their members, and Mr. Coddington, being present, not freely acknowledging his sin, though he confessed himself in some fault, was solemnly admonished. This is further to be observed in the delusions which this people were taken with. Mrs. Hutchinson and some of her adherents happened to be at prayer when the earthquake was at Aquaday, etc., and the house being shaken thereby, they are persuaded and boasted of it, that the Holy Spirit did shake it in coming down upon them, as he did upon the apostles. 2nd, April. A plantation was begun between Ipswich and Newbury. The occasion was this. Mr. Eaton and Mr. Davenpoint, having determined to sit down at Quinnipiac, there came over one Mr. Ezekiel Rogers, footnote, Ezekiel Rogers, already mentioned, preferred Massachusetts to Quinnipiac, New Haven, founding Rowley as described, in footnote, second son of that truly faithful servant of God, Mr. Richard Rogers of Wethersfield in England, and with him some twenty families, godly men, and most of them of good estate. This Mr. Rogers, being a man of special note in England for his zeal, piety, and other parts, they labored by all means to draw with them to Quinnipiac, and had so far prevailed with him, being newly come, and unacquainted with the state of the country, as they had engaged him, yet being a very wise man, and considering that many of quality in England did depend upon his choice of a fit place for them, he agreed upon such propositions and cautions as, though they promised to fulfill them all, whereupon he sent diverse of his people thither before winter, yet when it came to, they were not able to make good what they had promised. Whereupon he consulted with the elders of the bay, and, by their advice, etc., holding his former engagement released, he and his people took that place by Ipswich, and because some farms had been granted by Ipswich and Newbury, which would be prejudicial to their plantation, they bought out the owners, dispersing therein about eight hundred pounds, and he sent a pinnace to Quinnipiac to fetch back the rest of his people, but Mr. Eaton and Mr. Davenport and others of Connecticut, being impatient of the loss of him and his people, stayed the pinnace and sent a messenger with letters of purpose to recover him again. This made him to desire the elders to assemble again, and he showed them the letters they sent, which wanted no arguments, though some truth. But he made the case so clear, by letters which had passed between them, etc., as they held him still free from all engagement, and so he returned to answer to them, and went on with his plantation. The Indians of Block Island sent for their tribute this year, Tin fathom of Wampampiac. One Mr. Howe of Lynn, a godly man and a deputy of the last general court after the court was ended, and he had dined, being in health as he used to be, went to pass over to Charleston, and being alone, he was presently after found dead upon the strand, being there, as it seemed, waiting for the boat, which came soon after. 3. May 2nd. Mr. Conn, preaching out of the 8th of Kings, 8, taught that when magistrates are forced to provide for the maintenance of ministers, etc., then the churches are in a declining condition. There he showed that the minister's maintenance should be by voluntary contribution, not by lands or revenues or tithes, for those have always been accompanied with pride, contention, and sloth, etc. Footnote. Cotton's adoption of congregationalism was gradual, but now he had been long thoroughly committed to his principles. In footnote. Eleventh. The two chief sachems of Naragneset sent the governor a present of thirty fathom of wampum, and Sequin, the sachem of Connecticut, sent ten fathom. 
At Aquaday, the people grew very tumultuous and put out Mr. Coddington and three other magistrates and chose Mr. William Hutchinson only, a man of a very mild temper and weak parts, and wholly guided by his wife, who had been the beginner of all the former troubles in the country and still continued to breed disturbance. Footnote. Probably William Hutchinson does not deserve such contemptuous treatment. Though no doubt less able and forceful than his wife, he stood by her loyally, as did their children. He had the respect of his neighbors, as this election to high office shows, and was the progenitor of one of the most illustrious of Massachusetts families. Savage, in a protracted note, gives reasons for doubting the accuracy of this picture of affairs in Aquaday. In footnote, they also gathered a church in a very disordered way, for they took some excommunicated persons and others who were members of the Church of Boston and not dismissed. 6. The two regiments in the bay were mustered at Boston to the number of 1,000 soldiers, able men, and well-armed and exercised. They were led, the one by the governor, who is general of all, and the other by the deputy, who is colonel, etc. The captains, etc., showed themselves very skillful and ready to in diverse sorts of skirmishes and other military actions, wherein they spent the whole day. Footnote. For an interesting contemporary account of the military organization of early Massachusetts, see Johnson, Wonderworking Providence, Book 3, Chapter 26. In footnote. One of Pascataquack, having opportunity to go into Mr. Bird at his study, and finding there the copy of his letter to the archbishops sent to the governor, which was to this effect, that he did delay to go into England because he would fully inform himself of the state of the people here in regard of allegiance and that it was not discipline that was now so much aimed at as sovereignty, and that it was accounted perjury and treason in our general courts to speak of appeals to the king. Footnote. The temper of the colonists is not misrepresented here. In footnote. The first ships which came this year brought him letters from the archbishops and the lord's commissioners for plantations, wherein they gave him thanks for his care of his majesty's service, etc., and that they would take a time to regress such disorders as he had informed them of, etc. But by reason of the much business now lay upon them, they could not at present accomplish his desire. These letters lay above fourteen days in the bay, and some moved the governor to open them, but himself and others of the council thought it not safe to meddle with them, nor would take any notice of them, and it fell out well by God's good providence, for the letters, by some means, were opened, yet without any of their privity or consent, and Mr. Burdett threatened to complain of it to the lords, and afterwards we had knowledge of the contents of them by some of his own friends. The governor received letters from Mr. Cradock, and in them another order from the lords' commissioners to this effect, that, whereas they had received our petition upon their former order, etc., by which they perceived that we were taken with some jealousies and fears of their intentions, etc., they did accept of our answer, and did now declare their intention to be only to regulate all plantations to be subordinate to the said commission, and that they meant to continue our liberties, etc., and therefore did now again preemptorily require the governor to send them our patent by the first ship, and that in the meantime they did give us, by that order, full power to go on in the government of the people until we had a new patent sent us, and withal they added threats of further course to be taken with us if we failed. This order being imparted to the next general court, some advised to return answer of it. Others thought fitter to make no answer at all, because, being sent in a private letter, and not delivered by a certain messenger, as a former order was, they could not proceed upon it, because they could not have any proof that it was delivered to the governor, and order was taken that Mr. Cradock's agents, who delivered the letter to the governor, etc., should, in his letters to his master, make no mention of the letters he delivered to the governor, seeing his master had not laid any charge upon him to that end. Mr. Haynes, the governor of Connecticut, and Mr. Hooker, etc., came into the bay and stayed near a month. It appeared by them that they were desirous to renew the Treaty of Confederation with us, and though themselves would not move it, yet by their means it was moved to our general court and accepted. For they were in some doubt of the Dutch, who had lately received a new governor, a more discreet and sober man than the former, footnote, the new Dutch governor was William Kieft, in footnote, and one who did complain much of the injury done to them at Connecticut, and was very forward to hold correspondency with us, and very inquisitive how things stood between us and them of Connecticut, which occasioned us the more readily to renew the former treaty, that the Dutch might not take notice of any breach or alienation between us. 22nd. The Court of Elections was, 
at which time there was a small eclipse of the sun. Mr. Winthrop was chosen governor again, though some laboring had been by some of the elders and others to have changed, not out of dislike of him, for they all loved and esteemed him, but out of their fear lest it might make way for having a governor for life, which some had propounded as most agreeable to God's institution and to the practice of all well-ordered states. But neither the governor nor any other attempted the thing, though some jealousies arose which were increased by two occasions. The first was, there being want of assistance, the governor and other magistrates thought fit, in the warrant for the court, to propound three, amongst which Mr. Downing, the governor's brother-in-law, footnote, Emmanuel Downing and his wife Lucy, sister of the governor, arrived shortly before and were properly held in great consideration, in footnote, was one which they conceived to be done to strengthen his party, and therefore, though he had known to be a very able man, etc., and one who had done many good offices for the country, for these ten years, let the people would not choose him. Another occasion of their jealousy was, the court, finding the number of deputies to be much increased by the addition of new plantations, thought fit for the ease both of the country and the court to reduce all towns to two deputies. On this occasion some to fear that the magistrates intended to make themselves stronger and the deputies weaker, and so in time to bring all power into the hands of the magistrates. So as the people in some towns were much displeased with their deputies for yielding to such an order. Whereupon, at the next session, it was propounded to have the number of deputies restored, and allegations were made that it was an infringement of their liberty, so as, after much debate, and such reason given for diminishing the number of deputies, and clearly proved that their liberty consisted not in the number, but in the thing, diverse of the deputies, who came with intent to reverse the last order, were, by force of reason, brought to uphold it, so that, when it was put to the vote, the last order for two deputies only was confirmed." Yet the next day a petition was brought to the court from the freemen of Roxbury to have the third deputy restored, whereupon the reasons of the court's proceeding were set down in writing, and all objections answered, and sent to such towns as were unsatisfied with this advice, that if any could take away those reasons, or bring us better for what they did desire, we should be ready at the next court to repeal the said order. The hands of some of the elders, learned and godly men, were to this petition, though suddenly drawn in, and without due consideration, for the lawfulness of it may well be questioned. For when the people have chosen men to be their rulers, and to make their laws, and bound themselves by oath to submit thereto, now combine together a lesser part of them in a public petition to have any order repealed, which is not repugnant to the law of God, savors of resisting an ordinance of God. For the people, having deputed others, have no power to make or alter laws, but are to be subject. And if any such order seem unlawful or inconvenient, they were better prefer some reasons, etc., to the court with manifestation of the desire to move them to a review than preemptorily to petition to have it repealed, which amounts to a plain reproof of those whom God hath set over them, and putting dishonor upon them against the tenor of the fifth commandment. There fell out of this court another occasion of increasing the people's jealousy of the magistrates, viz., one of the elders being present with those of his church, when they were to prepare their votes for the election, declared his judgment that a governor ought to be for his life, alleging for his authority the practice of all the best commonwealths in Europe, and especially that of Israel by God's own ordinance. But this was opposed by some other of the elders with much zeal, and so notice was taken of it by the people, not as a matter of dispute, but as if there had been some plot to put it in practice, which did occasion the deputies at the next session of this court to deliver in an order drawn to this effect, that, whereas our sovereign lord, King Charles, etc., had by his patent established a governor, deputy, and assistants, that therefore no person chosen a council of her life should have any authority as a magistrate, except he were chosen in the annual elections to one of the said places of magistracy established by the patent. This being thus bluntly tendered, no mention being made thereof before, the governor took time to consider of it before he would put it to vote. So when the court was risen, the magistrates advised of it, and drew up another order to this effect, that whereas at the court in blank it was ordered that a certain number of magistrates should be chosen to be a standing council for life, etc., whereupon some had gathered that we had erected a new order of magistrates not warranted by our patent, this court doth therefore declare that the intent of the order was that the standing council should always be chosen out of the magistrates, etc., and therefore it is now ordered that no such counselor shall have any power as a magistrate, nor shall do any act as a magistrate, 
etc., except he be annually chosen, etc., according to the patent, and this order was after passed by vote. That which led those of the council to yield to this desire of the deputies was, because it concerned themselves, and they did more study to remove these jealousies out of the people's heads, than to preserve any power or dignity to themselves above others. For till this court those of the council, viz. Mr. Endicott, had stood and executed as a magistrate, without any annual election, so they had been reputed by the elders and all the people till this present. But the order was drawn up in this form, that it might be of less observation and freer from any note of injury, to make this alteration rather by way of explanation of the fundamental order, than without any cause shown to repeal that which had been established by serious advice of the elders, and had been in practice two or three years without any inconvenience. And here may be observed how strictly the people would seem to stick to their patent, where they think it makes for their advantage, but are content to decline it, where it will not warrant such liberties as they have taken up without warrant from thence, as appears in their strife for three deputies, etc., when as the patent allows them none at all, but only by inference, etc., voting by proxies, etc. Footnote. At the court at which Vane was elected a council for life, appointed from the magistrates, was determined upon following a suggestion of Lord Say and Sell. Into this council were put Winthrop Dudley and a year later Endicott. Palfrey thinks this aristocratic innovation was set up in the hope of attracting over some high-born men, but it found no favor with the people and dropped out of the polity. Palfrey, History of New England, Volume 1, page 441, 555, and 614. In footnote. The governor acquainted the general court that, in these two last years of his government, he had received from the Indians in presence, to the value of about forty pounds, and that he had spent about twenty pounds in entertainments of them and in presents to their sachems, etc. The court declared that the presents were this governor's due, but the tribute was to be paid to the treasurer. Fifteenth. Mr. Endicott and Mr. Stoughton, commissioners for us, and Mr. Bradford and Mr. Winslow of Plymouth, met at Hingham about deciding the difference between us concerning our bounds. Our commissioners had full power to determine, etc., but theirs had not, although they had notice of it long before, and themselves had appointed the day. Whereupon the court ordered that those of Hingham should make use of all the land near Conyhasset, footnote, Conyhasset, now Cohasset. See Bradford's account of the dispute, History of Plymouth Plantation, pages 349 and 350, in footnote, to the creek near Situate, till the court should take further order, and a letter was directed to the governor of Plymouth to the same effect, with declaration of the reasons of our proceeding, and readiness to give them a further meeting. The charges of their commissioner's diet was defrayed to us, because they met us within our own jurisdiction. Those of Exeter replied to our answer, standing still to maintain the Indians' right and their interest thereby. But in the meantime, we had sent men to discover Merrimack, and found some part of it about Pincook, footnote, Pincook or Pinnacook, now Concord, New Hampshire, in footnote, to lie more northerly than forty-three and a half. So we returned answer to them that, though we would not relinquish our interest by priority of possession for any right they could have from the Indians, yet, seeing they had professed not to claim anything which should fall within our patent, we would look no further than that in respect of their claim. One Mr. Ryle, having gotten a patent at Sagadahak out of the Grand Patent, footnote, presumably the royal patent of April 3, 1639, by which Maine was granted to Gorgias, in footnote, wrote to our governor and tendered it to our government, so as we would send people to possess it. The governor acquainted the general court with it, but nothing was done about it, for we were not ready for such a business, having enough to do at home. 26. Mr. Hooker, being to preach at Cambridge, the governor and many others went to hear him, though the governor did very seldom go from his own congregation upon the Lord's Day. He preached in the afternoon, and having gone on, with much strength of voice and intention of spirit, about a quarter of an hour, he was at a stand and told the people that God had deprived him, both of his strength and matter, etc., and so went forth, and about half an hour after returned, and went on to very good purpose about two hours. There was about this time a very great drought all over the country, both east and west, there being little or no rain from the 26th of the 22nd month to the 10th of the 4th, so as the corn generally began to wither, and great fear there was it would all be lost. Whereupon the general court conferred with the elders, and agreed upon a day of humiliation about a week after, 
The very day after the fast was appointed, there fell a good shower, and within one week after the day of humiliation was passed, we had such store of rain, and so seasonably, as the corn revived and gave hope of a very plentiful harvest. When the court and the elders were met about it, they considered of such things as were amiss, which might provoke God against us, and agreed to acquaint their church therewith, that they might be stirred up to bewail and reform them. 4. June. We were much afraid this year of a stop in England, by reason of the complaints which had been sent against us, and the great displeasure which the archbishops and others, the commissioners for plantations, had conceived and uttered against us, both for those complaints and also for our not sending home our patent. But the Lord wrought for us beyond all expectation, for the petition which we returned in answer of the order sent for our patent was read before the lords and well accepted, as is before expressed, and ships came to us from England and diverse other parts with great store of people and provisions of all sorts. About this time our people came from Isle Sable. A bark went for them on the second of the first month, but by foul weather she was wrecked there, and of her ruins they made a small one wherein they returned. It was found to be a great error to send thither before the middle of the second month. They had gotten store of seal oils and skins, and some horse teeth and black fox skins, but the loss of the vessel, etc., overthrew the hope of the design. The island is very healthful and temperate. We lost not one man in two years, nor any sick, etc. 5. July. The rent at Connecticut grew greater, notwithstanding the great pains which had been taken for healing it, so as the church of Wethersfield itself was not only divided from the rest of the town, etc., but of those seven which were the church, four fell off, so as it was conceived, that thereby the church was dissolved, which occasioned the members of Watertown here, which had diverse of their members there not yet dismissed, to send two of their church to look after their members and to take order with them. But the contention and alienation of minds was such, as they could not bring them to any other accord than this, that the one party must remove to some other place, which they both consented to, but still the difficulty remained. For those three, who pretended themselves to be the church, pleaded that privilege for their stay, and the others alleged their multitude, etc., so as neither would give place, whereby it seemed that either they minded not the example of Abraham's offer to Lot, or else they wanted Abraham's spirit of peace and love. This controversy, having called in Mr. Davenport and others of Quillipiac for mediation, and they not according with those of Connecticut about the case, gave advantage to Satan to sow some seeds of contention between those plantations also. But, being godly and wise men on both parts, things were easily reconciled. In this month there arrived two ships at Quillipiac. One was of 350 tons, wherein came Mr. Finwick, footnote, George Finwick, a man of high birth, and fortune had, as a wife, Savage believes, a daughter of Sir Arthur Hasselrig, a statesman and soldier of much note in the English Commonwealth. His part in Connecticut was important, but his name fails of frequent mention, perhaps because of his return to England, where he attained distinction. See Hutchinson, History of Massachusetts Bay, Volume 1, page 100, in footnote and his lady and family to make a plantation at Saybrook upon the mouth of Connecticut. Two other plantations were begun beyond Quillipiac, and every plantation intended a peculiar government. There were also diverse new plantations begun this summer here and at Plymouth, as Colchester, footnote, Colchester soon became Salisbury, in footnote, upon Merrimack, Sudbury by Concord, Winnicowit was named Hampton, Yarmouth, and Barnstable by Cape Cod. Captain Underhill, having been dealt with and convinced of his great sin against God and the churches and state here, etc., returned to a better mind and wrote diverse letters to the governor and deputy, etc., bewailing his offenses and craving pardon. There was sent to the governor the copy of a letter written into England by Mr. Hansard Knowles of Pescataquack, wherein he had most falsely slandered this government as that it was worse than the high commission, etc., and that here was nothing but oppression, etc., and not so much as a face of religion. The governor acquainted one of Pascadequack, Mr. Knowles, his special friend, with it. Whereupon Mr. Knowles became very much perplexed and wrote to the governor, acknowledging the wrong he had done us and desired that his retraction might be published. Footnote. Hence, Knowles had grounds for criticism, as the journal shows. Retraction seems to have been common among these heretics and dissentients when brought to account but exile, prison, the bilbos, and the whip were terrifying penalties. In footnote, the governor sent his letter into England and kept a copy of it. At Providence matters went after the old manner. 
Mr. Williams and many of his company a few months since were in all haste rebaptized and denied communion with all others, and now he was come to question his second baptism, not being able to derive the authority of it from the apostles, otherwise than by the ministers of England, whom he judged to be ill authority, so as he conceived God would raise up some apostolic power. Therefore he bent himself that way, expecting, as was supposed, to become an apostle, and having, a little before, refused communion with all save his own wife. Now he had preached to and pray with all comers. Whereupon some of his followers left him and returned back from whence they went. 6. August 27th. Here came a small bark from the West Indies, one Captain Jackson in her, with commission from the Westminster Company to take prize, etc., from the Spaniard. He brought much wealth in money, plate, indigo, and sugar. He sold his indigo and sugar here for fourteen hundred pounds, wherein he furnished himself with commodities and departed again for the West Indies. A fishing trade was begun at Cape Ann by one Morris Thompson, a merchant of London, and an order was made that all stocks employed in fishing should be free from public charge for seven years. This was not done to encourage foreigners to set up fishing among us, for all the gains would be returned to the place where they dwelt, but to encourage our own people to set upon it, and an expectation that Mr. Thompson, etc., would ere long come settle with us. 7. September. Here was such store of exceeding large and fat mackerel upon our coast this season, as was a great benefit to all our plantations. Some one boat with three men would take, in a week, ten hogsheads, which was sold at Connecticut for 3.12 pounds, the hogshead. There were such swarms of small flies, like moths, come from the southward, that they covered the sea and came flying like drifts of snow, but none of them were seen upon the land. 7. September 17th. A church was gathered at the Mount, footnote, Mount Wollaston, in footnote. 4. At the general court at Boston, one Mr. Nathaniel Eaton, brother to the merchant at Quillipiac, footnote, i.e., to Theophilus Eaton of New Haven, in footnote, was convented and censured. The occasion was this. He was a schoolmaster and had many scholars, the sons of gentlemen and others of best note in the country, and had entertained one Nathaniel Briscoe and gentleman born to be his usher, and to do some other things for him, which might not be unfit for a scholar. He had not been with him above three days, but he fell out with him for a very small occasion, and with reproachful terms discharged him and turned him out of his doors. But it being then about eight of the clock after the Sabbath, he told him he should stay till next morning, and some words growing between them, he struck him and pulled him into his house. Briscoe defended himself and closed with him, and, being parted, he came in and went up to his chamber to lodge there. Mr. Eaton sent for the constable, who advised him first to admonish him, etc., and if he could not, by the power of a master, reform him, then he should complain to the magistrate. But when he caused his man to fetch him a cudgel, which was a walnut tree plant, big enough to have killed a horse, and a yard in length, and taking his two men with him, he went up to Briscoe, and caused his men to hold him till he had given him two hundred stripes about the head and shoulders, etc., and so kept him under blows, with some two or three short interventions about the space of two hours, about which time Mr. Shepherd and some others of the town came in at the outcry, and so he gave over. In this distress, Briscoe got out his knife and struck at the man that held him, but hurt him not. He also fell to prayer, supposing he should have been murdered, and then Mr. Eaton beat him for taking the name of God in vain. After this, Mr. Eaton and Mr. Shepherd, who knew not then of these passages, came to the governor and some other of the magistrates, complaining of Briscoe for his insolent speeches and for crying out murder and drawing his knife, and desired that he might be enjoined to a public acknowledgment, etc. The magistrates answered that they must first hear him speak, and then they would do as they should see cause. Mr. Eaton was displeased at this, and went away discontented, etc., and, being after called into the court to make answer to the information, which had been given by some who knew the truth of the case, and also to answer for his neglect and cruelty, and other ill usage toward his scholars, one of the elders, not suspecting such miscarriages by him, came to the governor, and showed himself much grieved, that he should be publicly produced, alleging that it would derogate from his authority and reverence among the scholars, etc. But the cause went on notwithstanding, and he was called, and these things laid to his charge in the open court. His answers were full of pride and disdain, telling the magistrates that they should not need to do anything herein, 
for he was intended to leave his employment. And being asked why he used such cruelty to Briscoe his usher, and to other his scholars, for it was testified by another of his ushers and diverse of his scholars, that he would give them between twenty and thirty stripes at a time, and would not leave till they had confessed what he required, his answer was that he had this rule, that he would not give over correcting till he had subdued the party to his will. Being also questioned about the ill and scant diet of his boarders, for though their friends gave large allowance, yet their diet was ordinarily nothing but porridge and pudding, and that very homely, he put it off to his wife. Footnote. Savage gives here a curious paper, apparently the confession of Mrs. Eden, detailing the hardships of old-time students. Of this we quote some portions. Quote, For the breakfast, then it was not so well ordered, the flour not so fine as it might, nor so well boiled or stirred at all times than it was so. It was my sin of neglect and want of that care that ought to have been in one that the Lord had entrusted with such a work. And that they had not so good or so much provision in my husband's absence as presence, I conceived it was, because he would call sometimes for butter or cheese, when I conceived there was no need of it, yet for as much as the scholars did otherwise apprehend, I desired to see the evil that was in the carriage of that as well as in the other, and to take shame to myself for it. And that they sent down for more, when they had not enough, and the maid should answer, if they had not, they should not, I must confess, that I have denied them cheese, when they have sent for it, and it have been in the house, for which I shall humbly beg pardon of them, and own the shame, and confess my sin. For the more, probably a slave, his lying in Sam, how sweet, and pillow beer, it had the truth in it. He did so one time, and it gave Sam Hugh just cause of offense, and that it was not prevented by my care and watchfulness, a desire to take the shame and the sorrow for it. For beer and bread, that it was denied them by me betwixt meals, truly I do not remember, that ever I did deny it unto them, and John Wilson will affirm that, generally, the bread and beer was free for the boarders to go unto. And for their wanting beer betwixt brewings, a week or half a week together, I am sorry that it was so at any time, and should tremble to have it so, were it in my hands to do it again. Hugh and Wilson, mentioned in the passage, were sons respectively of a magistrate and elder, and the institution was Harvard College. In footnote. So the court dismissed him at present, and commanded him to attend again the next day, when, being called, he was commanded to the lower end of the table, where all offenders do usually stand, and, being openly convict of all the former offenses, by the oaths of four or five witnesses, he yet continued to justify himself, so, it being near night, he was committed to the marshal till the next morning. When the court was set in the morning, many of the elders came into the court, it being then private for matter of consultation, and declared how, the evening before, they had taken pains with him to convince him of his faults, yet for diverse hours he had still stood to his justification, but in the end he was convinced, and had freely and fully acknowledged his sin, and that with tears, so as they did hope he had truly repented, and therefore desired of the court that he might be pardoned, and continued in his employment, alleging such further reasons as they thought fit. After the elders were departed, the court consulted about it, and sent for him, and there, in the open court, before a great assembly, he made a very wise, solid, eloquent, and serious-seeming confession, condemning himself in all the particulars, etc. Whereupon, being put aside, the court consulted privately about his sentence, and though many were taken with his confession, and none but had a charitable opinion of it, yet because of the scandal of religion and offense which would be given to such as might intend to send their children hither, they all agreed to censure him and put him from that employment. So being called in, the governor, after a short preface, etc., declared the sentence of the court to this effect, viz., that he should give Briscoe thirty pounds, find a hundred marks, and debarred teaching of children within our jurisdiction. A pause being made in expectation that, according to his former confession, he would have given glory to God and acknowledged the justice and clemency of the court, the governor giving him an occasion, by asking him if he ought to say, he turned away with a discontented look, saying, If sentence be passed, then it is no end to speak. Yet the court remitted his fine to twenty pounds, and willed Briscoe to take twenty pounds. The church at Cambridge, taking notice of these proceedings, intended to deal with him. The pastor moved the governor, if they might, without offense to the court, examine other witnesses. His answer was that the court would leave them to their own liberty, 
but he saw not to what end they should do it, seeing there had been five already upon oath, and those whom they should examine should speak without oath. And it was an ordinance of God that by the mouths of two or three witnesses every matter should be established. But he soon discovered himself, for ere the church could come to deal with him, he fled to Pascataquac, and, being pursued and apprehended by the governor there, he again acknowledged his great sin in flying, etc., and promised, as he was a Christian man, he would return with the messengers. But because his things he carried with him were aboard a bark there bound to Virginia, he desired leave to go fetch them, which they assented unto, and went with him, three of them, aboard with him. So he took his truss, and came away with them in the boat. But, being come to the shore, and two of them going out of the boat, he caused the boatsmen to put off the boat, and because the third man would not go out, he turned him into the water, where he had been drowned, if he had not saved himself by swimming. So he returned to the bark, and presently they sent sail, and went out to the harbor. Being thus gone, his creditors began to complain, and thereupon it was found that he was run in debt about a thousand pounds, and had taken up most of this money upon bills he had charged into England upon his brother's agents, and others whom he had no relation to. So his estate was seized and put into commissioners' hands to be divided among his creditors, allowing somewhat for the present maintenance of his wife and children. And being thus gone, the church proceeded and cast him out. He had been sometimes initiated among the Jesuits, and coming into England, his friends drew him from them, but it was very probable he now intended to return to them again, being at this time about thirty years of age and upwards. See after. September 17. Mount Wollaston had been formerly laid to Boston, but many poor men having lots assigned them there, and not being able to use those lands and dwell still in Boston, they petitioned the town first to have a minister there, and after to have leave to gather a church there, which the town at length, upon some small composition, gave way unto. So this day they gathered a church after the usual manner, and chose one Mr. Thompson, a very gracious, sincere man, and Mr. Flint, a godly man also, their ministers. Month 9, November. At a general court holding at Boston, great complaint was made of the oppression used in the country in sale of foreign commodities. And Mr. Robert Keane, footnote, Robert Keane, here disciplined for extortion, lived long in the colony, a rich and well-connected man. His daughter married a son of Thomas Dudley, and he himself was brother-in-law of John Wilson. Appeared again in the story, sometimes following into disfavor, though commonly a man well at the front. In footnote, who kept a shop in Boston, was notoriously above others observed and complained of, and being convicted, he was charged with many particulars, in some for taking above six pence in the shilling profit, in some above eight pence, and in some small things above two for one, and being here of convict, as appears by the records, he was fined two hundred pounds, which came thus to pass. The deputies considered a part of his fine and set it at two hundred pounds. The magistrates agreed but to one hundred pounds. So the court being divided, at length it was agreed that his fine should be two hundred pounds, but he should pay but one hundred pounds, and the other should be respited to the further consideration of the next general court. By this means the magistrates and deputies were brought to an accord, which otherwise had been not likely, and so much trouble might have grown, and the offender escaped censure. For the cry of the country was so great against oppression, and some of the elders and magistrates had declared such detestation of the corrupt practices of this man, which was the more observable because he was wealthy and sold dearer than most other tradesmen, and for that he was of ill report for the light covetous practice in England, that incensed the deputies very much against him. And sure the course was very evil, a special circumstances considered, one, he being an ancient professor of the gospel, two, a man of eminent parts, three, wealthy and having but one child, fourth, having come over for conscience sake and for the advancement of the gospel here, fifth, having been formerly dealt with and admonished both by private friends and also by some of the magistrates and elders, and having promised reformation, being a member of a church and commonwealth now in their infancy, and under the curious observation of all churches and civil states in the world. These added much aggravation to his sin in the judgment of all men of understanding. Yet most of the magistrates, though they discerned of the offense clothed with all the circumstances, would have been more moderate in their censure. First, because there was no law enforced to limit or direct men in point of profit in their trade. Second, because it is the common practice in all countries for men to make use of advantages for raising the prices of their commodities. 
3. Because, though he were chiefly aimed at, yet he was not alone in this fault. 4. Because all men through the country, in sale of cattle, corn, labor, etc., were guilty of the like excess in prices. 5. Because a certain rule could not be found out for an equal rate between buyer and seller, though much labor had been bestowed in it, and diverse laws had been made which upon experience were repealed as being neither safe nor equal. Lastly, and especially because the law of God appoints no other punishment but double restitution, and in some cases, as where the offender freely confesses and brings his offerings, only half added to the principal. After the court had censured him, the Church of Boston called him also in question, where, as before he had done in the court, he did with tears acknowledge and bewail his covetous and corrupt heart, yet making some excuse for many of the particulars which were charged upon him, as partly by pretense of ignorance of the true price of his wares, and chiefly by being misled by some false principles, as one, that if a man lost in one commodity he might help himself in the price of another, two, that if, through want of skill or other occasion, his commodity cost more than the price of the market in England, he might then sell it for more than the price of the market in New England, etc., these things gave occasion to Mr. Cotton, in his public exercise the next lecture day, to lay open the error of such false principles, and to give some rules of direction in the case. Some false principles were these. First, that a man might sell as dear as he can, and buy as cheap as he can. Second, if a man lose by casualty of C, etc., in some of his commodities, he may raise the price of the rest. Third, that if he sell as he bought, though he paid too dear, etc., and though the commodity be fallen, etc. Fourth, that as a man may take advantage of his own skill or ability, so he may of another's ignorance or necessity. Fifth, where one gives time for payment, he is to take like recompense of one as of another. The rules for trading were these. 1. A man may not sell above the current price, i.e., such a price as is usual in the time and place, and as another, who knows the worth of the commodity, would give for it, if he had occasion to use it, as that is called current money, which every man will take, etc. Second, when a man loseth in his commodity for want of skill, etc., he must look at it as his own fault or cross, and therefore must not lay it upon another. Third, when a man loseth by casualty of sea, or etc., it is a loss cast upon himself by providence, and he may not ease himself of it by casting it upon another. For so a man should seem to provide against all providences, etc., that he should never lose. But where there is a scarcity of the commodity, there men may raise their price, for now it is a hand of God upon the commodity, and not the person. Fourth, a man may not ask any more for his commodity than his selling price, as Ephron to Abraham, the land is worth thus much. Footnote. This laying down by John Cotton of commercial ethics is interesting. In footnote, the cause being debated by the church, some were earnest to have him excommunicated, but the most thought an admonition would be sufficient. Mr. Cotton opened the causes which required excommunication out of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5.11. The point now in question was whether these actions did declare him to be such a covetous person, etc., upon which he showed that it is neither the habit of covetousness, which is in every man in some degree, nor simply the act that declares a man to be such, but when it appears that a man sins against his conscience or the very light of nature, and when it appears in a man's whole conversation. But Mr. Keene did not appear to be such, but rather upon an error in his judgment, being led by false principles, and beside he is otherwise liberal, as in his hospitality and in church communion, etc. So in the end the church consented to an admonition. Upon this occasion a question grew whether an admonition did bar a man from the sacrament, etc. Of this more shall be spoken hereafter. Being now about church matters, I will insert another passage in the same church, which fell out about the same time. Their old meeting house being decayed and too small, they sold it away and agreed to build another, which a workman undertook to set up for six hundred pounds. Three hundred they had for the old, and the rest was to be gathered by voluntary contributions, as other charges were but there grew a great difference among the brethren where this new one should stand. Some were for the green, which was the governor's first lot, and he had yielded it the church, etc. Others, viz. the tradesmen, especially who dwelt about the marketplace, desired it might stand still near the market, lest in time it should divert the chief trade from thence. The church referred it to the judgment and determination of five of the brethren, who agreed that the fittest place, all things considered, would be near the market, 
but understanding that many of the brethren were unsatisfied and desired rather that it might be put to a lot they declared only their opinions in writing and respited the full determination to another general meeting thinking it very unsafe to proceed with the discontent of any considerable part of the church when the church met the matter was debated to and fro and grew at length to some earnestness etc but after mr cotton had cleared it up to them that the removing it to the green would be a damage to such as dwelt by the market who had there purchased and built at great charge but it would be no damage to the rest to have it by the market because it would be no less but rather more convenient for them than where the former stood they all yielded to have it set by the market-place and though some remained still in their opinion that the green were the fitter place yet for peace sake they yielded to the rest by keeping silence while it passed footnote the green included the present site of the old south church the new church was finally placed at the head of the present state street in footnote this good providence and overruling hand of god caused much admiration and acknowledgment of special mercy to the church especially considering how long the like contention had held in some other churches and with what difficulty they had been accorded seven september at the court of assistance one marmaduke percy of salem was arraigned for the death of one blank his apprentice the great inquest found the bill for murder the jury of life and death could not agree so they were adjourned to the next court and percy was let to bail by the governor and some other of the magistrates after the course at the court of december the prisoner appeared and the jury being called had further evidence given them which tended to the clearing of percy yet two of the jury dissented from the rest who were all agreed to acquit him in the end it had this issue that these two were silent and so the verdict was received the cause was this the boy was ill disposed and his master gave him unreasonable correction and he used him ill in his diet after the boy got a bruise on his head so as there appeared a fracture in his skull being dissected after his death now two things were in the evidence which made the case doubtful one the boy has charging his master before his death to have given him that wound with his meat yard footnote met yard a stick for meeting or measuring in footnote and with a broom staff for he spake of both at several times and the other was that he had told another that his hurt came from the fall of a bow from a tree and other reference there was none fourth at the general court etc the inhabitants of the upper part of pascataquack v dover etc had written to the governor to offer themselves to come under our government answer was returned them that if they sent two or three of their company with full commission under all their hands to conclude etc it was like the court would agree to their propositions and now at this court came three with commission to agree upon certain articles annexed to their commission which being read the court appointed three to treat with them but the articles being not reasonable they stood not upon them but confessed that they had absolute commission to conclude by their discretion whereupon the treaty was brought to a conclusion to this effect that they should be as ipswich and salem and of courts there etc as by the copy of the agreement remaining with the recorder doth appear this was ratified under our public seal and so delivered to them only they desired a promise from the court that if the people did not assent to it which yet they had no fear of they might be at liberty which was granted them those of exeter sent the like propositions to the court but not liking it seems the agreement which those of dover had made they repented themselves and wrote to the court that they intended not to proceed footnote here we see the stirrings of an impulse to come together which before long brought about the confederation of the colonies at which we shall soon glance in footnote at this court fell out some contestation between the governor and the treasurer footnote the treasurer was bellingham afterward governor in footnote nicholas treris being defended in the cause wherein mr hibbins footnote william hibbins was a citizen of repute whose wife attained a tragic notoriety disordered in mind as hubbard relates general history of new england page 574 she was put to death as a witch in 1656 in footnote brother-in-law to the treasurer was plaintiff for 500 pounds which the searchers took from him in the ship whereof treris was master and the defendant having answered upon oath the certain interrogatories ministered upon him and which were read to him before he took his oath and the treasurer pressing him again with the same interrogatory the governor said he had answered the same directly before the treasurer thereupon said angrily sir i speak not to you the governor replied that time was very precious and seeing the thing was already answered it was fit to proceed thereupon the treasurer stood up and said if he might not have liberty to speak he would no longer sit there 
The governor replied that it was his place to manage the proceedings of the court, etc. The treasurer then said, You have no more to do in managing the business here than I, at which the governor took offense, as at an injury done to his place, and appealed to the court to declare whether he might not enjoin any of his magistrate's silence if he saw cause. The deputy governor, at first apprehension, gainsayed it, but presently both himself and the rest of the magistrates, for the deputies were without, staying till the cause should be ended, did agree that he might do so for a particular time, and if the party so enjoined silence were unsatisfied, he might appeal to the whole court, who might give him liberty to speak, though the governor had restrained him. So the governor pressed it no further, yet expected that the court would not have suffered such a public affront to the governor to have passed without due reproof, etc. But nothing was done, save only the secretary and some one other spake somewhat of their dislike of it. Neither did it occasion any falling out between the governor and the treasurer, for the governor held himself sufficiently discharged after he had referred it to the consideration of the court, so as, if they did not look at it as a public injury, he was willing to account of it accordingly. There happened a memorable thing at Plymouth about this time. One Keysar of Lynn, being at Plymouth in his boat, and one Dickerson with him, a professor but a notorious thief, was coming out of the harbor with the ebb, and the wind southerly a fresh gale, yet with all their skill and labor they could not, in three hours, get the boat above one league, so as they were forced to come to an anchor, and at the flood, to go back to the town, and as soon as they were come in, the said Dickerson was arrested upon suspicion of a gold ring, and some other pieces of gold, which upon search were found about him, and he was there whipped for it. The like happened at Boston about two years before. Schooler, who was executed for murder, as before is mentioned, had broke prison and escaped before Winnesemet, but there he was taken with such an astonishment, etc., as he could go no further, but was forced to return to Boston. These and many other examples of discovering hypocrites and other lewd persons, and bringing them under their deserved punishment, do, among other things, show the presence and power of God in his ordinances, and his blessings upon his people, while they endeavor to walk before him with uprightness. At Kennebec, the Indians wanting food, and there being store in the Plymouth Threading House, they conspired to kill the English there for their provisions, and some Indians coming into the house, Mr. Willett, footnote, Thomas Willett, afterwards the first mayor of New York, in footnote, the master of the house, being reading in the Bible, his countenance was more solemn than at other times, so as he did not look cheerfully upon them as he was wont to do, whereupon they went out and told their fellows that their purpose was discovered. They asked them how it could be. The others told them that they knew it by Mr. Willett's countenance, and that he had discovered it by a book that he was reading whereupon they gave over their design. The people had long desired a body of laws, footnote, the body of liberties, which at length came into existence in response to the desire of the people here referred to, is a code of great interest, esteemed in its time, comparable only to Magna Carta and the common law of England, and important in the history of constitutional development. It was mainly the work of Nathaniel Ward of Ipswich, a man of bright mind, well versed in the law, though Cotton had a hand in it. A work of value here is Whitmore, The Colonial Laws of Massachusetts, Boston, 1889. See also Old South Leaflets, number 164, The Massachusetts Body of Liberties, with scholarly annotation by Edwin D. Mead, in footnote, and thought their condition very unsafe, while so much power rested in the discretion of magistrates. Diverse attempts had been made at former courts, and the matter referred to some of the magistrates and some of the elders, but still it came to no effect. For being committed to the care of many, whatsoever was done by some was still disliked or neglected by others. At last it was referred to Mr. Cotton and Mr. Nathaniel Ward, etc., and each of them framed a model which were presented to this general court, and by them committed to the governor and deputy and some others to consider of, and so prepare it for the court in the third month next. Two great reasons there were, which caused most of the magistrates and some of the elders not to be very forward in this matter. One was, want of sufficient exposure of the nature and disposition of the people, considered with the condition of the country and other circumstances which made them conceive, that such laws would be fittest for us, which should arise pro re nata upon occasions, etc., and so the laws of England and other states grew, and therefore the fundamental laws of England are called customs. Second, for that it would professedly transgress the limits of our charter, which provide we shall make no laws repugnant to the laws of England, and that we were assured we must do, but to raise up laws by practice and custom had been no transgression, as in our church discipline and in matters of marriage to make a law that marriages should not be solemnized by ministers is repugnant to the laws of England, 
but to bring it to a custom by practice for the magistrates to perform it is no law made repugnant, etc. At length, to dissatisfy the people, it proceeded, and the two models were digested with diverse alterations and additions, and abbreviated and sent to every town, to be considered at first by the magistrates and elders, and then to be published by the constables to all the people, that if any man should think fit that any therein ought to be altered, he might acquaint some of the deputies therewith against the next court. By this time there appeared a great change in the church of Boston, for whereas the year before they were all, save five or six, so affected to Mr. Wheelwright and Mrs. Hutchinson, and those new opinions, as they slighted the present governor and the pastor, looking at them as men under a covenant of works, and as their greatest enemies, but they bearing all patiently, and not withdrawing themselves, as they were strongly solicited to have done, but carrying themselves lovingly and helpfully upon all occasions, the Lord brought about the hearts of all the people to love and esteem them, more than ever before, and all breaches were made up, and the church was saved from ruin beyond all expectation, which could hardly have been in human reason, if those two had not been guided by the Lord to that moderation, etc. In the church, to manifest their hearty affection to the governor upon occasion of some strait he was brought into through his bailiff's unfaithfulness, sent him two hundred pounds. There was now a church gathered at the mount, and Mr. Thompson, a very holy man, who had been an instrument of much good at Acomenticus, was ordained the pastor the 19th of the ninth month. 10. December. At the general court, an order was made to abolish that vain custom of drinking to one another, and that upon these and other grounds. 1. It was a thing of no good use. 2. It was an inducement to drunkenness and occasion of quarreling and bloodshed. 3. It occasioned much waste of wine and beer. 4. It was very troublesome to many, especially the masters and mistresses of the feast, who were forced thereby to drink more often than they would, etc. Yet diverse, even godly persons were very loath to part with this idle ceremony, though, when disputation was tendered, they had no list, nor indeed could find any arguments to maintain it. Such power hath custom, etc. Footnote. We have frequent occasion to remark in Winthrop superstition and limitation of various kinds. With all this, he also had strong good sense, and that appears in this passage relating to the drink habit. In footnote. Mr. Ezekiel Rogers, of whose gathering of a church in England mentioned was made before, being now settled with his company at Raleigh, was there ordained pastor, etc. 3. There were so many lectures now in the country, and many poor persons would usually resort to two or three in the week to the great neglect of their affairs and the damage of the public. The assemblies also were, in diverse churches, held till night, and sometimes within the night, so as such as dwelt far off could not get home in due season, and many weak bodies could not endure so long in the extremity of the heat or cold without great trouble and hazard of their health. Whereupon the general court ordered that the elders should be desired to give a meeting to the magistrates and deputies to consider about the length and frequency of church assemblies, and to make return to the court of their determination, etc. This was taken an ill part by most of the elders and other of the churches, so as that those who should have met at Salem did not meet, and those in the bay, when they met with the magistrates, etc., at Boston, expressed much dislike of such a course, alleging their tenderness of the church's liberties, as if such a precedent might enthrall them to the civil power, as if it would cast a blemish upon the elders, which would remain to posterity, that they should need to be regulated by the civil magistrate, and also raise an ill savor of the people's coldness, that would complain of much precinct, etc., when his liberty for the ordinances was the main end professed of our coming hither. To which it was answered, one, that the order was framed with as much tenderness and respect as might be in general words, without mentioning sermons or lectures, so as it might as well be taken for meetings upon other occasions of the churches, which were known to be very frequent. Second, it carried no command, but only an expression of desire. Three, it concluded nothing, but only to confer and consider. Fourth, the record of such an order would be rather an argument of the zeal and forwardness of the elders and churches, as it was of the Israelites, when they offered so liberally to the service of the tabernacle, as Moses was forced to restrain them. Upon this interpretation of the court's intent, the elders were reasonably satisfied, and the magistrates, finding how hardly such propositions would be digested, and that, if matters should be further pushed, it might make some breach or disturbance at least, for the elders had great power in the people's hearts, which was needful to be upheld, lest the people should break their bonds through abuse of liberty, which diverse, having surfeited of, were very forward to incite others to raise mutinies and foment dangerous and groundless jealousies of the magistrates, etc., 
which the wisdom and care of the elders did still prevail against, and indeed the people themselves, generally, through the churches, were of that understanding and moderation, as they would easily be guided in their way by any rule from scripture or sound reason. In this consideration, the magistrates and deputies, which were then met, thought it not fit to enter any dispute or conference with the elders about the number of lectures, or for appointing any certain time for the continuance of the assemblies, but rested satisfied with their affirmative answer to these two propositions, that the church assemblies might ordinarily break up in such season as people that dwell a mile or two off might get home by daylight, second, that, if they were not satisfied in the declaration of our intentions in this order of court, that nothing was attempted herein against the church's liberties, etc., that they would truly acquaint us with the reasons of their unsatisfiedness, or, if we heard not from them before the next court, we should take it for granted that they were fully satisfied. They desired that the order might be taken off the record, but for that it was answered, that it might not be done without consent of the general court, only it was agreed unto that the secretary might defer to enter it in the book till the mind of the court might be known. End of section 12, 1639. Section 13 of History of New England, 1630 to 1649. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of New England, 1630 to 1649 by John Winthrop. Section 13, 1640. February the 20th. One Mr. Hansard Knowles, a minister in England, who came over the last summer in the company of our familistical opinionists, and so being suspected and examined and found inclining that way, was denied residence in the Massachusetts, whereupon he went to Pascataquack, where he begun to preach, but Mr. Burdett, being then their governor and preacher, inhibited him. But he being after removed to Aquamenticus, the people called Mr. Knowles, and in short time he gathered some of the best mind into a church body, and became their pastor, and Captain Underhill being their governor, they called their town Dover. But this Mr. Knowles, at his first coming hither, wrote a letter to his friends in London, wherein he bitterly inveighed against us, both against our magistrates and churches, and against all the people in general, as by the copy of his letter sent over to our governor may appear. The governor gave him notice thereof, and being brought to a better judgment by further consideration and more experience, he saw the wrong he had done us, and was deeply humbled for it, and wrote to the governor to that effect, and desired a safe conduct, that he might come into the bay to give satisfaction, etc., for he could have no rest in his spirit until, etc., which being sent him under the governor's hand, with consent of the council, he came, and, upon a lecture day at Boston, most of the magistrates and elders in the bay being there assembled, he made a very free and full confession of his offense, with much aggravation against himself, so as the assembly were well satisfied. He wrote also a letter to the same effect to his said friends in England, which he left with the governor to be sent to them. Captain Underhill also, being struck with horror and remorse for his offenses, both against the church and civil state, could have no rest till he had obtained a safe conduct to come and give satisfaction, and accordingly, at a lecture at Boston, it being then the court time, he made a public confession, both of his living in adultery with Faber's wife, upon suspicion whereof the church had before admonished him, and in tempting the like with another woman, and also the injury he had done to our state, etc., and acknowledged the justice of the court in their proceeding against him, etc. Yet all his confessions were mixed with such excuses and extenuations, as did not give satisfaction to the truth of his repentance, so as it seemed to be rather done out of policy, and to pacify the sting of his conscience than in sincerity. But, however, his offenses being so foul and scandalous, the church presently cast him out, which censure he seemed to submit unto, and for the time he stayed in Boston, being four or five days, he was very much dejected, etc., but, being gone back, he soon recovered his spirits again, or at least gave not that proof of a broken heart as he gave hope of at Boston. For, to ingratiate himself with the state of England, and with some gentlemen at the river's mouth, who were very zealous that way, and had lately set up common prayer, etc., he sent thirteen men armed to Exeter to fetch one Gabriel Fish, who was detained in the officer's hands for speaking against the king, the magistrates of Exeter being then in the bay to take advice what to do with him. And besides, when the church and people of Dover considered him to forbear to come to the next court, till they had considered of his case, and he had promised to do so, yet, hearing that they were consulting to remove him from his government, he could not refrain, but came and took his place in the court. 
And though he had offended to lay down his place, yet when he saw they went about it, he grew passionate, and expostulated with them, and would not stay to receive his dismission, nor would be seen to accept it when it was sent after him. Yet they proceeded, and chose one Roberts to be president of the court, and soon after they returned back fish to Exeter, which was considerately done of them, for it had been a dangerous precedent against them, being a weak plantation, if the commissioners from the lords of the council, who were daily expected, should have taken occasion to have done the like by them, though they held themselves to be out of that providence which was granted to Sir Ferdinand of Gorgias. Besides this, in the open court he committed one of his fellow magistrates for rising up and saying he would not sit with an adulterer, etc. But the chief matter which they produced against him was, that whereas he himself was a mover of them to break off the agreement with us, he had written to our governor and laid it upon the people, especially upon some among them, and for this they produced against him a letter from our governor, written to one of their commissioners in answer to a letter of his, wherein he had discovered the captain's proceeding in that matter. Soon after this the captain came by water into the bay to tender, as he said, satisfaction to the church. This was taken by some of the magistrates as a very presumptuous act, and they would have had him in prison, supposing that a safe conduct would not bear him out, having been once here and returned back again. But that counsel was not approved, because the time of his safe conduct was not expired, and it was thought very dangerous to our reputation to give the least occasion of reproach in this kind, seeing it might be objected against us to our great prejudice, where he might not have opportunity to clear our innocency. But the church, not being satisfied of his repentance, would not admit him to public speech. So after one week he returned home. In this winter, in a close, calm day, there fell diverse flakes of snow in this form, asterisk, very thin, and as exactly pointed as art would have cut them in paper or etc. March 24th. The Church of Boston sent three brethren, viz. Captain Edward Gibbons, Mr. Hibbins, and Mr. Oliver the Younger, with letters to Mr. Coddington and the rest of our members at Aquidae, to understand their judgments in diverse points of religion, formerly maintained by all, or diverse of them, and to require them to give account to the church of their own warrantable practice in communicating with excommunicated persons, etc. When they came, they found that those of them who dwell at Newport had joined themselves to a church there newly constituted, whereupon at their return the elders in most of the church would have cast them out as refusing to hear the church, but, all being not agreed, it was deferred. Footnote. Modern sympathy is with the moderate men in opposition to the harsh and repugnant policy of the elders. The report of Oliver, quoted by Savage, says that, quote, They denied our commission, and refused to let our letters be received, and they conceive one church hath not power over the members of another church, and do not think they are tied to us by our covenant. So we were fain to take all their answers by going to their several houses. Mr. Hutchinson told us that he was more nearly tied to his wife than to the church. He thought her to be a dear saint and servant of God. We came then to Mrs. Hutchinson and told her that we had a message to do to her from the Lord and from our church. She answered, There are Lord's many and God's many, but I acknowledge but one Lord. Which Lord do you mean? We answered, We came in the name but of one Lord, and that is God. Then saith she, So far we agree, and where do we agree? Let it be set down. Then we told her we had a message to her from the Church of Christ in Boston. She replied she knew no church but one. We told her, in scripture, the Holy Ghost calls them churches. She said Christ has but one spouse. We told her he had in some sort as many spouses as saints. But for our church, she wouldn't acknowledge it any church of Christ. End quote. End footnote. 18. Mr. Norris was ordained teacher of the Church of Salem, there being present near all the elders of the other churches, and much people besides. 21st. The White Angel, a small ship of Bristol, went from hence and arrived there in twenty-four days, and, the same year, the Desire, a ship built at Marblehead of one hundred tons, went from thence in the summer and arrived at Gravesend in the Thames in twenty-three days. Our neighbors of Plymouth had procured from hence, this year, one Mr. Chancy, a great scholar, and a godly man, intending to call him to the office of teacher. Footnote. Edward Norris and Charles Chauncey were both conspicuous divines, but the latter, becoming president of Harvard College, has a better hold on fame. Chauncey, to whom two professorships were offered at the English Cambridge, a marked token of appreciation, began his American career at Plymouth, going soon to situate. Though like his predecessor Dunster, held in Massachusetts to be unsound in his views as to baptism, he was trusted with a great educational responsibility and made himself powerfully influential. In footnote, but before the fit time came, 
he discovered his judgment about baptism, that children not to be dipped and not sprinkled, and he being an active man and very vehement, there arose much trouble about it. The magistrates and the other elders there, and the most of the people, withstood the receiving of that practice, not for itself so much, as for fear of worse consequences, as the annihilating our baptism, etc. Whereupon the church there wrote to all the other churches, both here and at Connecticut, etc., for advice, and sent Mr. Chancey's arguments. The churches took them into consideration, and returned their several answers, wherein they showed their dissent from him, and clearly confuted all his arguments, discovering withal some great mistakes of his about the judgment and practice of antiquity. Yet he would not give over his opinion, and the church of Plymouth, though they could not agree to call him to office yet, being much taken with his able parts, they were very loath to part with him. He did maintain also that the Lord's Supper ought to be administered in the evening, and every Lord's Day, and the church at Sandwich, where one Mr. Leverage was minister, fell into the practice of it, but that being a matter of no great ill consequence, save some outward inconvenience, there was little stir about it. This Mr. Chancy was after called to office in the church of Skidwaite. One Palmer of Hingham, and two others, being ancient and skillful seamen, being in a shallop of ten tons in an easterly wind by Paddock's Island, were overset, yet one of them had the sheet in his hand and let it fly, but it was too late, having but little ballast in her, yet it pleased God, there came by, soon after, a pinnace, which espied them, sitting upon her side, yet deep in the water, and took them up, but the child was not heard of after. Many men began to inquire after the southern parts, and the great advantages supposed to be had in Virginia and the West Indies, etc., made this country to be disesteemed of many, and yet those countries, for all their great wealth, have sent hither, both this year and formerly, for supplies of clothes and other necessities, and some families have forsaken both Providence and other, the Caribbean Islands and Virginia, to come live here. And though our people saw what meager, unhealthful countenances they brought thither, and how fat and well-liking they became soon, yet they were so taken with the ease and plenty of those countries, as many of them sold their estates here to transport themselves to Providence, among whom the chief was John Humphrey Esquire, a gentleman of special parts of learning and activity, and a godly man, who had been one of the first beginners in the promoting of this plantation, and had labored very much therein. He, being brought low in his estate, and having many children, and being well known to the lords of Providence, and offering himself to their service, was accepted to be the next governor, whereupon he labored much to draw men to join with him. This was looked at both by the general court and also by the elders as an unwarrantable course, for though it was thought very needful to further plantation of churches in the West Indies, and all were willing to endeavor the same, yet to do it with disparagement of this country, for they gave out that they could not subsist here, caused us to fear that the Lord was not with them in this way. And withal, some considerations were propounded to them by the court, which diverted some of them, and made others to pause upon three points, especially, first, how dangerous it was to bring up an ill report upon this good land which God had found out and given to his people, and so to discourage the hearts of their brethren, etc., Second, to leave a place of rest and safety, to expose themselves, their wives and children, to the danger of a potent enemy, the Spaniard. Third, their subjection to such governors as those in England shall set over them, etc. Notwithstanding these considerations, diverse of them persisted in their resolutions, and went about to get some ship or bark to transport them, but they were still crossed by the hand of God. Month 3, May 17th. Joseph Grafton set sail from Salem, the second day in the morning, in a catch of about forty tons, three men and a boy in her, and arrived at Pimmickwood, the wind easterly, upon the third day in the morning, and there took in some twenty cows, oxen, with hay and water from them, and came to an anchor in the bay the sixth day, about three afternoon. It came over by diverse letters and reports that the Lord say did labor by disparaging this country to divert men from coming to us, and so to draw them to the West Indies and finding that godly men were unwilling to come under other governors than such as they should make choice of themselves, etc., they condescended to articles somewhat suitable to our form of government, although they had formerly declared themselves much against it, and for a mere aristocracy and a hereditary magistracy to be seldom upon some great persons, etc. The governor also wrote to the Lord Say about the report of Forsyth, and therein showed his lordship, how evident it was, that God had chosen this country to plant his people in, and therefore how displeasing it would be to the Lord, and dangerous to himself to hinder this work, or to discourage men from supplying us, by abasing the goodness of the country, which he never saw, and persuading men that here was no possibility of sustenance, whereas this was a sure ground for his children's faith, that, being sent hither by him, either he saw that the land was a good land, and sufficient to maintain them, 
or else he intended to make it such, etc. To this letter his lordship returned answer, not denying that which was reported of him, nor the evidence of the lord's owning the work, but alleging that this was a place appointed only for a present refuge, etc., and that a better place now being found out, we were all called to remove thither. Footnote. Apparently New England was now in danger of being uprooted, though hardly yet fixed. It is not strange that Humphrey and Lord Say and Sell thought the position too bleak and barren now that the advantages of Virginia and the West Indies were fully known. See Frank Strong, A Forgotten Danger to the New England Colonies, in Annual Report of the American Historical Association for 1898, pages 77 to 94. LibriVox Reader's Note At this point, Volume 1 ends, and Volume 2 begins. 3. May 13th. The Court of Elections was at Boston, and Thomas Dudley Esquire was chosen governor. Some trouble there had been in making way for his election, and it was obtained with some difficulty, for many of the elders labored much in it, fearing lest the long continuance of one man in the place should bring it to be for life and in time hereditary. Besides, this gentleman was a man of approved wisdom and godliness, and of much good service to the country, and therefore it was his due to share in such honor and benefit as the country had to bestow. The elders, being met at Boston about this matter, sent some of their company to acquaint the old governor with their desire, and the reasons moving them, clearing themselves of all dislike of his government, and seriously professing their sincere affections and respect towards him, which he kindly and thankfully accepted, concurring with them in their motion, and expressing his unfeigned desire of more freedom, that he might a little intend his private occasions, wherein, they well knew, how much he had lately suffered. For his bailiff, whom he trusted with managing his farm, had engaged him two thousand five hundred pounds without his privity in his outward estate. This they had heard of, and were much affected therewith, and all the country in general, and took course, the elders agreeing upon it at that meeting that supply should be sent in from several towns, by a voluntary contribution, for freeing of those engagements, and the court, having no money to bestow, and being yet much indebted, gave his wife three thousand acres of land, and some of the towns sent in liberally, and some others promised, but could perform but little, and the most nothing at all. The whole came not to five hundred pounds, whereof near half came from Boston, and one gentleman of Newbury, Mr. Richard Dummer, propounded for a supply by a more private way, and for example, himself dispersed one hundred pounds. Footnote. This liberality to Winthrop, suffering thus heavily through his devotion to the public service, is the best possible evidence of the esteem in which he was held. The large gift of Richard Dummer, in particular, who had been disciplined in the antinomian excitement, see volume 1, page 215, is a sign from a magnanimous sufferer of appreciation of substantial worth in a persecutor. In footnote, the first court there fell some difference between the governor and some of the deputies about a vote, upon a motion to have the fine of 200 pounds imposed upon Mr. Robert Keene to be abated. Some would have had it at 100 pounds, others at 100 marks, others at 50, and because the governor put the lowest to the vote first, whereas diverse called for the highest, they charged the governor with breach of order, whereupon he grew into some heat, professing that he would not suffer such things, etc. The deputies took this as a menacing, and much offense they took at it, but the next day he cleared his intention to them, and all was quiet. Month 4, June. Diverse of the inhabitants of Lynn, finding themselves straitened, looked out for a new plantation, and going to Long Island, they agreed with the Lord Sterling's agent there, when Mr. Forret, footnote, read Ferret, James Ferret, a Scotsman, was from 1637 to 1641, the agent of Lord Sterling for selling lands on Long Island. See Slafter, Sir William Alexander, pages 87 to 90, in footnote, for a parcel of the isle near the west end, and agreed with the Indians for their right. The Dutch, hearing of this, and making claim to that part of the island by a former purchase of the Indians, sent men to take possession of the place, and set up the arms of the Prince of Orange upon tree. The Lynn men sent ten or twelve men with provisions, etc., who began to build, and took down the Prince's arms, and in place thereof an Indian had drawn an unhandsome face. The Dutch took this in high displeasure, and sent soldiers and fetched away their men, and imprisoned them a few days, and then took an oath of them blank, and so discharged them. Upon this the Lynn men, finding themselves too weak, and having no encouragement to expect aid from the English, deserted that place, and took another at the east end of the same island, and, being now about forty families, they proceeded in their plantation, and called one Mr. Pearson, a godly learned man, and a member of the Church of Boston, to go with them, 
who with some seven or eight more of the company gathered nine, footnote, i.e. probably in November, in footnote, into a church body at Lynn before they went, and the whole company entered into a civil combination with the advice of some of our magistrates to become a corporation. Upon this occasion, the Dutch governor, one William Kift, a discreet man, wrote to our governor complaint of the English usurpations, both at Connecticut and now also at Long Island, and of the abuse offered to the prince's arms, etc., and thereupon excused his imprisoning our men. To which the governor returned answer, in Latin, his letter being in the same, that our desire had always been to hold peace and good correspondency with all our neighbors, and though we would not maintain any of our countrymen in any unjust action, yet we might not suffer them to be injured, etc. As for our neighbors of Connecticut, etc., he knew they were not under our government, and for those at Long Island, they went voluntarily from us, etc. Footnote. From another authority, we learn that the arms of the Prince of Orange were pulled down by Lieutenant Daniel Howe, who was at times deputy for Lynn in the general court. The growth of the plantations, now causing encroachment east and west, involved the English in disputes with Dutch and French neighbors. The occupation of Long Island, near Oyster Bay, was a menace to Manhattan. In footnote. This year there came over great store of provisions, both out of England and Ireland, and but few passengers, and those brought very little money, which was occasioned by the store of money in quick markets, which the merchants found here the two or three years before, so as now all our money was drained from us, and cattle and all commodities grew very cheap, which enforced us at the next general court in the eighth month, to make an order that corn should pass in payments of new debts, Indian at four shillings a bushel, rye at five shillings, and wheat at six shillings, and that, upon all executions for former debts, the creditor might take what goods he pleased, or if he had no goods in his lands, to be appraised by three men, one chosen by the creditor, one by the debtor, and the third by the marshal. One of the ships, which came this summer, struck upon a whale with a full gale, which put the ship a stays. The whale struck the ship on her bow, with her tail a little above water, and brake the planks and six timbers in a beam, and staved two hogshead of vinegar. 7. September. There is some rumor of the Indians plotting mischief against the English, and to strengthen this, the governor of Plymouth, a Mr. Bradford, wrote a letter to this effect, that he was informed, and didn't believe it, that the Naragnasat Chansom, Miantunama, had sent a great present of wampum to the Mohawks to aid him against the English, and that it was accepted and aid promised. The like news was brought by Mr. Haynes, one of the magistrates upon Connecticut, and many words were taken up from some Indians among us, which our fears interpreted the same way. Footnote. Rumors thus accredited as to danger from this powerful tribe were certainly disquieting. We shall have occasion to note certain very harsh measures taken by the colonists, who felt they were environed by great perils. In footnote. The governor and council gave no great credit to these suspicions, yet they thought fit to take order, strengthening the watches in all towns, and causing them to be ordered by the military officers, being before committed to the constable's charge, and withal sent Captain Jennison with three men and an Indian interpreter to the Naragnasat Sachems, to know the truth of their intentions, etc. They were very kindly entertained, but they would not speak with him in the presence of his Indian interpreter, because he was a Pequod and a servant, and their enemy, and might discover their counsels. So we made use of another interpreter. They denied all confederations with the Mohawks, etc., and professed their purpose to continue friendship with us, and not to use any hostility towards the English, except they began, etc., and promised to come to Boston, as he desired, if Mr. Williams might come with him, but that we had denied. Only Janimo, then the antic sachem, carried himself proudly, and refused to come to us, or to yield to anything, only he said he would not harm us, except we invaded him. The governor and council took from Kutshemekin the powder and shot they had brought of our people, with promise to pay for it or restore it, etc. This summer there came diverse godly men, as they pretended, from Christopher's with their families. The occasion was one Mr. Collins, a young scholar full of zeal, etc., preaching in the island, it pleased God, diverse were wrought upon by him. But he and they being persecuted, and their liberty restrained, they came away, and brought all their substance and tobacco, which came at so dead a market, as they could not get above two pence a pound, the freight came to one penny, observe, nor could sell half at that rate. They arrived first at Quillipiac, since called New Haven, and so dispersed themselves here and there, and some returned to Ireland. Mr. Collins and one Mr. Hales, 
a young man very well conceited of himself and censorious of others, went to Aquidae, and so soon as Hales came acquainted with Mrs. Hutchinson, he was taken by her and became her disciple. Mr. Collins was entertained at Hartford to teach a school, and hearing of Mrs. Hutchinson's opinions, etc., wrote to Mr. Hales to beware of her. Mr. Hales returned to Mansur, and the next morning he went away without taking leave, and being come to Mrs. Hutchinson, he was also taken with her heresies, and in great admiration of her, so as these, and the other like before, when she dwelt in Boston, gave cause of suspicion of witchcraft. For it was certainly known that Hawkins' wife, who continued with her and was her bosom friend, had much familiarity with the devil in England, when she dwelt at St. Ives, where diverse ministers and others resorted to her and found it true. This summer here arrived one Thomas Gorge, footnote, Thomas Gorges, in spite of his connection with Sir Ferdinando, preserved friendly relations with his Puritan neighbors, and is remembered with honor by the historians of Maine. Richard Vines, too, a cavalier, seems to have been a respectable man. Perhaps the different bearing of the royalist agents to the Puritans may have been due in part to a recognition by them of the fact that the king was powerfully opposed, and that Massachusetts would have in Parliament an ally to be reckoned with. In footnote, a young gentleman of the inns of court, a kinsman of Sir Ferdinand Gorge, and sent by him with commission for the government of his province of Somersetshire. He was sober and well disposed. He stayed a few days at Boston, and was very careful to take advice of our magistrates how to manage his affairs, etc. When he came to Achimenticus, now called Bristol, footnote, at present York, Maine, and footnote, he found all out of order, for Mr. Burdett ruled all, and had let loose the reins of liberty to his lusts, that he grew very notorious for his pride and adultery, and the neighbors now finding Mr. Gorge well inclined to reform things, they complained of him and produced such foul matters against him as he was laid hold on and bound to appear at their court at Sacco. But he dealt so with some other of the commissioners that, when the court came, Mr. Vines and two more stood for him, but Mr. Gorge having the greater party on his side, and the jury finding him guilty of adultery and other crimes, with much labor and difficulty he was fined, under thirty pounds. He appealed unto England, but Mr. Gorge would not admit his appeal, but seized some of his cattle, etc. Upon this Mr. Burdett went into England, but when he came there he found the state so changed, as his hopes were frustrated, and he, after taking part with the Cavaliers, was committed to prison. One baker, master's mate of the ship, blank, being in drink, used some reproachful words of the queen. The governor and council were much in doubt what to do with him, but having considered that he was distempered and sorry for it, etc., and being a stranger and a chief officer in the ship, and many ships were then in harbor, they thought it not fit to inflict corporal punishment upon him. But after he had been two or three days in prison, he was set an hour at the whipping post with the paper on his head, and so dismissed. Month 5, July 27th. Being the second day of the week, the Mary Rose, a ship of Bristol of about 200 tons, her master one Captain Blank, lying before Charlton, was blown in pieces with her own powder, being 21 barrels, wherein the judgment of God appeared, for the master and the company were many of them profane scoffers at us, and at the ordinance of religion here. So as, our church is keeping a fast for our native country, etc., they kept aboard, at their common service, when all the rest of the masters came to our assemblies. Likewise the Lord's Day following, and a friend of his going aboard the next day and asking him why he came not on shore to our meetings, his answer was that he had a family of his own, etc., and they had as good service aboard as we had on shore. Within two hours after this, being about dinner time, the powder took fire, no man knows how, and blew all up, these the captain and nine or ten of his men, and some four or five strangers. There was a special providence that there were no more, for many principal men were going aboard at that time, and some were in a boat near the ship, and others were diverted by a sudden shower of rain, and others by other occasions. There was one man saved, being carried up in the scuttle, and so let fall in the same into the water, and being taken up by the ferry boat near dead, he came to himself the next morning, but could not tell anything of the blowing up of the ship, or how he came there. The rest of the dead bodies were after found, much bruised and broken. Some goods were saved, but the whole loss was estimated at two thousand pounds. A twenty shilling piece was found sticking in a chip, for there was above three hundred pounds in money in her, and fifteen tons of lead, and ten pieces of ordnance, which a year after were taken up, and the whole of the ship drawn ashore.
The judgment of God upon these scorners of his ordinances and the ways of his servants, for they spake very evil of us, because they found not so good a market for their commodities as they expected, etc., gives occasion to mention other examples of like kind, which fell out at this and other times, by which it will appear how the Lord hath owned this work, and preserved and prospered his people here beyond ordinary ways of providence. One Captain Mason of London, footnote, John Mason of the Piscataqua, must not be confounded with John Mason of Connecticut, captain in the Pequot War, in footnote. A man in favor at court, and a professed enemy to us, had a plantation at Piscataquack, which he was at great charge about, and set up a sawmill, but nothing prospered. He provided a ship which should have been employed to have brought a general governor, or in some other design to our prejudice, but in launching of it her back was broken. He also employed Gardiner and Morton and others to prosecute against us at council table and by a quo warranto, etc. So as Morton wrote diverse letters to his friends here, insulting against us and assuring them of our speedy ruin, etc. But the Lord still disappointed them and frustrated all their designs. As for this Mason, he fell sick and died soon after, and in his sickness he sent for the minister and bewailed his enmity against us, and promised, if he recovered, to be as great a friend to New England as he had formerly been an enemy. Sir Ferdinand Gorge also had sided with our adversaries against us, but underhand, pretending by his letters and speeches to seek our welfare, but he never prospered. He attempted great matters, and was at large expenses about his province here, but he lost all. One Austin, a man of good estate, came with his family in the year 1638 to Quinnipiac, and not finding the country as he expected, he grew discontented, saying that he could not subsist here, and thereupon made off his estate, and with his family and a thousand pounds in his purse, he returned for England in a ship bound for Spain, against the advice of the godly there, who told him it would be taken by the Turks. And it so fell out, for in Spain he embarked himself in a great ship bound for England, which carried two hundred thousand pounds in money, but the ship was taken by the Turks, and Austin and his wife and family were carried to Algiers and sold there for slaves. Footnote. Here, says Savage, in a footnote, ends the perfect text of the second venerable manuscript of the author, which began in my volume 1, page 197, volume 1, page 191 of this edition. On the morning of the 10th November, 1825, the original was destroyed by fire in my copy, on which the labor of collation, equally faithful and pleasant, had been bestowed by me three times in different years was also lost. Another copy designed for the printer shared the same fate, except that the few pages foregoing, having been sent to the press, were preserved. From this place to the end of the second volume of the original manuscript, post page 205, the boast of a pure text, with correction of the grosser errors denoted in the margin, and supplying of omissions in the former edition, must be abandoned. In footnote, the Lord showed his displeasure against others, though godly, who have spoken ill of this country, and so discouraged the hearts of his people. Even the lords and others of providence having spoken too much in that kind, thinking thereby to further their own plantation. They set out a ship the last year with passengers and goods for providence, but it was taken by the Turks. Captain Newman, the same year, having taken good prizes in their service, returning home, when he was near the Dover, was taken by a Dunkirker, and all lost. Mr. Humphrey, who is now for Providence with his company, raised an ill report of this country, were here kept in spite of all their endeavors and means to have been gone this winter, and his corn and all his hay to the value of a hundred sixty pounds were burnt by his own servants, who made a fire in his barn, and by gunpowder which accidentally took fire, consumed all, himself having at the court being petitioned for some supply of his want, whereupon the court gave him two hundred fifty pounds." Soon after also Providence was taken by the Spaniards, and the lords lost all their care and cost the value above sixty thousand pounds. Footnote. So ended in disaster the scheme which had threatened the uprooting of New England, the hand of God in Winthrop's eyes being clearly visible in the misfortunes of the disaffected. The Providence referred to is Island Providence, or Catalina, off the Nicaraguan coast. In footnote. Month 7, September the 3rd. Captain Underhill being brought, by the blessing of God in this church's censure of excommunication, to remorse for his foul sins, obtained, by means of the elders and others of the church of Boston, a safe conduct under the hand of the governor and one of the council to repair to the church. He came at the time of the court of assistance, and upon the lecture day after sermon, the pastor called him forth and declared the occasion, and then gave him leave to speak, and indeed it was a spectacle which caused many weeping eyes. 
though it afforded matter of much rejoicing, to behold the power of the Lord Jesus in his own ordinances, when they are dispensed in his own way, holding forth the authority of his regal scepter and the simplicity of the gospel. He came in his worst clothes, being accustomed to take great pride in his bravery and neatness, without a band, in a foul linen cap pulled close to his eyes, and standing upon a form he did, with many deep sighs and abundance of tears, lay open his wicked course, his adultery, his hypocrisy, his persecution of God's people here, and especially his pride, as a root of all which caused God to give him over to his other sinful courses, and contempt of the magistrates. He justified God and the church and the court and all that had been inflicted on him. He declared what power Satan had of him since the casting out of the church, how his presumptuous laying hold of mercy and pardon before God gave it, did then fail him when the terrors of God came upon him, so as he could have no rest, nor could see any issue but utter despair, which would put him diverse times upon resolutions of destroying himself, and not the Lord in mercy prevented him, even when his sword was ready to have done the execution. Many fearful temptations he met with beside, and on all these his heart shut up in hardness and impenitency as the bondslave of Satan, till the Lord, after a long time and great afflictions, had broken his heart, and brought him to humble himself before him night and day with prayers and tears till his strength was wasted. And indeed he appeared as a man worn out with sorrow, and yet he could find no peace, therefore he was now come to seek it in this ordinance of God. He spake well, save that his blubbering, etc., interrupted him, and all along he discovered a broken and melting heart, and he gave good exhortations to take heed of such vanities and beginnings of evil as had occasioned his fall. And in the end he earnestly and humbly besought the church to have compassion of him, and to deliver him out of the hands of Satan. So accordingly he was received in the church again, and after he came into the court, for the general court began soon after, and made confession of his sin against them, etc., and desired pardon, which the court freely granted him, so far as concerned their private judgment. But for his adultery they would not pardon that for example's sake, nor would restore him to freedom, though they released his banishment, and declared the former law against adultery to be of no force, so as there was no law now to touch his life, for the new law against adultery was made since his fact committed. He confessed also in the congregation that though he was very familiar with that woman, and had gained her affection, etc., yet she withstood him six months against all his solicitations, which he thought no woman could have resisted, before he overcome her chastity, but being once overcome, she was wholly at his will. And to make his peace the more sound, he went to her husband, being a cooper, and fell upon his knees before him in the presence of one of the elders and others, and confessed the wrong that he had done him, and besought him to forgive him, which he did very freely, and in testimony thereof he sent the captain's wife a token. Footnote. This curious passage, held by Savage to be one of Winthrop's best delineations of manners, is not conclusive as to the sincerity of Underhill's repentance. Underhill is supposed to have lived until 1672, his later career being in Connecticut, on Long Island, and among the Dutch. He held offices of importance and found opportunity to increase his fame as an Indian fighter. In footnote. 4, 5, 6. It rained three days and nights together, and the tides were extraordinary high. Month 9, November. It is before declared how the Church of Boston sent messengers in a letter to their members at Aquaday, and how they refused to hear them, pretending themselves to be no members, being now so far removed. Whereupon the elders and most of the church intended to have cast them out as refusers to hear the church, but some others desired that the church would write to them once again, which accordingly was done, and the letter drawn by Mr. Cotton, wherein he fully repeated all former proceedings, both of the church and of the court, and justified both, and condemned their errors and disturbance of the peace here, and their remonstrance, and Mr. Wheelwright's sermon, which formerly, among other his failings, being misled by their subtlety, etc., he had justified and commended, and showed how the church had been wronged by them. Miantunema, the sachem of Narangnesat, came, and was met at Dorchester by Captain Gibbons and a guard of twelve musketeers, and well entertained at Roxbury by the governor. But when we came to Parley, he refused to treat with us by our Pequod interpreter, as he had done before to Captain Jennison and the governor, being as resolute as he, refused to use any other interpreter, thinking it a dishonor to us to give so much way to them. Whereupon he came from Roxbury to Boston, departing in a rude manner, without showing any respect or sign of thankfulness to the governor for his entertainment, 
whereof the governor informed the general court and would show him no countenance nor admit him to dine at our table as formerly he had done till he had acknowledged his failing etc which he readily did so soon as he could be made to understand it and did speak with our committees and us by a pequod maid who could speak english perfectly but it was conceived by some of the court that he kept back such things as he accounted secrets of state and that he would carry home in his breast as an injury the strict terms he was put to both in this and the satisfaction he was urged to for not observing our custom in matter of manners for he told us that when our men came to him they were permitted to use their own fashions and so he expected the same liberty with us so as he departed and nothing agreed only the former articles of peace were read to him and allowed by him with this addition that if any of his men did set traps in our jurisdiction etc they should be liable to satisfy all damages etc month eight october the elders had moved at a general court before that the distinction between the two jurisdictions might be set down that the churches might know their power and the civil magistrate his the same had been moved by the magistrates formerly and now at this court they presented a writing to that effect to be considered by the court wherein they declared that the civil magistrate should not proceed against a church member before the church had dealt with him with some other restraints which the court did not allow of so this matter was referred to further consideration and it appeared indeed that diverse of the elders did not agree in these points footnote the passage illustrates the growth of ecclesiastical power at the expense of the civil authority the theocratic feature of the polity becoming now pronounced in footnote at this court mr ezekiel rogers pastor of the church in raleigh being not kindly dealt with nor justly as he alleged concerning the limits of their town moved for further enlargement for taking in a knack of land upon merrimack near cochetowit footnote later andover in footnote for which end they desired their line might run square from ipswich line this line was granted and he said it should satisfy but within an hour after it was discovered that he was mistaken and that such a line would not reach the neck whereupon he came again and confessed his mistake and still demanded the neck the court was very doubtful what to do in it having formally granted a plantation at cuchitowit and did not yield to his request whereupon he pleaded justice upon some promises of large accommodations etc when we desired his setting down with us and grew into some passion so as in departing from the court he said he would acquaint the elders with it this behavior being menacing as it was taken gave just cause of offense to the court so as he was sent for not by the officer but by one of the rally deputies before he came he wrote to the governor wherein he confessed his passionate distemper declared his meaning in those offensive speeches as that his meaning was that he would propound the case to the elders for advice only about the equity of it which he still defended this would not be accepted but the court would have him appear and answer only they left him to take his own time so the next day he came not accompanied with any other of the elders though many were then in town and did freely and humbly blame himself for his passionate distemper and the court knowing that he would not yield from the justice of his cause as he apprehended it they would not put him upon any temptation but accepted his satisfaction and freely granted what he formerly desired a commission had formerly been granted to mr endicott and mr stoughton for joining with the commissions of plymouth who met the second time at situate and there came to a full agreement which was certified this court and recorded to this effect that the bound should be that branch of Cunnyhasset creek nearest to situate with sixty acres of march in the south side footnote the full text of the agreement is given by bradford history of plymouth plantation page three fifty one of the edition in the series in footnote the scarcity of money made a great change in all commerce merchants would sell no wares but for ready money men could not pay their debts though they had enough prices of lands and cattle fell soon to a one half and less yea to a third and after one fourth part month ten december nine the church of watertown ordained mr knowles footnote reverend john knowles not to be confounded with hansard knowles before mentioned his ordination after this fashion as colleague of the respected phillips is an extreme assertion of the spirit of congregationalism in this we may see the hand of phillips whose radical temper was manifest from the first savage finds here a confirmation of his belief that no essential difference separated the offices of preacher and pastor in footnote a godly man and a prime scholar pastor so they had now two pastors and no teacher differing from the practice of other churches as also they did in their privacy 
not giving notice thereof to the neighboring churches nor to the magistrates as the common practice was. At the court of assistants, one Hugh Buett was banished for holding publicly and maintaining that he was free from original sin and from actual also for half a year before, and that all true Christians after blank are enabled to live without committing actual sin. Fifteenth, a pinnace called the coach, being in her voyage to New Haven, late Quinnipiac, between Salem and Cape Cod, sprang a leak, so as in the morning they found her hold half filled with water, whereupon the seamen and passengers betook themselves to their skiff, being a very small one, and the wind then growing very high at southwest. Only one Jackson, a godly man and an experienced seaman, would not leave the vessel before he had tried the utmost, so getting them in again and laying the bark upon the contrary side, they fell to getting out the water, which it pleased God they overcame, and having a fine fresh gale, they got safe back to Salem. Mr. Pelham's house in Cambridge took fire in the dead of the night by the chimney. A neighbor's wife, hearing some noise among her hens, persuaded her husband to arise, which, being very cold, he was loath to do, yet through her great importunity he did, and so espied the fire and came running into his shirt, and had much to do to awake anybody, but he got them up at last, and so saved all. The fire being ready to lay hold upon the stairs, they had all been burnt in their chambers, if God did not by a special providence sent help at that very instant. About this time a pinnace called the makeshift, so called, because she was built of the wreck of a greater vessel at the Isle of Sable, and by that means the men saved, being on a voyage to the southward, was cast away upon a ledge of rocks near Long Island. The goods were all lost, but the men were saved. No winter but some vessels have been cast away in that voyage. About this time there fell out a thing worthy of observation. Mr. Winthrop the Younger, one of the magistrates, having many books in a chamber where there were corn of diverse sorts, had among them one wherein the Greek Testament, the Psalms, and the common prayers were bound together. He found the common prayer eaten with mice, every leaf of it, and not any of the other two touched, nor any other of his books, though there were above a thousand. Footnote. The mice, like the men, in New England, Winthrop thinks, were characterized by most aggressive dissent. But Savage suggests that the mice, perhaps, quote, not liking psalmody and not understanding Greek, took their food from another part of the volume. If the cat, mentioned in the next line of the text, had been in the Winthrop's library, she might have prevented the stigma on the common prayer. In footnote. Queer of the child at Cambridge killed by a cat. Month 8, October. We received a letter at the general court from the magistrates of Connecticut and New Haven, and of Aquaday, wherein they declared their dislike of such as would have the Indians rooted out, as being of the cursed race of Ham, and their desire of our mutual accord in seeking to gain them by justice and kindness, and withal to watch over them, to prevent any danger by them, etc. We returned to answer of our consent with them and all things propounded, only refused to include those of Aquaday in our answer, or to have any treaty with them. Month 10, December. About the end of this month, a fishing ship arrived at Isle of Shoals, and another soon after, and there came no more this season for fishing. They brought us news of the Scots entering into England, and the calling of a parliament, and the hope of a thorough reformation, etc., whereupon some among us began to think of returning back to England, others despairing of any more supply from thence, and yet not knowing how to live there if they should return, bent their minds wholly to removal to the south parts, supposing they should find better means of subsistence there, and for this end put off their estates here at very low rates. These things, together with the scarcity of money, caused a sudden and very great abatement of the prices of all our own commodities. Corn, Indian, was sold ordinarily at three shillings the bushel, a good cow at seven or eight pounds, some at five pounds, and other things answerable. See the order of court in October about these things whereby it came to pass that men could not pay their debts, for no money nor beaver were to be had, and he who last year, or but three months before, was worth one thousand pounds, could not now, if he should sell his whole estate, raise two hundred pounds, whereby God taught us the vanity of all outward things, etc. Footnote. The Parliament whose opening is referred to in this paragraph was a famous long Parliament. The convening of this body was an event epoch-making for new as well as old England. Since persecution no longer came from court and church, the main incentive to immigration was removed. The additions to the colony were henceforth not numerous. The body of 20,000 that were already established, a compact homogeneous population, during the coming century and a half multiplied from within itself almost undisturbed. 
These are the people who have given character to the six northeastern states of America and influenced so widely the character and fortunes of our country in general. See Palfrey, History of New England, Preface. Though king and bishop ceased to trouble, the colonies were still beset by embarrassments from overseas. The victory of Parliament at length was a victory which they welcomed, but the Presbyterians who now came into power were no friends to Congregationalism. In 1648, the, the Independents triumphed over the Presbyterians. These, indeed, the colonists might feel were brothers of their own household. They had followed the, quote, New England way, unquote, in setting up the Commonwealth. See Thornton, Historical Relation of New England to the English Commonwealth. Also, Bourgeau, the rise of modern democracy in Old and New England. But independency during the Commonwealth took on through Roger Williams, Fane, Cromwell, and the rest, a tolerant temper not congenial to John Endicott and Nathaniel Ward, nor even to the more moderate minds of Winthrop and Cotton. Now, for twenty years, New England wrought out its own problems, but at last, at the Restoration, the hand of Stuart was again felt. In footnote. One tailor of Lynn, having a milk cow in the ship as he came over, sold the milk to the passengers for two pence the court, and being after at a sermon where an oppression was complained of, etc., he fell distracted. Quare of the price for two pence the court was not dear at sea. This evil was very notorious among all sorts of people, it being the common rule that most men walked by in all their commerce to buy as cheap as they could and to sell as dear. A great ship called the Charles, of above three hundred tons, brought passengers hither this year. The master was a plain, quiet man, but his company were very wicked, and did wrong the passengers much, and being at Pascataquack to take in clapboards with another ship wherein Mr. Peter by occasion preached one Lord's Day, the company of the Charles did use all the means they could to disturb the exercise, by hooting and hallooing, but in their return they were set upon by the Turks and diverse of them killed. A wicked fellow, given up to bestiality, fearing to be taken by the hand of justice, fled to Long Island, and there was drowned. He had confessed to some that he was so given up to that abomination that he never saw any beast go before him, but he lost it after it. Mr. Nathaniel Eaton, of whom mention is made before, being come to Virginia, took upon him to be a minister, but was given up of God to extreme pride and sensuality, being usually drunken, as the custom is there. Footnote. Virginia stands low in Winthrop's esteem, though, as Savage suggests, the charge of drunkenness is to be referred only to the clergy. The passage may be another illustration of the depth of the estrangement from the Church of England. The previous passage, respecting Eton, is in volume 1, pages 310 to 315, in footnote. He sent for his wife and children. Her friends here persuaded her to stay a while, but she went notwithstanding, and the vessel was never heard of after. End of section 13. Section 14 of History of New England, 1630 to 1649. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of New England, 1630 to 1649 by John Winthrop. Chapter 14, 1641. Month 12, February 2. The Church of Dorchester being furnished with a very godly and able pastor, one Mr. Mather, and having invited to them one Mr. Burr, who had been a minister in England, and a very good report there for piety and learning, with intent to call him also to office, after he was received a member in their church, and had given good proofs of his gifts and godliness to the satisfaction of the church, they gave him a call to office, which he deferring to accept. In the meantime he delivered some points savoring of familism, wherein the church desiring satisfaction, and he not so free to give it as was meet, it was agreed that Mr. Mather and he should confer together, and so the church should be informed wherein the difference lay. Accordingly, Mr. Burr wrote his judgment in the points and difference, in such manner and terms, as from some of his propositions there could be no other be gathered but that he was erroneous. But this was again so qualified in other parts as might admit of a charitable construction. Mr. Mather reports to the church the errors which might be collected without mentioning the qualification or acquainting Mr. Burr with it before. When this was published, Mr. Burr disclaimed the errors, and Mr. Mather maintained them from his writings, whereupon the church was divided, some joining with the one and some with the other, so as it grew to some heat and alienation, and many days were spent for reconciliation, but all in vain. In the end they agreed to call on help from other churches, so this day there was a meeting at Dorchester of the governor and another of the magistrates, 
and about ten of the elders of the neighboring churches, wherein four days were spent in opening the cause, in such offenses as had fallen out in the prosecution. And in conclusion, the magistrates and elders declared their judgment and advice in the case to this effect, that both sides had cause to be humbled for their failing, more particularly Mr. Burr for his doubtful and unsafe expressions, and backwardness to give clear satisfaction, etc., and Mr. Mather for his inconsideration, both in not acquainting Mr. Burr with his collections before he had published them to the church, and in not certifying the qualifications of those errors which were in his writings, for which they were advised to set a day apart for reconciliation. Upon this Mr. Mather and Mr. Burr took the blame of their failings upon themselves, and freely submitted to the judgment and advice given, to which the rest of the church yielded a silent assent, and God was much glorified in the close thereof, and Mr. Burr did again fully renounce those erroneous opinions of which he had been suspected, confessing that he was in the dark about these points till God, by occasion of this agitation, had cleared them to him, which he did with much meekness and many tears. Footnote. Burr, of good education and ability, gave promise of eminence, but died the year following this. In footnote. The Church of Boston was necessitated to build a new meeting-house, and a great difference arose about the place of situation, which had much troubled other churches on the like occasion. But after some debate it was referred to a committee and was quietly determined. It cost about one thousand pounds, which was raised out of the weekly voluntary contribution without any noise or complaint, when in some other churches, which did it by way of rates, there was much difficulty and compulsion by levies to raise a far less sum. The general fear of want of foreign commodities, now our money was gone, and that things were like to go well in England, set us on work to provide shipping of our own, for which in Mr. Peter, footnote, Reverend Hugh Peter, being a man of a very public spirit and singular activity for all occasions, procured some to join for building a ship at Salem of three hundred tons, and the inhabitants of Boston, stirred up by his example, set upon the billing another at Boston of a hundred fifty tons. The work was hard to accomplish for want of money, etc., but our shipwrights were content to take such pay as the country could make. And the shipwright at Salem, through want of care of his tackle, etc., occasioned the death of one baker, who was desired with five or six more to help hale up a piece of timber, which the rope breaking fell down upon them. The rest by special providence were saved. This baker, going forth in the morning very well, after he had prayed, told his wife he should see her no more, though he could not foresee any danger towards him. The court having found by experience that it would not avail by any law to redress the excessive rates of laborers and workmen's wages, etc., for being restrained they would either remove to other places where they might have more, or else being able to live by planting and other employments of their own, they would not be hired at all. It was therefore referred to the several towns to set down rates among themselves. This took better effect, so that in a voluntary way, by the counsel and persuasion of the elders, an example of some who led the way, they were brought to more moderation than they could be by compulsion, but it held not long. Upon the great liberty which the king had left the parliament to in England, some of our friends there wrote to us advice to send over some to solicit for us in the parliament, giving us hope that we might obtain much, etc., but consulting about it, we declined the motion for this consideration, that if we should put ourselves under the protection of the Parliament, we must then be a subject to all such laws as they should make, or at least such that they might impose upon us, in which course, though they should intend our good, yet it might prove very prejudicial to us. Footnote. Jonathan Trumbull, revolutionary governor of Connecticut, noted this passage as characterized by the same independence of Parliament that marked the men of his own time. In footnote. But upon this occasion the court of assistance being assembled, and advising with some of the elders about some course to serve the providence of God, and making use of a present opportunity of a ship of her own being ready bound for England, it was thought fit to send some chosen men in her with commission to negotiate for us as occasion should be offered, both in furthering the work of reformation of the churches there, which was now like to be attempted, and to satisfy our countrymen of the true cause why our engagements there have not been satisfied this year, as they were wont to be in all former times since we were here planted, and also to seek out some way, by procuring cotton from the West Indies, or other means that might be lawful and not dishonorable to the gospel for our present supply of clothing, etc., for the country was like to afford enough for food, etc. The persons designed hereto were Mr. Peter, pastor of the Church of Salem, footnote, evidences abound of the great usefulness of Hugh Peter, who figures less in the dreary controversies than as a promoter of works of practical advantage. 
The reluctance of Salem to part with him can easily be understood. In footnote, Mr. Weld, the pastor of the church at Roxbury, and Mr. Hibbins of Boston. For this end, the governor and near all the rest of the magistrates and some of the elders wrote a letter to the church of Salem, acquainting them with our intentions, and desiring them to spare their pastor for that service. The governor also moved the church of Roxbury for Mr. Weld, whom, after some time of consideration, they freely yielded. But when it was propounded to the church of Salem, Mr. Endicott, being a member thereof, and having formerly opposed it, did now again like in the church. Some reasons were there alleged, as that officers should not be taken from their churches for civil occasions, that the voyage would be long and dangerous, that it would be reported that we were in such want as we had sent to England to beg relief, which would be very dishonorable to religion, and that we ought to trust God who would never fail those hitherto, etc. But the main reason, indeed, which was privately intimated, was their fear lest he should be kept there or diverted to the West Indies, for Mr. Humphrey intended to go with him, who was already engaged that way by the Lord's say, etc., and therefore it was feared that he should fall under strong temptations that way, being once in England. And Mr. Humphrey discovered his intentions the more by falling foul upon Mr. Endicott in the open assembly at Salem for opposing this motion, and with that bitterness as gave great offense, and was like to have grown to a professed breach between them, but being both godly and hearkening to seasonable counsel, they were soon reconciled, upon and free and public acknowledgment of such palings as had passed. But the church, not willing to let their pastor go, nor yet to give a plain denial of the magistrate's request, wrote an answer by way of excuse, tendering some reasons of their unsatisfiedness about his going, etc. The agitation of this business was soon about the country, whereby we perceived there would be sinister interpretations made of it, and the ship being suddenly to depart, we gave it over for that season. Month 2, April 13th. A negro maid, servant to Mr. Stoughton of Dorchester, being well approved by diverse years' experience for sound knowledge and true godliness, was received into the church and baptized. Some agitation fell out between us in Plymouth about Siakunk. Some of our people, finding it fit for plantations, and thinking it out of our patent, which Plymouth men, understanding, forbade them, and sent us to signify that it was within their grant, and that we would therefore forbid ours to proceed. But the planters, having acquainted us with their title, and offering to yield it to our jurisdiction, and assuring us that it could not be in the Plymouth patent, we made answer to Plymouth accordingly, and encouraged our neighbors to go on, so as diverse letters passing between us, and they sending some to take possession for them. At length we sent some to Plymouth to see their patent, who bringing us a copy of so much as concerned the thing in question, though we were not fully satisfied thereby, yet not being willing to strive for land, we sat still. There fell out much trouble about this time at Pascataquack. Mr. Knowles had gathered a church of such as he could get, men very raw for the most part, etc. Afterwards there came amongst them one Mr. Larkham, who had been a minister at Northam near Barnstable in England, a man not savoring the right way of church discipline, but being a man of good parts and wealthy, the people were soon taken with him, and the greater part were forward to cast off Mr. Knowles, their pastor, and to choose him, for they were not willing nor able to maintain two officers. So Mr. Knowles gave place to him, and he being thus chosen, did soon discover himself. He received into the church all that offered themselves, though men notoriously scandalous and ignorant, so they would promise amendment, and fall into contention with the people, and would take upon him to rule hall, even the magistrates, such as they were. So as there soon grew sharp contention between him and Mr. Knowles, to whom the more religious still adhered, whereupon they were divided into two churches. Mr. Knowles and his company excommunicated Mr. Larkham, and he again laid violent hands upon Mr. Knowles. In this heat it began to grow to a tumult. Some of their magistrates joined with Mr. Larkham and assembled the company to fetch Captain Underhill, another of their magistrates and their captain, to the court, and he also gathered some of the neighbors to defend himself, and to see the peace kept, so they marched forward towards Mr. Larkham's, one carrying a Bible upon a staff for an ensign, and Mr. Knowles with them armed with a pistol. When Mr. Larkham and his company saw them thus provided, they proceeded no further, but sent to Mr. Williams, who is governor of those in the lower part of the river, who came up with a company of armed men and beset Mr. Knowles' house, where Captain Underhill then was, and there they kept a guard upon them night and day, and in the meantime they called the court, and Mr. Williams sitting as judge, they found Captain Underhill and his company guilty of a riot, and set great fines upon them, and ordered him and some others to depart the plantation. 
The cause of this eager prosecution of Captain Underhill was, because he had procured a good part of the inhabitants there to offer themselves again to the government of the Massachusetts, who being thus prosecuted, they sent a petition to us for aid. Footnote. Knowles, who in the smaller religious war bore as ensign a Bible upon a pole, was Hansard Knowles, several times mentioned heretofore, and later conspicuous in England. The reprobate and combative Underhill appears again. While Francis Williams had been appointed by Mason and Gorgias as governor at Portsmouth and Dover, Winthrop's portrayal of dissenters from the Massachusetts orthodoxy must be taken with some abatement. In footnote, the governor and council considered of their petition and gave commission to Mr. Bradstreet, one of our magistrates, Mr. Peter and Mr. Dalton, two of our elders, to go thither and to endeavor to reconcile them, and if they could not effect that, then to acquire how things stood and to certify us, etc. They went accordingly, and found both sides to be in fault. At length they brought matters to a peaceable end. Mr. Larkin was released of his excommunication, Captain Underhill, and the rest from their censures, and by occasion of these agitations Mr. Knowles was discovered to be an unclean person, and to have solicited the chastity of two maids, his servants, and to have used filthy dalliance with them, which he acknowledged before the church there, and so was dismissed, and removed from Pasca to Quack. The sin of his was the more notorious, because the fact, which was first discovered, was the same night after he had been exhorting the people by reasons and from scripture, to proceed against Captain Underhill for his adultery. And it is very observable how God gave up these two, and some others who had held with Mrs. Hutchinson, in crying down all evidence from sanctification, etc., to fall into these unclean courses, whereby themselves and their erroneous opinions were laid open to the world. Mr. Peter and Mr. Dalton, with one of Aquamenticus, went from Pascataquac with Mr. John Ward, who was to be entertained there for their minister, and though it be but six miles, yet they lost their way, and wandered two days and one night without food or fire in the snow and wet. But God heard their prayers, wherein they earnestly pressed him for the honor of his great name, and when they were even quite spent, he brought them to the seaside near the place they were to go to, blessed forever be his name. Not long before a godly maid of the church of Lynn, going in a deep snow from Meadford homeward, was lost, and some of her clothes found after among the rocks. One John Baker, a member of the church of Boston, removing from thence to Newbury for enlargement of his outward accommodations, being grown wealthy from nothing, grew there very disordered, fell into drunkenness, and such violent contention with another brother, maintaining the same by lying and other evil courses, that the magistrate sent to have him apprehended. But he rescued himself out of the officer's hands and removed to Acomenticus, where he continued near two years, and now at this time he came to Boston, and humbled himself before the church, confessing all his wickedness with many tears and showing how he had been followed with Satan, and how he had labored to pacify his conscience by secret confession to God, etc., but could have no peace, yet could not bring his heart to return and make public acknowledgment, until the hand of God fell upon one swain his neighbor, who fell into despair, and would often utter dreadful speeches against himself, and cry out that he was all on fire under the wrath of God, but would never discover any other heinous sin, but that, having gotten about forty pounds by his labor, he went into England, and there spent it in wicked company, and so continued, and after a small time hanged himself. This baker coming in, and seeing him thus dead, was so struck with it as he could have no rest till he came and made the peace with the church and court. Upon his confession the church was doubtful whether they ought not to cast him out, his offenses being so scandalous, notwithstanding they were well persuaded of the truth of his repentance. But the judgment of the church was that seeing he had excommunicated himself by deserting the church, and Christ had ratified it by giving him up to Satan, whereby the ordinance had had its proper effect, therefore he ought now to be received in pardon whereto the church agreed. Yet this man fell into gross distemper soon after. Mr. Cotton, out of that in Revelations 15, none could enter into the temple until, etc., delivered, that neither Jews nor any more of the Gentiles should be called until Antichrist were destroyed, fees to a church estate, though here and there a proselyte. Upon the Lord's day at Concord, two children were left at home alone, one lying in a cradle, the other having burned a cloth, and fearing its mother should see it, thrust it into a haystack by the door, the fire not quite being out, whereby the hay and house were burned, and the child in the cradle, before they came from the meeting. About the same time, two houses were burned at Sudbury. By occasion of these fires, I may add another of a different kind, but of much observation. 
a godly woman of the Church of Boston, dwelling sometimes in London, brought with her a parcel of very fine linen of great value, which she set her heart too much upon, and had been at charge to have it all newly washed, and curiously folded and pressed, and so left it impressed in her parlor overnight. She had a negro maid, went into the room very late, and let fall some snuff of the candle upon the linen, so as by the morning all the linen was burned to a tinder, and the boards underneath, and some stools and a part of the wainscot burned, and never perceived by any in the house, though some lodged in the chamber overhead, and no ceiling between. But it pleased God that the loss of this linen did her much good, both in taking off her heart from worldly comforts, and in preparing her for a far greater affliction by the untimely death of her husband, who was slain not long after at Isle of Providence. Month 4, June 2. The Court of Elections, Richard Bellingham, Esquire, chosen governor. See more a few leaves after. This year the two ships were finished, one at Salem of 300 tons, and another at Boston of 160 tons. The Parliament of England, setting upon a general reformation both of church and state, the Earl of Strafford being beheaded, and the Archbishop, footnote, loud, in footnote, our great enemy, and many others of the great officers and judges, bishops and others, imprisoned and called to account, this caused all men to stay in England in expectation of a new world, so as few coming to us, all foreign commodities grew scarce, and our own of no price. Corn would buy nothing, a cow which cost last year twenty pounds might now be bought for four or five pounds, etc., and many gone out of the country, so as no man could pay his debts, nor the merchants make return into England for their commodities, which occasioned many there to speak evil of us. These straits set our people on work to provide fish, clapboards, blank, etc., and to sow hemp and flax, which prospered very well, and to look out to the West Indies for a trade for cotton. The general court also made orders about payment of debts, setting corn at the wanted price, and payable for all debts which should arise after a time prefixed. They thought fit also to send some chosen men into England to congratulate the happy success there and to satisfy our creditors of the true cause why we would not make so current payment now as in former years we had done, and to be ready to make use of any opportunity God should offer for the good of the country here, as also to give any advice as it should be required, for the settling the right form of church discipline there, but with this caution, that they should not seek supply of our wants in any dishonorable way, as by begging or the like, for we were resolved to wait upon the Lord in the use of all means which were lawful and honorable. The men chosen were Mr. Hugh Peter, pastor of the church in Salem, Mr. Thomas Weld, pastor of the church in Roxbury, and Mr. William Hibbins of Boston. Footnote. Here we take farewell of Hugh Peter. Thomas Weld acted in England with the Presbyterians, becoming estranged from independency on account of its tolerance. His connection with Winthrop's short story of the Hutchinsonian troubles has been noted before. In footnote. There being no ship which was to return right for England, they went to Newfoundland, intending to get a passage from thence in the fishing fleet. They departed hence the third of the sixth month, and with them went one of the magistrates, Mr. John Winthrop, Jr. This act of the court did not satisfy all the elders, and many others disliked it, supposing that it would be conceived we had sent them on begging, and the church of Salem was unwillingly drawn to give leave to their pastor to go, for the court was not minded to use their power in taking an officer from the church without their consent, but in the end they and the other churches submitted to the desire of the court. These with other passengers to the number of forty went to Newfoundland, expecting to go from thence in some fishing ships. They arrived there in fourteen days, but could not go altogether, so were forced to divide themselves and go from several parts of the island as they could get shipping. The ministers preached to the seamen, etc., at the island, who were much affected with the word taught, and entertained them with all courtesy, as we understood by letters from them which came by a fishing ship to the Isles of Shoals about the beginning of October. 21st. A young man, a tanner in Boston, going to wash himself in a creek, said jestingly, I will go and drown myself now, which fell out accordingly, for by the slipperiness of the earth he was carried beyond his depth, and having no skill to swim, was drowned, though company were at hand, and one in the water with him. Letters came from the governor, etc., of Connecticut, for advice about the difference between them and the Dutch. The Dutch governor had pressed them hard for his interest in all Hartford, etc., as far as one might see from their house, alleging he had purchased us so much of the Pequods, and threatened force of arms. They of the river alleged their purchase of other Indians, the true owners of the place, etc., with other arguments from our patent and that of Saybrook. 
We returned answer without determining of either side, but advising to a moderate way, as the yielding some more land to the Dutch house, for they had left them but thirty acres. But the Dutch would not be thus pacified, but prepared to send soldiers to be billeted at their house. But it pleased the Lord to disappoint their purpose, for the Indians falling out with them killed four of their men at their Fort Orange, footnote, now Albany, in footnote, whereof three were English, who had gone to dwell among them, whereby they were forced to keep their soldiers at home to defend themselves. And Mr. Peter, going for England, and being well acquainted with the chief merchants in Holland, undertook to pacify the West India Company. But for want of commission from those of Hartford, the company there would not treat with him. About this time, three boys of Summers Islands, footnote, the Summer, or Somers Islands, were the Bermudas, in footnote, stole away in an open boat or skiff, and having been eight weeks at sea, their boat was cast away upon a strand without Long Island, and themselves were saved by the Indians. A church being gathered at Providence in the West Indies, and their pastor, Mr. Sherwood, and another minister being sent prisoners into England by one Carter, the deputy governor, the rest of the church, being but five, wrote to our churches complaining of the persecution of the magistrates and others, and desiring our prayers and help from us, which moved the churches and magistrates more willingly to further those who were already resolved in preparing for the island. Whereupon two small vessels, each of about thirty tons, with diverse families and goods, so many as they could bestow, thirty men, five women, and eight children, set sail for the island, and touching at Christopher's, they heard that a great fleet of Spanish ships was abroad, and that it was feared that they had taken providence, so as the master, Mr. Pierce, a godly man and most expert mariner, advised them to return, and offered to bear part of the loss. But they not hearkening to him, he replied, Then I am a dead man. And coming to the island, they marveled they saw no colors upon the fort, nor any boat coming towards them, whereupon he was counseled to drop an anchor. He liked the advice, but yet stood on into the harbor, and after a second advice he went still on. But, being come within pistol shot of one fort in hailing, and no answer made, he put his bark a stays, and being upon the deck, which was also full of passengers, women, and children, and hearing one cry out, they are traversing a piece at us, he threw himself at the door of the cuddy, and one Samuel Wakeman, a member of the Church of Hartford, who was sent with goods to buy cotton, cast himself down by him, and presently a great shot took them both. Mr. Pierce, footnote, apparently William Pierce, earlier master of the lion, the boldest and most trusted of the sea captains who at that time frequented the New England harbors, in footnote, died within an hour, the other, having only his thighs tore, lived ten days. Mr. Pierce had read to the company that morning, as it fell in course, that in Genesis the last, Lo, I die, but God will surely visit you and bring you back, out of which words he used godly exhortations to them. Then they shot from all parts about thirty great shot, besides small, and tore the snails and shrouds, but hurt not the bark, nor any person more in it. The other vessel was then a league behind, which was marveled at, for she was the better sailor, and could fetch up the other at pleasure, but that morning they could not by any means keep company with her. After this the passengers, being ashamed to return, would have been set on shore at Cape Grace de Dios, or Florida, or Virginia, but the seamen would not, and through the wonderful providence of God they came all safe home, the third of seven bur following. This brought some of them to see their error, and acknowledge it in the open congregation, but others were hardened. There was a special providence in that the ministers were sent prisoners into England before the island was taken, for otherwise it is most probable they had all been put to the sword, because some Spaniards had been slain there a little before by the deputy governor his command, after the lieutenant had received them upon quarter, in an attempt that they had made upon the island, wherein they were repulsed with the loss of two or three hundred men. They took it after, and gave the people quarter, and sent them home. A like providence there was, though not so safe, in that diverse godly people, in their voyage to the island the year before, were taken prisoners by the Turks, and so their lives saved, paying their ransom. This year diverse families in Lynn and Ipswich, having sent to view Long Island, and finding a very commodious place for plantations, but challenged by the Dutch, they treated with the Dutch governor to take it from them. He offered them very fair terms, as they should have the very same liberties, both civil and ecclesiastical, which they enjoyed in the Massachusetts, only liberty for appeal to the Dutch, and after ten years to pay the tenth of their corn. The court was offended at this, and sought to stay them, not for going from us, but for strengthening the Dutch, our doubtful neighbors, and taking that from them which our king challenged and had granted a patent of, with Martha's vineyard and other islands thereby, to the Earl of Stirling, especially for binding themselves by an oath of fealty, 
whereupon diverse of the chief being called before the general court in Aper, the reasons laid down to dissuade them, they were convinced, and promised to desist. This summer the merchants of Boston set out a vessel again to the Isle of Sable with twelve men to stay there a year. They sent again in the eighth month, and in three weeks the vessel returned and brought home four hundred pair of seahorse teeth, which were esteemed worth three hundred pounds, and left all the men well, and twelve ton of oil and many skins, which they could not bring away, being put from the island in a storm. I must here return to supply what was omitted concerning the proceedings of the last court of elections. There had been much laboring to have Mr. Bellingham chosen, and when the votes were numbered he had six more than the others. But there were diverse who had not given in their votes, who now came into the court and desired their liberty, which was denied by some of the magistrates, because they had not given them in at the doors. But others thought it was an injury, yet were silent, because it concerned themselves, for the order of giving in their votes at the door was no order of court, but only direction of some of the magistrates, and without question, if any freeman tender his vote before the election be passed and published, it ought to be received. Some of the freemen, without the consent of the magistrates or governor, had chosen Mr. Nathaniel Ward, footnote, Nathaniel Ward, author of The Simple Cobbler of Agawam, and credited with the main work in compiling the Body of Liberties, was the raciest and most entertaining, if the narrowest and most intolerant, of the writers and speakers of New England. Naturally, the freemen desired much to hear him, and his counsels as to political and constitutional matters made impression, in footnote to preach at this court, pretending that it was a part of their liberty. The governor, whose right indeed it is, for till the court be assembled, the free men are but private persons, would not strive about it, for though it did not belong to them, yet if they would have it, there was reason to yield it to them. Yet they had no great reason to choose him, though otherwise very able, seeing he had cast off his pastor's place at Ipswich, and was now no minister by the received determination of our churches. In his sermon he delivered many useful things, but in a moral and political discourse, grounding his propositions much upon the old Roman and Grecian governments, which sure is an error, for if religion and the word of God makes men wiser than their neighbors, and these times have the advantage of all that have gone before us in experience and observation, it is probable that by all these helps we may better frame rules of government for ourselves than to receive others upon the bare authority of the wisdom, justice, etc., of those heathen commonwealths. Among other things, he advised the people to keep all their magistrates in an equal rank, and not give more honor or power to one than to another, which is easier to advise than to prove, seeing it is against the practice of Israel, where some were rulers of thousands, but some but of tens, and of all the nations known or recorded. Another advice he gave, that magistrates should not give private advice, and take knowledge of any man's cause before it came to public hearing. This was debated after in the general court, where some of the deputies moved to have it ordered. But it was opposed by some of the magistrates upon these reasons. 1. Because we must then provide lawyers to direct men in their causes. 2. The magistrates must not grant out original process, as now they do, for to what end are they betrusted with this, but that they should take notice of the cause of the action, that they might either divert the suit, if the cause be unjust, or direct it in a right course if it be good. By this occasion the magistrate hath opportunity to end many differences in a friendly way without charge to the parties or trouble to the court. Fourth, it prevents many difficulties and tediousness to the court to understand the cause aright, no advocate being allowed and the parties being not able, for the most part, to open the cause fully and clearly, especially in public. Fifth, it is allowed in criminal causes, and why not in civil? Sixth, whereas it is objected that such magistrate is in danger to be prejudiced, Answer, if the thing be lawful and useful, it must not be laid aside for the temptations which are incident to it, for in the least duties men are exposed to great temptations. At this court it was ordered that the elders should be desired to agree upon a form of catechism which might be put forth in print. Offense being taken by many of the people that the court had given Mr. Humphrey two hundred fifty pounds, the deputies moved it might be ordered that the court should not have power to grant any benevolences, but it was considered that the court could not deprive itself of its honor, and that hereby we should lay a blemish upon the court, which might do more hurt to the country by weakening the reputation of the wisdom and faithfulness of the court and the hearts of the people than the money saved would recompense. Therefore it was thought better to order it by way of declaration, as it were to deter importunity of suitors in this kind, that the court would give no more benevolences till our debts were paid, and stock in the treasury, except upon foreign occasions, etc., there arose a question in the court about the punishment of single fornication, because, by the law of God, the man was only to marry the maid, 
or pay a sum of money to her father, but the case falling out between two servants, they were whipped for the wrong offered to the master in abusing his house, and were not able to make him other satisfaction. The like difficulty arose about a rape, which was not death by the law of God, but because it was committed by a boy upon a child of seven or eight years old, he was severely whipped. Yet it may be seen by the equity of the law against sodomy that it should be death for a man to have carnal copulation with a girl so young, as there can be no possibility of generation, for it is against nature as well as sodomy and buggery. At this court the gentleman, who had the two patents of Dover and Strawberry Bank at Pascataquack, in the name of the lords and themselves, granted all their interest of jurisdiction, etc., to our court, reserving the most of the land to themselves. Footnote. Lord Sandbrook and their associates gave up to Massachusetts the rights of jurisdiction under the Hilton and Squamsot patents. In footnote. Whereupon a commission was granted to Mr. Bradstreet and Mr. Simons. Footnote. Simon Bradstreet and Samuel Simons, younger men now coming forward into prominent position, at a later time reached the highest positions as governor and deputy governor. In footnote with two or three of Pascataquack, to call a court there and assemble the people to take their submission, etc. But Mr. Humphrey, Mr. Peter, and Mr. Dalton had been sent before to understand the minds of the people, to reconcile some differences between them, and to prepare them. See more. Mrs. Hutchinson and those of Aquaday Island broached new heresies every year. Diverse of them turned professed Anabaptists, and would not wear any arms, and denied all magistracy among Christians and maintained that there were no churches since those founded by the apostles and evangelists, nor could any be, nor any pastors ordained, nor seals administered but by such, and the church was to want these all the time she continued in the wilderness as yet she was. Her son Francis and her son-in-law, Mr. Collins, who was driven from Barbados where he preached a time and done some good, but so soon as he came to her was infected with her heresies, came to Boston and were there sent for to come before the governor and council but they refused to come except they were brought. So the officer led them, and being come, there were diverse of the elders present. He was charged with a letter he had written to some in our jurisdiction, wherein he charged all our churches and ministers to be anti-Christian, and many other reproachful speeches, terming our king, king of Babylon, and sought to possess the people's heart with evil thoughts of our government and of our churches, etc. He acknowledged the letter, and maintained what he had written, yet sought to evade by confessing there was a true magistracy in the world, and that Christians must be subject to it. He maintained also that there were no Gentile churches, as he termed them, since the apostles' times, and that none could now ordain ministers, etc. Francis Hutchinson did agree with him in some of these, but not resolutely in all, but he had reviled the church of Boston, being then a member of it, calling her a strumpet. They were both committed to prison, and it fell out that one Stoddard, being then one of the constables of Boston, was required to take Francis Hutchinson into his custody till the afternoon, and said withal to the governor, Sir, I came to observe what you did, that if you should proceed with a brother otherwise than you ought, I might deal with you in a church way. For this insolent behavior he was committed, but being dealt with by the elders and others, he came to see his error, which was that he did conceive that the magistrate ought not to deal with a member of the church before the church had proceeded with him. So the next Lord's Day, in the open assembly, he did freely and very affectionately confess his error and his contempt of authority, and being bound to appear at the next court, he did the like there to the satisfaction of all. Yet for example's sake he was fined twenty shillings, which thought some of the magistrates would have had it much less, or rather remitted, seeing his clear repentance and satisfaction in public left no poison or danger in his example, nor had the commonwealth or any person sustained danger by it. At the same court, Mr. Collins was fined one hundred pounds and Francis Hutchinson fifty pounds, and to remain in prison till they gave security for it. We assessed the fines the higher, partly that by occasion thereof they might be the longer kept in from doing harm, for they were kept close prisoners, and also because that family had put the country to so much charge in the Senate and other occasions to the value of five hundred pounds at least. But after, because the winter drew on, and the prison was inconvenient, we abated them to forty pounds and twenty pounds. But they seemed not willing to pay anything. They refused to come to the church assemblies except they were led, and so they came duly. At last we took their own bonds for their fine, and so dismissed them. Footnote. From the colony records, it appears that Collins and Francis Hutchinson were forbidden to return to the colony on pain of death. In footnote. Other troubles arose in the island by reason of one Nicholas Easton, a tanner, a man very bold, though ignorant. 
He used to teach at Newport, where Mr. Coddington, their governor, lived, maintained that man hath no power or will in himself, but as he is acted by God, and seeing that God filled all things, nothing could be or move but by him, and so he must needs be the author of sin, etc., and that a Christian is united to the essence of God. Being showed what blasphemous consequences would follow hereupon, they professed to abhor the consequences, but still defended the propositions, which discovered their ignorance, not apprehending how God could make a creature as it were in himself, and yet no part of his essence, as we see by familiar instances. The light is in the air, and in every part of it, yet it is not air, but a distinct thing from it. They are joined with Nicholas Easton, Mr. Coddington, Mr. Coggeshall, footnote, all three of the men were of high repute in civil life, each serving his colony as governor, in footnote, and some others, but their minister, Mr. Clark, and Mr. Linthal, and Mr. Harding, and some others dissented and publicly opposed, whereby it grew to such heat of contention that it made a schism among them. Month 7, September. Captain Underhill, coming to Boston, was presently apprehended by the governor's warrant to appear at the next court, and bound for his good behavior in the meantime, which was ill taken by many, seeing he did not stand presented by any man, and had been reconciled to the church and to the court, who had remitted his sentence of banishment, and showed their willingness to have him pardon him fully, but for fear of offense. And it was held by some of the magistrates that the court, having reversed the sentence against him for former misdemeanors, had implicitly pardoned all other misdemeanors before that time, and his adultery was no more than but a misdemeanor. But to bind a man to his good behavior, when he stands reconciled to the church and commonwealth, was certainly an error, as it was also to commit such an one, being not presented nor accused. So easily may a magistrate be misled on the right hand by the secret whisperings of such as pretend a zeal of justice and the punishment of sin. The governor caused him to be indicted at the next court, but he was acquitted by proclamation. Month 7, September 11th. It being court time, about seven or eight in the evening, there appeared to the southward a great light, about thirty or forty feet in length. It went very swift, and continued about a minute. It was observed by many in the bay, and at Plymouth and New Haven, etc., and it seemed to all to be in the same position. Fifteenth, a great training at Boston two days. About one thousand two hundred men were exercised in most sorts of land service. Yet it was observed that there was no man drunk, though there was plenty of wine and strong beer in the town, not an oath sworn, no quarrel, nor any hurt done. The Parliament in England, falling so readily to reform all public grievances, some of our people being then in London preferred a petition to the Lord's House for redress of that restraint which had been put upon ships and passengers to New England, whereupon an order was made that we should enjoy all our liberties, etc., according to our patent, whereby our patent, which had been condemned and called in upon an erroneous judgment in a quo warranto, was now implicitly revived and confirmed. This petition was preferred without warrant from our court. 7. September 2nd. A day of thanksgiving was kept in all our churches for the good success of the Parliament in England. This year men followed the fishing so well that there was about 300,000 dry fish sent to the market. The lords and gentlemen that had two patents at Pascataquack, finding no means to govern their people there, nor to restrain them from spoiling their timber, etc., agreed to assign their interest to us, reserving the greatest part of the propriety of their lands. So commissioners being sent thither, the whole river agreed to come under our jurisdiction under two propositions. First, if we took them in upon a voluntary submission, then they would have liberty to choose their own magistrates, etc. Second, if we took them in as being within the line of our patent, they would then submit to be as Ipswich and Salem, etc., and would have such liberties for felling timber, etc., as they had enjoyed, etc., and so referred it to the next general court, and to have courts there as Ipswich and Salem had. And accordingly, at the general court in the third month next, they sent two deputies, who, being members of the church there, were sworn freemen, an order made for giving the oath to others at their own court, the like liberty to other courts for ease of the people. Footnote. An important crisis both for Massachusetts and the New Hampshire settlements. In footnote. Month 9, November 8th. Monsieur Rocher, a Rocheller and a Protestant, came from Monsieur Latour, planted upon St. John's River up the Great Bay on this side Cape Sable. He brought no letters with him, but only letters from Mr. Shirt of Pimiquid, where he left his men and boat. He propounded to us, one, liberty of free commerce, this was granted, two, assistance with de Alny of Penobscot, whom he had war with, third, that he might make return of goods out of England by our merchants. 
In these two we excused any treaty with him, as having no letters or commission from Latour. He was courteously entertained here, and after a few days departed. Footnote. On Latour and de Alny, see volume 1, page 163, note 1. 9. Query whether the following be fit to be published. The governor, Mr. Bellingham, was married. I would not mention such ordinary matters in our history, but by occasion of some remarkable accidents. The young gentlewoman was ready to be contracted to a friend of his, who lodged in his house, and by his consent had proceeded so far with her, when on the sudden the governor treated with her, and obtained her for himself. He excused it by the strength of his affection, and that she was not absolutely promised to the other gentleman. Two errors more he committed upon it. One, that he would not have his contract published where he dwelt, contrary to an order of the court. Second, that he married himself contrary to the constant practice of the country. The great inquest presented him for breach of the order of court, and at the court following in the fourth month the secretary called him to answer the prosecution. But he was not going off the bench, as the manner was, and but few of the magistrates present. He put it off to another time, intending to speak with him privately, and with the rest of the magistrates about the case, and accordingly he told him the reason why he did not proceed, viz., being unwilling to command him publicly to go off the bench, and yet not thinking it fit he should sit as a judge, when he was by law to answer as an offender. This he took ill, and said he would not go off the bench, except he were commanded. Footnote. After such an experience of Bellingham, it is not strange that the colony should restore its chief dignity to Winthrop once more in May, 1642. In footnote. Archibald Thompson of Marblehead, carrying dung to his ground in a canoe upon the Lord's Day, in fair weather and still water, it sunk under him in the harbor near the shores, and he was never seen after. One Nor of Charleston, coming down mystic in a small boat laden with wood, was found dead in it, a good caveat for men not to go single in boats in such season of the years, for it was very stormy weather. 9. November 12th. A great tempest of wind and rain from the southeast all the night, as fierce as in a hurricane. It continued very violent at northwest all the day after. Diverse boats and one bark were cast away in the harbor, but, which was a wonder to all, no dwelling house blown down, nor any person killed, and the day after it came to southeast again, and continued all the night with much wind and rain, and thereupon, it being about the new moon, followed the highest tide which we had seen since our arrival here. The summer past was very cool and wet, so as much Indian corn never ripened, though some stood till the twentieth of this month. It was observed that people who fed upon that corn were extraordinarily infected with worms in their bodies all the year following, which in some was well prevented by leaving their bread and feeding upon salt fish. The trials of Dartmouth of four hundred tons, lying at Pascataquac to take in pipe staves, was forced from her anchors in the last tempest and driven upon the rocks, yet all her masts were before taken down to be new-masted. There rode by her a small ship which was safe. This small ship was before despised by the men of the greater, and they would needs unrig their ship upon the Lord to stay, though they were admonished not to do it. In the same great tempest a shallop of three tons rode it out all night at the head of Cape Ann, and came in safe after. Mr. Stephen Batchelor, the pastor of the church at Hampton, who had suffered much at the hands of the bishops in England, being about eighty years of age, and having a lusty, comely woman to his wife, did solicit the chastity of his neighbor's wife, who acquainted her husband therewith, whereupon he was dealt with, but denied it, as he had told the woman he would do, and complained to the magistrates against the woman and her husband for slandering him. The church likewise dealing with him, he stiffly denied it, but soon after, when the Lord's Supper was to be administered, he did voluntarily confess the attempt, and that he did intend to have defiled her, if she would have consented. The church, being moved with his free confession and tears, silently forgave him and communicated with him, but after, finding how scandalous it was, they took advice of other elders, and after long debate and much pleading and standing upon the church's forgiving and being reconciled to him and communicating with him after he had confessed it, they proceeded to cast him out. After this he went on in a variable course, sometimes seeming very penitent, soon after again excusing himself and casting blame upon others, especially his fellow elder Mr. Dalton, who indeed had not carried himself in this cause so well as became him, and was brought to see his failing, and acknowledged it to the elders of the other churches, who had taken much pains about this matter. So he behaved himself to the elders when they dealt with him. He was off and on for a long time, and when he had seemed most penitent, so as the church were ready to have received him in again, he would fall back again, 
and as it were repent of his repentance. In this time his house and near all his substance was consumed by fire. When he had continued excommunicated near two years, and much agitation had been about the matter, and the church being divided, so as he could not be received in, at length the matter was referred to some magistrates and elders, and by their mediation he was released of his excommunication, but not received to his pastor's office. Upon occasion of this meeting for mediation, Mr. Wilson, pastor of Boston, wrote this letter to him. The letter is worthy inserting. Footnote. It is not preserved. Several pages of Winthrop's text are here omitted. In footnote. The general court held in the tenth month past was full of uncomfortable agitations and contentions. The principal occasion, for history must tell the whole truth, was from the governor, who being a gentleman of good repute in England for wisdom and godliness, finding now that some other of the magistrates bear more sway with the people than himself, and that they were called to be of the standing council for life, and himself passed by, was so taken with an evil spirit of emulation and jealousy, through his melancholic disposition, as he set himself in an opposite frame to them in all proceedings, which did much retard all business, and was occasion of grief to many godly minds, and matter of reproach to the whole court in the mouths of others, and brought himself low in the eyes of those with whom formerly he had been in honor. Some instances I will give. There fell out a case between Mr. Dudley, one of the council, and Mr. Howe, a ruling elder of the church of Watertown, about a title to a mill. The case is too long here to report, but it was so clear on Mr. Dudley's part, both in law and equity, most of the magistrates also and deputies concurring therein, as the elders, being desired to be present at the hearing of the case, they also consented with the judgment of the court before the case was put to vote, and some of them humbly advised the court that it would be greatly to their dishonor, and an apparent injustice, if they should otherwise determine. Notwithstanding, he still labored to have the cause carried against Mr. Dudley, reproved some of the elders for their faithful advice, took upon him to answer all the arguments, but so weakly as many were ashamed at it, and in reading an order of court whereupon the issue of the case chiefly depended, he sought to help himself by such unworthy shifts as interpreting some things against the very letter and common sense, wholly omitting the most material part, etc., refusing to put things to the vote that were made against his purpose, etc., that all might see by what spirit he was led. Another case fell out about Mr. Maverick of Noddle's Island, who had been formerly fined one hundred pounds for giving entertainment to Mr. Owen and one Hale's wife, who had escaped out of prison, where they had been put for notorious suspicion of adultery. Footnote. Maverick, it must be supposed, believed the parties innocent. He was of a bold as well as humane spirit, and ready to suffer while sheltering those whom he thought persecuted. In footnote. As well after be showed. The court upon his petition had referred it to the usual committee, who made return that their opinion was, the court might do well to remit it to sixty pounds, which he knew would please some of the council well, who had often declared their judgment that fines should be so imposed as they might upon occasion be moderated. So when the petition was returned to him, he takes it and alters the sum from sixty pounds to eighty pounds, without acquainting the court therewith, nor would say that he had done it, when the committee informed the court of the alteration, before the secretary charged him with it. Then he said he did it in jest, and when the secretary said he had reformed it, and the court called to have it put to the vote, he refused, and stirred up much heat and contention about it, so in the end the court required the deputy to put it up to the vote. Upon these and other miscarriages the deputies consulted together, and sent up their speaker, footnote, at this period, magistrates and deputies sat together in the general court, the governor or deputy governor presiding. The division into two bodies had not yet taken place. Savage understands by speaker here a temporary spokesman, in footnote, with some others to give him a solemn admonition, which was never done to any governor before, nor was it in their power without the magistrates had joined. These continual oppositions and delays, tending to the hindrance and perverting of justice, afforded much occasion of grief to all the magistrates, especially to Mr. Dudley, who, being a very wise and just man, and one that would not be trodden under foot of any man, took occasion, alleging his age, etc., to tell the court that he was resolved to leave his place, and therefore desired them against the next court of elections to think of some other. The court was much affected with it, and entreated him, with manifestation of much affection and respect towards him, to leave off those thoughts, and offered him any ease and liberty that his age and infirmities might stand in need of, but he continued resolute. Thereupon the governor also made a speech, as if he desired to leave his place of magistracy also, but he was fain to make his own answer, for no man desired him to keep, or to consider better for it. Footnote. 
Bellingham's unpopularity was plainly well deserved. In footnote. This session continued three weeks and established a hundred laws which were called the Body of Liberties. Footnote. For the Body of Liberties, prefaced by a learned and copious introduction by Francis C. Gray, see Collections of Massachusetts Historical Society, 3rd Series, Volume 8, page 191. Also Whitmore, The Colonial Laws of Massachusetts, Boston, 1889, Old South Leaflets, number 164, and American History Leaflets, number 25. In footnote. They had been composed by Mr. Nathaniel Ward, sometime pastor of the Church of Ipswich. He had been a minister in England and formerly a student and practicer in the course of the common law, and had been revised and altered by the court and sent forth into every town to be further considered of, and now again in this court they were revised, amended, and presented, and so established for three years by that experience to have them fully amended and established to be perpetual. At this session, Mr. Hawthorne, one of the deputies, and usually one of their speakers, made a motion to some other of the deputies of leaving out two of their ancientest magistrates because they were grown poor and spake reproachfully of them under that motion. This coming to Mr. Cotton, his knowledge, he took occasion from his text the next lecture day to confute and sharply, in his mild manner, to reprove such miscarriage which he termed a slighting or dishonoring of parents, and told the country that such as were decayed in their estates by attending the service of the country ought to be maintained by the country and not set aside for their poverty, being otherwise so well gifted and approved by long experience to be faithful. This public reproof gave such a cheek to the former motion that it was never revived after, yet by what followed it appeared that the fire, from which it broke out, was only raked up, not quenched, as will be shown and nod. Mr. Hawthorne, Footnote. William Hathorne, or Hawthorne, a leader in Salem till near the end of the century, was first speaker of the deputies, after the separation of the general court into two bodies, presently to be described. He was the ancestor of Nathaniel Hawthorne. The deputy governor mentioned was John Endicott. In footnote. And some others were very earnest to have some certain penalty set upon lying, swearing, etc., which the deputy and some other of the magistrates opposed, not disliking to have laws made against these or any other offenses, but in respect of the certain punishment. Whereupon Mr. Hathorne charged him with seeking to have the government arbitrary, etc., and the matter grew to some heat, for the deputy was a wise and stout gentleman, and knew Mr. Hathorne his neighbor well, but the strife soon fell, and there was no more spoken of it that court. Yet this gave occasion to some of the magistrates to prepare some arguments against the course intended of bringing all punishments to a certainty. The scope of these reasons was to make good this proposition, viz. All punishments, except such as are made certain in the law of God, or are not subject to variation by merit of circumstances, ought to be left arbitrary to the wisdom of the judges. Reason 1. God hath left a pattern himself in his word, where a few penalties are prescribed, and so many referred to the judges. And God himself varieth the punishments of the same offenses, as the offenses vary in the circumstances, as in manslaughter, in the case of a riotous son proved incorrigible, in the same sin aggravated by presumption, theft, etc., which are not only rules in these particular cases, but to guide the judges by proportion in all other cases. As upon the law of adultery, it may be a question whether Bathsheba ought to die by that law, in regard to the great temptation, and the command and power of the kings of Israel. So that which was capital in the men of Jabesh Gilead, Judges chapter 21 verse 10, and not coming up to the princes upon proclamation, was but confiscation of goods, etc. in Ezra 10, 8. See 2 Samuel chapter 14, 6 and 11. Reason 2. All punishments ought to be just, and offenses varying so much in their merit by occasion of circumstances, it would be unjust to inflict the same punishment upon the least as upon the greatest. Third. Justice requireth that every cause should be heard before it is judged, which cannot be when the sentence and punishment is determined beforehand. Fourth, such parts and gifts as the word of God requires in a judge were not so necessary if all punishments were determined beforehand. Fifth, God hath not confined all wisdom, etc., to any one generation that they should set rules for all others to walk by. Sixth, it is against reason that some men should better judge of the merit of a cause and the bare theory thereof than others, as wide as ungodly, should be able to discern of it pro renata. Seventh, difference of times, places, etc. may aggravate or extenuate some offenses. Eighth, we must trust God who can and will provide as wise and righteous judgment for his people in time to come, as in the present or for past times, 
and we should not attempt the limiting of his providence and frustrating the gifts of others by determining all punishments, etc. Objection. In theft and some other cases, as cases capital, God hath prescribed a certain punishment. Answer 1. In theft, etc., the law respects the damage and injury of the party, which is still one and the same, though circumstances may aggravate or extenuate the sin. Second, in capital cases, death is appointed as the highest degree of punishment which man's justice can reach. Objection. Then we might as well leave all laws arbitrary at the discretion of the judge. Answer 1. The reason is not like. First, God gave a certain law where he left the punishment arbitrary, so as we have a clear rule to guide the law where the punishment may be uncertain. The varying of the offense in the circumstance does not vary the ground or equity of the law, nor the nature of the guilt, as it doth the measure of the reward. He is as fully guilty of theft who steals a loaf of bread for his hunger as he that steals an horse for his pleasure. Objection. The statutes in England set down a certain penalty for most offenses. Answer 1. We are not bound to make such examples ourselves. Second, the penalty, commonly, is not so much as the least degree of that offense deserves. Twelve pence for an oath, five shillings for drunkenness, etc. End of section 14, 1641. Section 15 of History of New England, 1630 to 1649. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of New England, 1630 to 1649 by John Winthrop. Section 15, 1642. Month 11, January. Those of Providence, being all Anabaptists, were divided in judgment. Some were only against baptizing of infants. Others denied all magistracy and churches, etc., of which Gorton, who had lately been whipped at Aquidae, as is before mentioned, was their instructor and captain. Footnote. Here enters upon the stage Samuel Gorton, an enthusiast of somewhat better birth and education than many of his fellow fanatics. He was scarcely less of an embarrassment to the come-outers against Narragans at Bay than to the men of Plymouth and Massachusetts. Gorton underwent severe persecution which he endured heroically, the severities being among the least excusable of those inflicted by Puritan intolerance. A good account of Gorton, who reached considerable influence, is contained in the Dictionary of National Biography. See also Richmond, Rhode Island, especially volume 1, pages 144 to 148. No account of Gorton's whipping at Aquidae is to be found on any previous page of Winthrop, but Letchford, in his Plain Dealing, says of this Rhode Island experience, there lately they whipped one Mr. Gorton, a grave man, for denying their power and abusing some of their magistrates with uncivil terms. The governor, Mr. Coddington, saying in court, You that are for the king lay hold on Gorton, and he again on the other side called forth, All you that are for the king lay hold on Coddington, whereupon Gorton was banished the island. So with his wife and children he went to Providence. They began about a small trespass of swine, but it is thought some other matter was ingredient. The case of Gorton makes it plain that even in and about Narragansett Bay there were bounds to the exercise of tolerance. In footnote. These, being too strong for the other party, provoked them by injuries, so as they came armed into the field, each against other, but Mr. Williams pacified them for the present. This occasioned the weaker party to write a letter, under all their hands, to our governor and magistrates, complaining of the wrongs they suffered and desiring aid, or, if not that, counsel from us. We answered them that we could not levy any war, etc., without a general court. For counsel, we told them that except they did submit themselves to some jurisdiction, either Plymouth or ours, we had no calling or warrant to impose in their contentions. But if they were once subject to any, then they had a calling to protect them. After this answer, we heard no more from them for a time. The frost was so great and continual this winter that all the bay was frozen over, so much and so long as the like, by the Indians' relation, had not been these forty years, and it continued from the 18th of this month to the 21st of the 12th month, February. So as horses and carts went over in many places where ships have sailed, Captain Gibbons and his wife, with the verse on foot by them, came riding from his farm at Pullen Point, right over to Boston, the 17th of the 12th month, when it had thawed so much as the water was above the ice, half a foot in some places, and they passed with loads of wood and six oxen from Muddy River to Boston, and when it thawed it removed great rocks of above a ton or more weight, and brought them on shore. The snow likewise was very deep, especially northward about Aquamenticus, above three feet, and much more beyond. It was frozen also to sea, so far as one could well discern. 
To the southward also the frost was as great and the snow as deep, and at Virginia itself the great bay was much of it frozen over, and all their great rivers, so as they lost much cattle for want of hay and most of their swine. There was a shallop with eight men to go from Pascataquac to Pimiquid about the beginning of the frost. They would need set forth upon the Lord's day, though forewarned, etc. They were taken with a northwest tempest and put to sea about fourteen days. At length they recovered Monhegan. Four of them died with cold, the rest were discovered by a fisherman a good time after, and he brought them off the island. There was great fear lest much hurt might have been done upon the breaking up of the frost. Men and beasts were grown so bold. But by the good providence of God not one person miscarried, save one ward of Salem, an honest young man, who going to show a traveller the safest passage over the river, as he thought, by the salt house, fell in, and though he had a pitchfork in his hand, yet was presently carried under the ice by the tide. The traveller fell in with one leg while he went to help the other, but God preserved him. He had about him all the letters from England which were brought in a ship newly arrived at the Isle of Shoals, which sure were the occasion of God's preserving him more than any goodness of the man. Most of their bridges were broken down in diverse mills. About this time one turner of Charleston, a man of about fifty years of age, having led a loose and disorderly life, and being wounded in conscience at a sermon of Mr. Shepherd's, he kept it in and did not discover his distress to such as might have offered him help, etc., nor did attend upon the public means as he ought to have done, and after a good space he went out from his wife on the Lord's day at night, having kept at home all that day, and drowned himself in the little pit where was not above two feet water. Three men coming in a shell up from Braintree, the wind taking them short at Castle Island, one of them stepping forward to hand the sail, caused a fowling piece with a French lock which lay in the boat to go off. The whole charge went through the thigh of one man within one inch of his belly, yet missed the bone, then the shot, being goose shot, scattered a lull and struck the second man under his right side upon his breast, so as above forty shot entered his body, many into the capacity of his breast. The third man being now only able to steer, but not to get home the boat, it pleased God the wind favored him, so as he did fetch the governor's garden, footnote, governor's island, in footnote, and there being a small boat and men at that time, they brought them to Boston before they were too far spent with cold and pain, and beyond all expectation, they were both soon perfectly recovered, yet he who was shot in the breast fell into a fever and spit blood. One John Turner, a merchant's factor of London, had gone from hence to the West Indies the year before in a small pinnace of fifteen tons, and returned with great advantage in indigo, pieces of eight, footnote, pieces of eight reals, i.e. dollars, in footnote, etc. He said he got them by trade, but it was suspected he got them by prize. He prepared a bigger vessel and well manned in the beginning of winter, and putting to sea was forced in again three times, first by a leak, second by a contrary wind, and third he spent his mast in fair weather, and having gotten a new at Cape Ann, and towing it towards the bay, he lost it by the way, and so by these occasions, and by the frost, he was kept in all winter. Thereupon he gave over his voyage and went to Virginia, and there sold his vessel and shipped himself and his commodities in a Dutch ship for the West Indies. Month 1, March 27th. Mr. William Aspinwall, who had been banished, as is before declared, for joining with Mr. Wheelwright, being licensed by the general court to come and tender his submission, etc., was this day reconciled to the Church of Boston. He made a very free and full acknowledgment of his heir and seducement, and that with much detestation of his sin. The like he did after, before the magistrates, who were appointed by the court to take his submission, and upon their certificate thereof at the next general court, his sentence of banishment was released. It is observable how the Lord doth honor his people and justify their ways, even before the heathen, when their proceedings are true and just, as appears by this instance. Those at New Haven, intending a plantation at Delaware, sent some men to purchase a large portion of land of the Indians there, but they refused to deal with them. It so fell out that a Pequod Satchem, being fled his country in our war with them, and having seated himself with his company upon that river ever since, was accidentally there at the time. He, taking notice of the English and their desire, persuaded the other Satchem to deal with them, and told them howsoever they killed his countrymen had driven him out, yet they were honest men, and had just cause to do as they did, for the Pequods had done them wrong, and refused to give such reasonable satisfaction as was demanded of them. Whereupon the Satchem entertained them, and let them have what land they desired. 2nd, April. 14th. A general fast was kept for our native country in Ireland and our own occasions. The spring began very early, and the weather was very mild, but the third and fourth month proved very wet and cold, so that the low meadows were much spoiled, and at Connecticut they had such a flood as break their bridges, 
and killed all their winter corn and forced them to plant much of their Indian over. The last winter, diverse vessels were cast away to the southward, one at Long Island, where eight or nine persons were drowned. These were loose people who lived by trucking with the Indians. Month 3, May 9th. The ship Eleanor of London, one Mr. Ingley Master, arrived at Boston. She was laden with tobacco from Virginia, and having been about fourteen days at sea, she was taken with such a tempest as though all her sails were down and made up. Yet they were blown from the yards, and she was laid over on one side two and a half hours, so low as the water stood upon her deck, and the sea overraking her continually. And the day was as dark as if it had been night, and though they cut her masts, yet she righted not till the tempest assuaged. She stayed there till the fourth of the fourth month, June, and was well fitted with masts, sails, rigging, and victuals, at such reasonable rates as the master was much affected with his entertainment, and professed that he never found the like usage in Virginia, where he had traded these ten years. Captain Underhill, finding no employment here that would maintain him and his family, and having good offers made him by the Dutch governor, he speaking the Dutch tongue and his wife a Dutch woman, had been with the governor, and being returned desired the church's leave to depart. The church, understanding that the English at Stamford near the Dutch, had offered him employment and maintenance after their ability, advised him rather to go thither, seeing they were our countrymen and in a church estate. He accepted this advice. His wife, being more forward to this, consented, and the church furnished him out and provided a pinnace to transport him, but when he came there he changed his mind, or at least his course, and went to the Dutch. Footnote. John Underhill thus disappears from the stage to dwell with the Dutch, his former associates no doubt gladly bidding him farewell. In footnote. 18th. The Court of Elections was. Mr. Winthrop was again chosen governor, and Mr. Endicott deputy governor. This being done, Mr. Dudley went away, and though he were chosen an assistant, yet he would not accept it. Some of the elders went to his house to deal with him. His answer was that he had sufficient reasons to excuse and warrant his refusal, which he did not think fit to publish, but would impart to any one or two of them whom they should acquaint, which he did accordingly. The elders acquainted the court with what they had done, but not with the reasons of his refusal, only that they thought them not sufficient. The court sent a magistrate and two deputies to desire him to come to the court, for as a counselor he was to assist in the general court. The next day he came, and after some excuse he consented to accept the place, so that the court would declare that if any time he should depart out of the jurisdiction, which he protested he did not intend, no oath either of officer, counselor, or assistant should hold him in any bond where he stood. This he desired not for his own satisfaction, but that it might be a satisfaction to others who might scruple his liberty herein. After much debate, the court made a general order which gave him satisfaction. One Mr. Blinman, a minister in Wales, a godly and able man, came over with some friends of his, and being invited to Greens Harbor, footnote, now Marshfield, in footnote, near Plymouth, they went thither, but ere the year was expired there fell out some difference among them, which by no means could be reconciled. So as they agreed to part, and he came with his company and sat down at Cape Ann, which at this court was established to be a plantation, and called Gloucestershire. A book was brought into the court, wherein the institution of the standing council was pretended to be a sinful innovation. The governor moved to have the contents of the book examined, and then, if there appeared cause, to inquire after the author. But the greatest part of the court, having some intimation of the author, of whose honest intentions they were well persuaded, would not consent, only they permitted it to be read, but not to be spoken unto, but would have inquiry first made how it came into the court. Whereupon it was found to have been made by Mr. Saltonstall, one of the assistants, and by him sent to Mr. Hawthorne, then a deputy of the court, to be tendered to the court, if he should approve of it. Mr. Hawthorne did not acquaint the court with it, but delivered it to one of the freemen to consider of, with whom it remained about half a year, till he delivered it to Mr. Dudley. This discovery being made, the governor moved again that the matter of the book might be considered, but the court could not agree to it except Mr. Saltonstall were first acquit from any censure concerning the said book. This was thought to be a course out of all order, and upon that some passages very offensive and unwarrantable were mentioned, about which also the court being divided, the governor moved to take the advice of the elders concerning the soundness of the propositions and arguments. This the court would not allow neither, except the whole cause were referred also, which he thought sure they would have accepted for the cause being of a civil nature, it belonged to the court, and not to the elders, to judge of the merit thereof. In the end, a day or two after, when no further proceeding was otherwise like to be had, it was agreed that in regard the court was not jealous of any evil intention in Mr. Saltonstall, etc., 
and that when he did write and deliver it, as was supposed, there was an order in force which gave liberty to every freeman to consider and deliver their judgments to the next court about such fundamental laws as were then to be established, whereof one did concern the institution and power of the council. Therefore he should be discharged from any censure or further inquiry about the same, which was voted accordingly, although there were some expressions in the book which would not be warranted by that order, as that the council was instituted unwarily to satisfy Mr. Vane's desire, etc., whereas it was well known to many in the court, as themselves affirmed, that it was upon the advice and solicitation of the elders, and after much deliberation from court to court. Other passages there were also, which were very unsound, reproaching, and dangerous, and was manifested by an answer made thereunto by Mr. Dudley, and received at the next session of the court, and by some observations made by Mr. Norris, a grave and judicious elder, teacher of the church in Salem, and with some difficulty read also in court, who, not suspecting the author, handled him somewhat sharply according to the merit of the matter. This summer five ships more were built, three at Boston and one at Dorchester and one at Salem. A cooper's wife of Hingham, having been long in a sad melancholic distemper near to frenzy, and having formerly attempted to drown her child, but prevented by God's gracious providence, did now again take an opportunity, being alone, to carry her child, aged three years, to a creek near her house, and stripping it of the clothes, threw it into the water and mud. But the tide being low, the little child scrambled out, and taking up its clothes, came to its mother, who was set down not far off. She carried the child again, and threw it in so far as it could not get out, but then it pleased God that a young man coming that way saved it. She would give no other reason for it, but that she did it to save it from misery, and withal that she was assured she had sinned against the Holy Ghost, and that she could not repent of any sin. Thus doth Satan work by the advantage of our infirmities, which should stir us up to cleave the more fast to Christ Jesus, and to walk the more humbly and watchfully in all our conversation. At this general court appeared one Richard Gibson, a scholar, sent some three or four years since to Richmond's Island, footnote, near Scarborough, Maine. Robert Trelawney and Moses Goodyear had here a grant, or disputed bounds, from the Council for New England, 1631, in footnote, to be a minister to a fishing plantation there belonging to one Mr. Trelawney of Plymouth in England. He removed from thence to Pascatequack, and this year was entertained by the fishermen at the Isle of Shoals to preach to them. He, being wholly addicted to the hierarchy and discipline of England, did exercise a ministerial function in the same way, and did marry and baptize at the Isle of Shoals, which was now found to be within our jurisdiction. This man being incensed against Mr. Larkham, pastor of the church at Northam, late Dover, for some speeches he delivered in a sermon against such hirelings, etc., he sent an open letter to him, wherein he did scandalize our government, oppose our title to those parts, and provoke the people, by way of arguments, to revolt from us, this letter being showed to many before it came to Mr. Larkin. Mr. Gibson, being now showed this letter and charged with his offense, he could not deny the thing, whereupon he was committed to the marshal. In a day or two after he preferred a petition, which gave not satisfaction, but the next day he made a full acknowledgment of all he was charged with, and the evil thereof, submitting himself to the favor of the court. Whereupon, in regard he was a stranger, and was to depart the country within a few days, he was discharged without any fine or other punishment. Month 4, June 8th, when Nathaniel Briscoe, a godly young man, newly admitted a member of the Church of Boston, being single, he kept with his father, a godly poor man, but minded his own advantage more than his father's necessity, so as that his father, desiring in the evening to have his help the next day, he neglected his father's request, and rose very early next morning to go help another man for wages, and being loading in a boat in a small creek, he fell into the water and was drowned. About this time the adventurers to the Isle of Sable fetched off their men and goods all safe. The oil, teeth, seal, and horse hides, and some black fox skins came to near 1,500 pounds. One Darby Field, an Irishman, living about Pascatequack, being accompanied with two Indians, went to the top of the White Hill. Footnote. The first ascent of the White Mountains by a European. In footnote. He made his journey in 18 days. His relation at his return was that it was about 100 miles from Seiko, that after 40 miles travel he did, for the most part, ascend, and within 12 miles of the top was neither tree nor grass, but low savins, which they went upon the top of sometimes, but a continual ascent upon rocks, on a ridge between two valleys filled with snow, out of which came two branches of Seiko River, which met at the foot of the hill where there was an Indian town of some two hundred people. Some of them accompanied him within eight miles of the top, but durst go no further, telling him that no Indian ever dared to go higher, and that he would die if he went. 
So they stayed there till his return, and his two Indians took courage by his example and went with him. They went diverse times through the thick clouds for a good space, and within four miles of the top they had no clouds but very cold. By the way, among the rocks there were two ponds, one a blackish water and the other reddish. The top of all was plain about sixty feet square, and on the north side there was such a precipice as one could scarce discern to the bottom. They had neither cloud nor wind at the top in moderate heat. All the country about him seemed to level, except here and there a hill rising above the rest, but far beneath them. He saw to the north a great water which he judged to be about a hundred miles broad, but could see no land beyond it, the sea by Sago as if it had been within twenty miles. He saw also a sea to the eastward which he judged to be the Gulf of Canada. He saw some great waters in parts of the westward, which he judged to be the great lake which Canada rivers come out of. He found there much Muscovy glass. Footnote. Strictly, Muscovy glass was in sing glass. Here mica is meant. In footnote. They could rive out pieces of forty feet long and seven or eight broad. When he came back to the Indians, he found them drying themselves by the fire, for they had a great tempest of wind and rain. About a month after, he went again with five or six in his company. Then they had some wind on the top, and some clouds above them which hid the sun. They brought some stones which they supposed had been diamonds, but they were most crystal. See after, another relation more true and exact. Month 4, June 22nd. In the time of the general court, in a great tempest of thunder and lightning, in the evening, the lightning struck the upper sail of the windmill in Boston by the ferry, footnote, the windmill was on Copse Hill, opposite Charlestown, in footnote, and shattered it in many pieces, and missing the stones, struck into the standard, rived it down in three parts to the bottom, and one of the spans, and the main standard being bound about with a great iron hoop, fastened with many long spikes, it was plucked off, broken in the middle, and thrown upon the floor, and the boards upon the sides of the mill rived off, the sacks, etc., and the mill set on fire, and the miller being under the mill, upon the ground, chopping a piece of board, was struck dead, but company coming in found him to breathe, so they carried him to an house, and within an hour or two he began to stir, and strove with such force as six men could scarce hold him down. The next day he came to his senses, but knew nothing of what had befallen him, but found himself very sore on diverse parts of his body. His hair on one side of his head and beard was singed, one of his shoes torn off his foot, but his foot not hurt. The Indians at Kennebec, hearing of the general conspiracy against the English, determined to begin there, and one of them knowing that Mr. Edward Winslow did use to walk within the Palisados, prepared his piece to shoot him, but as he was about it, Mr. Winslow, not seeing him or suspecting anything, but thinking he had walked enough, went suddenly into the house, and so God preserved him. At the same general court there fell out a great business upon a very small occasion. Anno 1636 there was a stray sow in Boston, which was brought to Captain Keene. He had it cried diverse times, and diverse came to see it, but none made claim to it for near a year. He kept it in his yard with a sow of his own. Afterwards one Sherman's wife, having lost such a sow, laid claim to it, but came not to see it till Captain Keene had killed his own sow. After being showed the stray sow, and finding it to have other marks than she had claimed her sow by, she gave out that he had killed her sow. The noise hereof being spread about the town, the matter was brought before the elders of the church as a case of offense. Many witnesses were examined, and Captain Keene was cleared. She was not satisfied with this, by the instigation of one George Story, a young merchant of London who kept in her house, her husband being then in England, and had been brought before the governor upon complaint of Captain Keene as living under suspicion, she brought the cause to the inferior court at Boston, where upon a full hearing, Captain Keene was again cleared, and the jury gave him three pounds for his cost, and he bringing his action against Story and her for reporting about that he had stolen her sow, recovered twenty pounds damages of either of them. Story upon this searcheth down in the country to find matter against Captain Keene about the stray sow, and got one of his witnesses to come into Salem Court and to confess there that he had forsworn himself, and upon this he petitions in Sherman's name to the general court to have the cause heard again which was granted, and the best part of seven days were spent in examining of witnesses and debating of the cause. And yet it was not determined, for there being nine magistrates and thirty deputies, no sentence could by law pass without the greater number of both, which neither plaintiff nor defendant had, for there were for the plaintiff two magistrates and fifteen deputies, and for the defendant seven magistrates and eight deputies, and the other seven deputies stood doubtful. 
Much contention and earnestness there was, which indeed did mostly arise from the difficulty of the case, in regard of cross-witnesses, and some prejudices, as one professed, against the person, which blinded some men's judgments that they could not attend the true nature and course of the evidence. For all the plaintiff's witnesses amounted to no more but an evidence of probability, so as they might all swear true, and yet the sow in question might not be the plaintiff's. But the defendant's witnesses gave a certain evidence, upon their certain knowledge, and that upon certain grounds, and these as many and more, and of as good credit as the others. So as if this testimony were true, it was not possible the sow should be the plaintiff's. Besides, whereas the plaintiff's wife was admitted to take her oath for the marks of her sow, the defendant and his wife, being a very godly sober woman, was denied the like, although propounded in the court by Mr. Cotton, upon that rule in the law. He shall swear he hath not put his hand to his neighbor's goods. Yet they both in the open court solemnly, as in the presence of God, declared their innocency, etc. Further, if the case had been doubtful, yet the defendant's lawful possession ought to have been preferred to the plaintiff's doubtful title, for in equale jury melior est conditio posendentis. But the defendant, being of ill report in the country, for a hard dealer in his course of trading, and having been formally censured in the court and in the church also, by admonition for such offenses, carried many weak minds strongly against him. And the truth is, he was very worthy of blame in that kind, as diverse others in the country were also in those times, though they were not detected as he was, yet to give every man his due, he was very useful to the country, both by his hospitality and otherwise. But one dead fly spoils much good ointment. There was great expectation in the country, by occasion of stories clamors against him, that the cause would have passed against the captain, but falling out otherwise, gave occasion to many to speak unreverently of the court, especially of the magistrates, and the report went that their negative voice had hindered the course of justice, and that these magistrates must be put out, that the power of the negative voice might be taken away. Thereupon it was thought fit by the governor and other of the magistrates to publish a declaration of the true state of the cause, that truth might not be condemned unknown. This was framed before the court break up. For prevention whereof, the governor tendered a declaration in nature of pacification, whereby it might have appeared that howsoever the members of the court dissented in judgment, yet they were the same in affection, and had a charitable opinion of each other. But this was opposed by some of the plaintiff's part, so it was laid by. And because there was much laboring in the country upon a false supposition, that the magistrate's negative voice stopped the plaintiff in the case of the sow, one of the magistrates published a declaration of the necessity of upholding the same. It may be inserted here, being but brief. Footnote. The account here of a dispute over a very trivial matter must not be overlooked, since from the small occasion proceeded a memorable constitutional change. Captain Robert Keane, a well-to-do and highly connected man, interested in many important events, often was the object of popular ill-will, at this time being under suspicion of extortion. The charge made against him by Mistress Sherman seemed to many well-based, and being pushed with vigor by her and her friend's story, brought about at last nothing less than a constitutional crisis. Among the magistrates, Bellingham and Saltonstall sided with the people, but the magistrates in general opposing, much agitation arose as to the negative vote, which ended in the establishment for the colony of the bicameral system, the magistrates to sit by themselves as a senate, and the deputies to constitute an independent house. This change, whose consummation Winthrop notes on a later page, has profoundly affected political development. Records of Massachusetts Bay, under date, in footnote. Month 5, July 7th. From Maryland came one Mr. Neal with two pinnaces and commission for Mr. Calvert, the governor there, to buy mares and sheep, but having nothing to pay for them but bills charged upon the Lord Baltimore in England, no man would deal with him. One of his vessels was so eaten with worms that he was forced to leave her. Mr. Chancy of Situate persevered in his opinion of dipping in baptism, and practice accordingly, first upon two of his own, which being in very cold weather, one of them swooned away. Another, having a child about three years old, feared it would be frightened, as others had been, and one caught hold of Mr. Chancy, and who near pulled him into the water. She brought her child to Boston, with letters testimonial from Mr. Chancy, and had it baptized there. 21st. A general fast was kept by order of the general court and advice of some of the elders. The occasion was principally for the danger we conceived our native country was in, and the foul sins which had broken out among ourselves, etc. 23rd. Osamakin, the great sachem of Pakanakot in Plymouth jurisdiction, came, attended with many men and some other sagamores accompanying him, 
to visit the governor, who entertained him kindly, etc. The Mary Rose, which had been blown up and sunk with hauler ordnance, ballast, much light, and other goods, was now weighed and brought to shore by the industry and diligence of one Edward Bindle of Boston. The court gave the owners above a year's time to recover her and free the harbor, which was much damnified by her, and they, having given her over and ever attempting to weigh her, Edward Bindle undertook it upon these terms, viz. If he freed the harbor, he should have the whole, otherwise he should have half of all he recovered. He made two great tubs, bigger than a butt, very tight, and opened at one end, upon which were hanged so many weights as would sink it to the ground, six hundred weight. It was let down, the diver sitting in it, a cord in his hand to give notice when they should draw him up, and another cord to show when they should remove it from place to place, so he could continue in his tub near half an hour, and fasten ropes to the ordnance, and put the lead, etc., into a net or tub. When the tub was drawn up, one knocked upon the head of it, and thrust a long pole under water, which the diver laid hold of, and so was drawn up by it, for they might not draw the open end out of water for endangering him, etc. Footnote. A very early instance, perhaps the earliest on record, of the use of the diving bell. In footnote. The case of the money, shot out of one of the guns, which came to a trial in the court at Boston, 8, October 27th, see in the next leaf. 5, July 28th. A Dutch ship of 300 tons arrived here, laden with salt from the West Indies, which she sold here for plank and pipe stoves. She brought two Spanish merchants, who being taken at sea, while they went in a frigate from Domingo to find an English ship, which they had freighted there, and was by their agreement stolen out of the harbor, where she had been long embarred, they hired this Dutchman to bring them hither, where they had appointed their ship to come, not daring to go into Spain or England. They stayed here about a month, but their ship came not, so they went away again. We heard after that their ship had been fourteen days beating upon our coast, and being put back still by northwest winds, she bare up and went for England, and arriving at Southampton, the Parliament made use of the treasure. God would not suffer her to come to us, lest our heart should have been taken with her wealth, and so cause the Spaniard to have an evil eye upon us. Some of the elders went to Concord, being sent for by the church there, to advise with them about the maintenance of their elders, etc. They found them wavering about removal, not finding their plantation answerable to their expectation, and maintenance of two elders too heavy a burden for them. The elders' advice was that they should continue and wait upon God, and be helpful to their elders in labor and what they could, and all to be ordered by the deacons, whose office had not been formally improved this way against them, and that the elders should be content with what means the church was able at present to afford them, and if either of them should be called to some other place, then to advise with other churches about removal. One Waquash Cook, an Indian living about Connecticut River's mouth, and keeping much at Saybrook with Mr. Fenwick, attained to good knowledge of the things of God and salvation by Christ, so as he became a preacher to other Indians, and labored much to convert them, but without any effect, for within a short time he fell sick, not without suspicion of poison from them, and died very comfortably. There was about thirty pounds put into one of the guns of the Mary Rose, which was known all abroad. The guns being taken up and searched, they pulled out one of them, a wad of rope yarn. They handled it and found it very heavy, and began to undo it, but being very wet and foul, they threw it down, and about eight or nine days after, coming to try one of the guns, and finding this wad lying there, they thrust it in after the powder, and shot it off into the channel, but perceived part of it to break and fall short and the rest fell into the middle of the channel. But the next low water there were taken up several pieces of gold and some silver. There was in a place where people passed daily, and never found there before that time. Those who had found the money refused to restore it to him who had bought and taken up the wreck. Whereupon he brought this action, and the money was adjudged to him. Two ships arrived from England, but brought not above five or six passengers, save our own people, and very few goods except rigging, etc., for some ships which were building here. Next came over a book of Mr. Cotton's sermons upon the seven vials. Mr. Humphrey had gotten the notes from some who had took them by characters, footnote, i.e., in shorthand, and printed them in London. He had three hundred copies for it, which was a great wrong to Mr. Cotton, and he was much grieved at it, for it had been fit that he should have perused and corrected the copy before it had been printed. Month 6, August. Mr. Weld, Mr. Peter, and Mr. Hibbins, who were sent the last year into England, had procured five hundred pounds, which they sent over in linen, woolen, and other useful commodities for the country. 
which, because the stock might be preserved and returned this year for a further supply, were put off together for about eighty pounds profit, and the principal returned to Mr. Stoughton in the next ship. By their means also, Mr. Richard Andrews, an haberdasher in Cheapside, London, a godly man, and who had been a former benefactor to this country, having five hundred pounds due to him from the governor and company of Plymouth, gave it to this company to be laid out in cattle and other course of trade for the poor. Two fishermen drowned in a shallop, which is overset near Pascataquack. 24th. The ship trial, about 200 tons, built at Boston by the merchants there, being now ready to set sail, Mr. Thomas Coitmore, footnote, Thomas Coitmore, a worthy freeman whose widow became in 1647 the fourth wife of Winthrop, in footnote, master, and diverse godly seamen in her. Mr. Cotton was desired to preach aboard her, etc., but upon consideration that the audience would be too great for the ship, the sermon was at the meeting house. A plantation was begun the last year at Delaware Bay by those of New Haven, and some twenty families were transported thither, but this summer there fell such sickness and mortality among them as dissolved the plantation. The same sickness and mortality befell the Swedes also, who were planted upon the same river. The English were after driven out by the Swedes. Month 7, September. Mr. William Hibbins, who was one of those who were sent over into England the year before, arrived now in safety, with diverse others who went over then also. He made a public declaration to the church in Boston of all the good providence of, this, of the Lord towards him in his voyage to and fro, etc., wherein it was very observable what care the Lord had of them, and what desperate dangers they were delivered from upon the seas, such as the oldest seaman was amazed. And indeed, such preservations and deliverances have been so frequent to such ships as have carried off those of the Lord's family between the two Englands, as it would fill a perfect volume to report them all. Sixth, there came letters from diverse lords of the upper house, and some thirty of the house of commons, and others from the ministers there, who stood for the independency of churches, to Mr. Cotton of Boston, Mr. Hooker of Hartford, and Mr. Davenport of New Haven, to call them, or some of them, if all could not, to England, to assist in the synod there appointed to consider and advise about the settling of church government. Upon this such of the magistrates and elders as were at hand met together, and were most of them of opinion that it was a call of God, yet took respite of concluding till they might hear from the rest. Whereupon a messenger was presently dispatched to Connecticut and New Haven with the letters, etc. Upon return it was found that Mr. Hooker liked not the business, nor thought it any sufficient call for them to go three thousand miles to agree with three men, meaning those three ministers who were for independency and did solicit in the Parliament, etc. Mr. Avonport thought otherwise of it, so as the church there set apart a day to seek the Lord in it, and thereupon came to this conclusion, that seeing the church had no other officer but himself, therefore they might not spare him. Mr. Cotton apprehended strongly a call of God in it, though he was very averse to a sea voyage, and the more because his ordinary topic in Acts 13 led him to deliver that doctrine of the interest all churches have in each other's members for mutual helpfulness, etc., but soon after came other letters out of England upon the breach between the King and Parliament, from one of the former lords, and from Mr. Weld and Mr. Peter, to advise them to stay till they heard further, so this care came to an end. Footnote. This invitation, extended by Owen, Goodwin, and Nye, the three chief ministers of the independence in England, to the three lights of the New England Congregationalism, to take part in the Westminster Assembly, is very significant. From the three, especially Cotton, had gone back to England a powerful influence, so much so that independency in England was called the, quote, New England Way, end quote. At this period, independency was just rising into consequence, but afterwards it became dominant. It would have been a calamity to New England had Cotton, Hooker, and Davenport at this time departed, and their presence in England could scarcely have affected the general result. In footnote. There arrived another ship with salt, which was put off for pipe staves, etc., so by an unexpected providence we were supplied of salt to go on with our fishing, and of ships to take off our pipe staves, which lay upon men's hands. There fell out a very sad accident at Weymouth. One Richard Sylvester, having three small children, he and his wife going to the assembly upon the Lord's Day left their children at home. The eldest was without doors looking to some cattle, the middlemost being a son about five years old, seeing his father's fowling piece, being a very great one, stand in his chimney, took it and laid it upon a stool, as he had seen his father do, and pulled up the cock, the spring being weak, and put down the hammer, then went to the other end and blowed in the mouth of the piece, as he had seen his father also do, and with that stirring the piece, being charged, it went off, and shot the child into the mouth and through the head. When the father came home, he found his child lie dead. 
I could not have imagined how he should have been so killed, but the youngest child, being but three years old and could scarce speak, showed him the whole manner of it. There arrived in a small pinnace one Mr. Bennett, a gentleman of Virginia, with letters from many well-disposed people of the Upper New Farms. Footnote. Perhaps the reading should be of Upper Norfolk. At any rate, the chief signers of the letter were magistrates of that country. In footnote. In Virginia, to the elders here, bewailing their sad condition for want of the means of salvation, and earnestly entreating a supply of faithful ministers, whom, upon experience of their gifts and godliness, they might call to office, etc. Upon these letters, which were openly read in Boston upon a lecture day, the elders met and set a day apart to seek God in it, and agreed upon three who might most likely be spared, viz. Mr. Phillips of Watertown, Mr. Thompson of Braintree, and Mr. Miller of Rowley for these churches had each of them two. Having designed these men, they acquainted the general court herewith, who did approve thereof, and ordered that the governor should commend them to the governor and council of Virginia, which was done accordingly. But Mr. Phillips, being not willing to go, Mr. Knowles, his fellow elder, and Mr. Thompson, with the consent of their churches, were sent away, and departed on their way. Aber, October 7th. To Taunton, to meet the bark at Narangnesset. Mr. Miller did not accept the call. The main argument which prevailed with the churches to dismiss them to that work, and with the court to allow and further it, was the advancement of the kingdom of Christ in those parts, and the confidence they had in the promise, that whosoever shall part with father, etc., for my sake in the gospels, shall receive an hundredfold. We were so far from fearing any loss by parting with such desirable men, as we looked at them as seed sown, which would bring us in a plentiful harvest, and we accounted it no small honor that God had put upon his poor churches here, that other parts of the world should seek to us for help in this kind. For about the same time, two of our vessels, which had been gone near a year, and were much feared to be lost, returned home with a good supply of cotton, and brought home letters with them from Barbados and other islands in those parts, entreating us to supply them with ministers. But, understanding that these people were much infected with familism, etc., the elders did nothing about it, intending to inquire further by another vessel which was preparing for those parts. Month 7, September 1st. There came letters from the court at Connecticut, and from two of the magistrates there, and from Mr. Ludlow near the Dutch, certifying us that the Indians all over the country had combined themselves to cut off all the English, that the time was appointed after harvest, the manor also, they should go by small companies to the chief men's house by way of trading, etc., and should kill them in the house and seize their weapons, and then others should be at hand to prosecute the massacre and that this was discovered by three several Indians, near about the same time and in the same manner, one to Mr. Eden of New Haven, another to Mr. Ludlow, and a third to Mr. Haynes. This last being hurt near to death by a cart, etc., sent after Mr. Haynes, and told him that Englishman's God was angry with him, and had set Englishman's cow to kill him, because he had concealed such a conspiracy against the English, and so told him of it, as the other two had done. Upon this their advice to us was, that it was better to enter into war presently, and begin with them, and if we could send one hundred men to the river's mouth of Connecticut, they would meet us with a proportionable number. Upon these letters the governor called so many of the magistrates as were near, and being met, they sent out summons for a general court, to be kept six days after, and in the meantime it was thought fit for our safety, and to strike some terror into the Indians, to disarm such as were within our jurisdiction. Accordingly, we sent men to cut Shamakin at Braintree, to fetch him and his guns, bows, etc., which was done, and he came willingly, and being late in the night when they came to Boston, he was put in the prison. But the next morning, finding upon examination of him and diverse of his men, no ground of suspicion of his partaking in any such conspiracy, he was dismissed. Upon the warrant which went to Ipswich Rally in Newbury, to disarm Pasaconomy, who lived by Merrimack, they sent forth forty men armed the next day, being the Lord's Day. But it rained all the day, as it had done diverse days before, and also after, so as they could not go to his wigwam, but they came to his sons and took him, which they had warrant for, and his squaw and her child, which they had no warrant for, and therefore order was given so soon as we heard of it, to send them home again. They, fearing his son's escape, led him in a line, but he taking an opportunity, slipped his line and escaped from them, but one very indiscreetly made a shot at him, and missed him narrowly. Upon the intelligence of these unwarranted proceedings, and considering that past economy would look at it as a manifest injury, as indeed we conceived it to be, and had always shunned to give them any just occasion against us, the court being now assembled, we sent Cut Shemekin to him to let him know what was done to his son and squaw was without order, and to show him the occasion whereupon we had sent to disarm all the Indians, and that when we should find that they were innocent of any such conspiracy, 
we were to restore all their arms again, and to will him also to come speak with us. He returned answer that he knew not what was become of his son and his squaw, for one of them was run into the woods and came not again for ten days after, and the other was still in custody. If he had them safe again, then he would come to us. Accordingly, about a fortnight after he sent his eldest son to us, who delivered up his guns, etc. Month 7, September, the 8th. The general court being assembled, we considered of the letters and other intelligence from Connecticut, and although the thing seemed very probable, yet we thought it not sufficient ground for us to begin a war, for it was possible it might be otherwise, and that all this might come out of the enmity which had been between me and Tenema and Ancus, who continually sought to discredit each other with the English. We considered also of the like reports which had formerly been raised almost every year since we came, and how they proved to be but reports raised up by the opposite factions among the Indians. Besides, we found ourselves in very ill case for war, and if we should begin, we must then be forced to stand continually upon our guard, and to desert our farms and business abroad, and all our trade with the Indians, which things would bring us very low. And besides, if upon this intelligence we should kill any of them, or lose any of our own, and it should be found after to have been a false report, we might provoke God's displeasure and blemish our wisdom and integrity before the heathen. Further, it was considered that our beginning with them could not secure us against them. We might destroy some part of their corn and wigwams, and force them to fly into the woods, etc., but the men would still be remaining to do us mischief, for they will never fight us in the open field. Lastly, it was considered that such as were to be sent out in an expedition were, for the most part, godly, and would be as well assured of the justice of the cause as the warrant of their call, and then we would not fear their forwardness and courage, but if they should be sent out, not well resolved, we might fear the success. According to these considerations, we returned answer to Connecticut, and withal we sent two men with two interpreters, an Englishman and an Indian, to Miantenema, to let him know what intelligence we had of his drawing the rest of the Indians into a confederation against us, and of his purpose to make his son Sachem of Pequod, and of other things which were breaches of the league he made with us, and to desire him to come by such a time to give us satisfaction about them. If he refused to come and gave them no satisfactory answer, then to let him know that if he regarded not our friendship, he would give us occasion to right ourselves. An instruction was given them, that if he gave them occasion, they should tell him the reason of our disarming the Indians, and excuse the injury done to pass economy, to be a mistake and without our order. The messengers coming to him, he carried them apart into the woods, and taking only one of his chief men with him, and gave them very rational answers to all their propositions, and promised also to come over to us, which he did within the time prefixed. When he came, the court was assembled, and before his admission we considered how to treat with him, for we knew him to be a very subtle man, and agreed upon the points in order, and that none should propound anything to him but the governor, and if any other of the court had anything material to suggest, he should impart it to the governor. Being called in, and mutual salutations passed, he was set down at the lower end of the table, over against the governor, and had only two or three of his counselors and two or three of our neighboring Indians, such as he desired, but would not speak of any business at any time, because some of his counselors were present, lodging that he would have them present, that they might bear witness with him at his return home of all his sayings. In all his answers he was very deliberate and showed good understanding in the principles of justice and equity and ingenuity withal. He demanded that his accusers might be brought forth to the end, that if they could not make good what they had charged him with, they might suffer what he was worthy of, and must have expected, if he had been found guilty of his death. We answered, We knew them not, nor were they within our power, nor would we give credit to them, before we had given him knowledge of it according to our agreement with him. He replied, If you did not give credit to it, why then did you disarm the Indians? We answered, For our security, and because we have been credibly informed that some of the eastern Indians had lately robbed diverse Englishmen's houses at Sacco, and taken away their powder and guns. This answer satisfied him. He gave diverse reasons why we should hold him free of any such conspiracy, and why we should conceive it was a report raised by Ancus, etc., and therefore offered to meet Ancus at Connecticut, or rather at Boston, and would prove to his face his treachery against the English, etc., and told us he would come to us at any time, for though some had dissuaded him, assuring him that the English would put him to death or keep him in prison, yet he being innocent of any ill intention against the English, he knew them to be so just as they would do him no wrong, and told us that if we sent but any Indian to him that he liked, he would come to us, and we should not need to send any of our own men. He urged much that those might be punished who had raised the slander, and put it to our consideration what damage it had been to him, and that he was forced to keep his men at home, and not suffer them to go forth on hunting, etc., till he had given the English satisfaction, and the charge and trouble had put the English unto, etc. 
We spent the better part of two days in treating with him, and in conclusion he did accommodate himself to our satisfaction. Only some difficulty we had to bring him to desert the Neantics, if we had just cause of war with them. They were, he said, as his own flesh, being allied by continual intermarriages, etc. But at last he condescended, footnote, agreed, in footnote, that if they should do us wrong, as he could not draw them to give us satisfaction for, nor himself could satisfy, as if it were for blood, etc., then he would leave them to us. When we should go to dinner, there was a table provided for the Indians to dine by themselves, and me and Tunamo was left to sit with them. This he was discontented at, and would eat nothing till the governor sent him meat from his table. So at night, and all the time he stayed, he sat at the lower end of the magistrate's table. When he departed, we gave him and his counselors coats and tobacco, and when he came to take his leave of the governor, and such of the magistrates as were present, he returned to give his hand to the governor again, saying, That was for the rest of the magistrates who were absent. The court being adjourned for a few days, till we might hear from me and Tenema, it was assembled again at the same time as he came to Boston. There came letters from Connecticut, certifying us of diverse insolencies of the Indians, which so confirmed their minds in believing the former report, as they were now resolved to make war upon the Indians, and earnestly pressing us to delay no longer to send forth our men to join with them, and that they thought they should be forced to begin before they could hear from us again. Upon receipt of these letters, the governor assembled such of the magistrates and deputies as were at hand, and diverse of the elders also, for they were then met at Boston upon other occasions, and imparted the letters to them, with other letters sent from the governor of Plymouth, intimating some observations they had, which made them very much to suspect that there was such a plot in hand, etc. We all sat in consultation here about all the day, and in the end concluded, first, that all these informations might arise from a false ground, and out of the enmity which was between the Narangnesset and Monhegan. Second, being thus doubtful, it was not a sufficient ground for us to war upon them. Third, that all these particular insolencies and wrongs ought to be revenged and repaired by course of justice, if it might be attained, otherwise we should never be free from war. And accordingly, letters were sent back to our brethren at Connecticut to acquaint them with our opinions and to dissuade them from going forth alleging how dishonorable it would be to us all, that, while we were upon treaty with the Indians, they should make war upon them, for they would account their act as our own, seeing we had formerly professed to the Indians that we were all as one, and in our late message to me and Tenema, had remembered him again of the same, and he had answered that he did so account us. Upon receipt of this our answer, they forbade to enter into war, but it seemed unwillingly, and as not well pleased with us. Although we apprehended no danger, yet we continued our military watches till near the end of April, October, and restored the Indians all their arms we had taken from them. For although we saw it was very dangerous to us that they should have guns, etc., yet we saw not in justice how we could take them away, seeing they came lawfully by them, by trade with the French and Dutch for the most part, and used them only for killing a fowl and deer, etc., except they brought themselves into the state of an enemy, there we thought it better to trust God with our safety than to save ourselves by an unrighteousness. Footnote. It is not known what reasons the Connecticut men had at this time for fearing an Indian outbreak. Uncas and Miantunema, Sachems respectively of the, the Mohegans and Orangnesets, were unfriendly and intrigued against each other. Massachusetts had good reason to be anxious, and no blame can attach to the magistrates for watching Miantunema, who had managed to quiet the suspicions of his white neighbors. In footnote. At this court we were informed of some English to the eastward who ordinarily traded power to the Indians, and lived alone under no government, whereupon we granted warrant to a gentleman, that upon due proof, etc., he should take away their powder, leaving them sufficient for their own occasions. This court also took order that every town should be furnished with powder out of the common store, paying for it in country commodities, likewise for muskets, and for military watches and alarms, etc., Presently upon this, there arose an alarm in the night upon this occasion. 7. September 9. A man, traveling late from Dorchester to Watertown, lost his way, and being benighted and in a swamp about ten of the clock, hearing some wolves howl, and fearing to be devoured of them, he cried out, Help, help! One that dwelt within hearing, over against Cambridge, hallooed to him. The other still cried out, which caused the men to fear that the Indians had gotten some Englishman and were torturing him, but not daring to go to him, he discharged a piece two or three times. This gave the alarm to Watertown, and so it went as far as Salem and Dorchester, but about one or two of the clock, no enemy appearing, etc., all retired but the watch. At this court also, four of Providence, who could not consort with Gorton and that company, and therefore were continually injured and molested by them, 
came and offered themselves and their lands, etc., to us, and were accepted under our government and protection. This we did partly to rescue these men from unjust violence, and partly to draw in the rest of those parts, either under ourselves or Plymouth, who now lived under no government, but grew very offensive, and the place was likely to be of use to us, especially if we should have occasion of sending out against any Indians in Narragansett, and likewise for an outlet into the Narragansett Bay, and seeing it came without our seeking, and would be no charge to us, we thought it not wisdom to let it slip. Footnote. The settlement at Providence was anything but a happy family. The most moderate spirits were sometimes outraged. It was soon found that there must be limits to tolerance. The action of the four Providence men, which gave Massachusetts pretext for a protectorate, was taken in accordance with the advice it recorded on page 53, ante. In footnote. The English of Southampton on Long Island, having certain intelligence of one of those Indians who murdered Hammond, who was put ashore there with others when their pinnace was wrecked, sent Captain Howe and eight or ten men to take him. He being in the wigwam, ran out, and with his knife wounded one of the English in the breast, and so behaved himself as they were forced to kill him. 22nd. The court, with advice of the elders, ordered a general fast. The occasions were, first, the ill news we had out of England concerning the breach between the king and parliament, Second, the danger of the Indians. Third, the unseasonable weather. The rain having continued so long, viz. near a fortnight together, scarce one fair day, and much corn and hay spoiled, though indeed it proved a blessing to us, for it being with warm easterly winds, it brought the Indian corn to maturity, which otherwise would not have been ripe, and it pleased God that so soon as the fast was agreed upon, the weather changed and proved fair after. At this court, the proposition sent from Connecticut about a combination, etc., were read, and referred to a committee to consider of after the court, who meeting added some few cautions and new articles, and for the taking in of Plymouth, who were now willing, and Sir Ferdinand O'Gorge's province, and so returned them back to Connecticut to be considered upon against the spring, for winter was now approaching, and there could be no meeting before, etc. The sudden fall of land and cattle, and the scarcity of foreign commodities and money, etc., with a thin access of people from England, put many into an unsettled frame of spirit, so as they concluded there would be no subsisting here, and accordingly they began to hasten away, some to the West Indies, others to the Dutch, at Long Island, etc., for to the governor there invited them by fair offers, and others back for England. Among others who returned thither, there was one of the magistrates, Mr. Humphrey, and four ministers, and a schoolmaster. These would needs go against all advice, and had a fair and speedy voyage, till they came near England, all which time three of the ministers, with a schoolmaster, spake reproachfully of the people and of the country but the wind coming up against them they were tossed up and down being in timber december so long till their provisions and other necessaries were near spent and they were forced to straight allowance yet at length the wind coming fair again they got into the sleeve footnote the english channel and footnote but then there arose so great a tempest at southeast as they could bear no sail and so were out of hope of being saved being in the night also then they humbled themselves before the Lord, and acknowledging God's hand to be justly out against them for speaking evil of this good land and the Lord's people here, etc. Only one of them, Mr. Phillips of Rentham in England, had not joined with the rest, but spake well of the people and of the country. Upon this it pleased the Lord to spare their lives, and when they expected every moment to have been dashed upon the rocks, for they were hard by the needles, he turned the wind so as they were carried safe to the island of Wight by St. Helens. Yet the Lord followed them on shore. Some were exposed to great straits, and found no entertainment, their friends forsaking them. One had a daughter that presently ran mad, and two other of his daughters, being under ten years of age, were discovered to have been often abused by diverse lewd persons and filthiness in his family. The schoolmaster had no longer hired an house, and gotten in some scholars, but the plague set in, and took away two of his own children. Others who went away to other places upon like grounds succeeded no better. They fled for fear of want, and many of them fell into it, even to extremity, as if they had hastened into the misery which they feared and fled from, besides depriving themselves of the ordinances and church fellowship, and those civil liberties which they enjoyed here. Whereas such as stayed in their places, kept their peace and ease, and enjoyed still the blessing of the ordinances, and never tasted of those troubles and miseries which they heard to have befallen those who departed. Much disputation there was about liberty of removing for outward advantages, and all ways were sought for an open door to get out at, but it is to be feared many crept out at a broken wall. For such as come together into a wilderness, where are nothing but wild beasts and beasts like men, and there confederate together in civil and church estate, whereby they do, implicitly at least, 
bind themselves to support each other and all of them that society whether civil or sacred whereof they are members how they can break from this without free consent is hard to find so as may satisfy a tender or good conscience in time of trial ask thy conscience if thou wouldst have plucked up thy stakes and brought thy family three thousand miles if thou hadst expected that all or most would have forsaken thee there ask again what liberty thou hast towards others which thou likest not to allow others towards thyself for if one may go another may and so the greater part and so church and commonwealth may be left destitute in a wilderness exposed to misery and reproach and all for thy ease and pleasure whereas these all being now thy brethren as near to thee as the israelites were to moses it were much safer for thee after his example to choose rather to suffer affliction with thy brethren than to enlarge thy ease and pleasure by furthering the occasion of their ruin footnote a pathetic outpouring from the fatherly heart of winthrop over a straitened and apparently disintegrating colony in footnote nine bachelors commenced at cambridge they were young men of good hope and performed their acts so as they gave good proof of their proficiency in the tongues and arts eight october fifth the general court had settled the government or superintendency over the college fees all the magistrates and elders over the six nearest churches and the president or the greatest part of these most of them were now present at this first commencement and dined at the college with the scholars ordinary commons which was done of purpose for the students encouragement etc and it gave good content to all footnote this entry relates to the first commencement at cambridge the college was founded in sixteen thirty six nowhere in the journal is there mention of the benefaction of john hardford the act of sixteen forty two vested the government and all the magistrates of the jurisdiction i e of massachusetts the teaching elders of the six nearest towns and the president one of the nine who were graduated was the celebrated george downing in footnote at this commencement complaint was made to the governors of two young men of good quality lately come out of england for foul misbehavior in swearing and ribaldry speeches etc for which though they were adult they were corrected in the college and sequestered etc for a time six here came in a french shallop with some fourteen men whereof one was latour his lieutenant they brought letters from latour to the governor full of compliments and desire of assistance from us against monsieur de alny they stayed here about a week and were kindly entertained and though they were papists yet they came to our church meeting and the lieutenant seemed to be much affected to find things as he did and professed he never saw so good order in any place one of the elders gave him a french testament with marlorat's notes which he kindly accepted and promised to read it footnote latour and d'alnay already mentioned as agents under the chevalier Rassidi for superintending the french claim to the eastward they had quarrelled and their english neighbours as we shall see were for years much embarrassed by them the huguenot commentator augustin marlorat fifteen o six to fifteen sixty three is the writer alluded to in footnote thirteenth six shents went hence laden with pipe staves and other commodities of the country four went a little before of those four were built in the country this year thus god provided for us beyond expectation six mention is made before of the white hills discovered by one darby field the report he brought of shining stones etc caused diverse others to travel thither but they found nothing worth their pains amongst others mr gorge and mr vines two of the magistrates of sir ferdinand gorge his providence went thither about the end of this month they went up sacco river in birch canoes and that way they found it ninety miles to powaget an indian town footnote pigwacket or pequacket is now fryberg maine in footnote but by land it is but sixty upon sacco river they found many thousands of acres of rich meadow but there are tin falls which hinder boats etc from the indian town they went uphill for the most part about thirty miles in woody lands then they went about seven or eight miles upon shattered rocks without tree or grass very steep all the way at the top is a plain about three or four miles over all shattered stones and upon that is another rock or spire about a mile in height and about an acre of ground at the top at the top of the plain rise four great rivers each of them so much water at the first issue as would drive a mill connecticut river from two heads at the northwest and southwest which join in one about sixty miles off sacco river on the southeast and muskagon which runs into casco bay at the northeast and kennebec at the north by east the mountain runs east and west thirty or forty miles but the peak is above all the rest they went and returned in fifteen days eight october eighteenth all the elders met at ipswich they took into consideration the book which was committed to them by the general court 
and were much different in their judgments about it, but at length they agreed upon this answer in effect. Footnote. The Book of Laws now comes in to give form and definiteness to the theocracy. In footnote. Or as in the book, there were three propositions laid down, and then the application of them to the standing council, and then the arguments enforcing the same, the propositions were these. First, in a commonwealth, rightly and religiously constituted, there is no power, office, administration, or authority, but such as are commanded and ordained of God. Second, the powers, offices, and administrations that are ordained of God, as aforesaid, being given, dispensed, and erected in a Christian commonwealth by his good providence, proportioned by his rule to their state and condition, established by his power against all opposition, carried on and accompanied with his presence and blessing, on not to be by them either changed or altered, but upon such grounds for such ends in that manner, and only so far as the mind of God may be manifested therein. Third, the mind of God is never manifested concerning the change or alteration of any civil ordinance, erected or established by them, as aforesaid in a Christian commonwealth, so long as all the cases, counsels, services, and occasions thereof may be duly and fully ended, ordered, executed, and performed without any change or alteration to government. In their answer they allowed the said propositions to be sound, with this distinction in the first, viz., that all lawful powers are ordained, etc., either expressly or by consequence, by particular examples, or by general rules. In the applications they distinguish between a standing council invested with a kind of transcendent authority beyond other magistrates, or else any kind of standing council distinct from magistrates. The former they seem implicitly to disallow, the latter they approve as necessary for us, not disproportionable to our estate, nor of any dangerous consequence for disunion among the magistrates, or factions among the people, which were the arguments used by the author against our council. Some passages they wish had been spared, and other things omitted which, if supplied, might have cleared some passages, which may seem to reflect upon the present councils, which they do not think to be of that moment, but that the uprightness of his intentions considered, and the liberty given for advice, according to the rules of religion, peace, and prudence, they would be passed by. Lastly, they declare their present thoughts about the molding and perfecting of a council in four rules. First, that all the magistrates, by their calling and office, together with the care of judicature, are to consult for the provision, protection, and universal welfare of the commonwealth. Second, some select men taken out from the assistants, or other freemen, being called thereunto, to be in especial, to attend by way of counsel for the provision, protection, and welfare of the commonwealth. Third, this council, as counselors, have no power of judicature. Fourth, in cases of instant danger to the commonwealth, in the interim, before a general court can be called, which were meet to be done with all speed, which shall be consented unto and concluded by this council, or the major part of them, together with the consent of the magistrates, or the major part of them, may stand good and firm till the general court. 9. November 7th. Some of our merchants sent a pinnace to trade with Latour in St. John's River. He welcomed them very kindly, and wrote to our governor letters very congratulatory for his lieutenant's entertainment, etc., and withal a relation of the state of the controversy between himself and Monsieur de Alny. In their return they met with the Alni at Pimaquid, who wrote also to our governor, and sent him a printed copy of the rest, footnote, arret, decree, in footnote, against Latour, and threatened of us that if any of our vessels came to Latour, he would make prize of them. 22nd. The village at the end of Charleston Bounds was called Woburn, where they had gathered a church, and this day Mr. Carter was ordained their pastor, with the assistance of the elders of other churches. Some difference there was about his ordination, some advised in regard they had no elder of their own, nor any members very fit to solemnize such an ordinance. They would desire some of the elders of the other churches to have performed it, but others supposing it might be an occasion of introducing a dependency of churches, etc., and so a presbytery would not allow it. So it was performed by one of their own members, but not so well as orderly as it ought. Footnote. The ceremony is described with such fullness in a noted passage, Book 2, Chapter 22 of the wonder-working providence of Zion's Savior in New England, by Captain Edward Johnson of Woburn, one of the chief participants, in footnote. Diverse houses were burnt this year by drying flax. Among others, one Briscoe of Watertown, a rich man, a tanner, who had refused to let his neighbor have leather for corn, saying he had corn enough, had his barn, his corn, and leather, etc., burnt to the value of 200 pounds. Mr. Larkham of Northam, alias Dover, suddenly discovering a purpose to go to England, fearing to be dissuaded by his people, gave them his faithful promise not to go, but yet soon after he got on shipboard and so departed. 
It was time for him to be gone, for not long after a widow, which kept in his house, being a very handsome woman, and about fifty years of age, proved to be with child, and being examined, at first refused to confess the father, but in an end she laid it to Mr. Larkham. Upon this the Church of Dover looked out for another elder, and wrote to the elders to desire their help. There arrived at Boston a small ship from the Madeiras with wine and sugar, etc., which were presently sold for pipe staves, and other commodities of the country, which were returned to the Madeiras, but the merchant himself, when Mr. Parrish, stayed diverse months after. He had lived at the Madeiras many years among the priests and Jesuits, who told him, when he was come to hither, that those of New England were the worst of all heretics, and that they were the cause of the troubles of England, and of the pulling down the bishops there. Footnote. A testimony from foreign parts as to the prevalence in Old England of the, quote, New England way, end quote, during the Civil War, in footnote. When he went away, he blessed God for bringing him hither, professing that he would not lose what he had gotten in New England for all the wealth in the world. He went away in a pinnace built here, intending a speeding return. By the way, his pinnace, being cocked in the winter, proved very leaky, so as all the seamen, being tired out with pumping, gave her over, but Mr. Parrish continued the pump, and so kept her up, till it pleased God they espied land, and so they came safe to fail. 10. December those of the lower part of the river Pascataquack invited one Mr. James Parker of Weymouth, a godly man and a scholar, one who had been many years a deputy for the public court to be their minister. He, by advice of diverse of the magistrates and elders, accepted the call, and went and taught among them this winter, and it pleased God to give great success to his labors, so as above forty of them, whereof the most had been very profane, and some of them professed enemies to the way of our churches wrote to the magistrates and elders, acknowledging their sinful course they had lived in, and bewailing the same, and blessing God for calling them out of it, and earnestly desiring that Mr. Parker might be settled amongst them. Most of them fell back again in time, embracing this present world. This winter was the greatest snow we had since we came into the country, but it lay not long, and the frost was more moderate than in some other winters. End of section 15. Section 16 of History of New England, 1630 to 1649. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of New England, 1630 to 1649 by John Winthrop. Section 16, 1643. Part 1. Twelfth February. News came out of England, by two fishing ships, of the civil wars there between the king and the parliament, whereupon the churches kept diverse days of humiliation. But some of the magistrates were not satisfied about the often reiteration of them for the same cause, but they would not contend with the elders about it, but left the churches to their liberty. 1. March 5th. At seven in the morning, being the Lord's Day, there was a great earthquake. It came with a rumbling noise like the former, but through the Lord's mercy it did no harm. The churches held a different course in raising the minister's maintenance. Some did it by way of taxation, which was very offensive to some. Amongst others, one Briscoe of Watertown, who had his barn burnt, as before mentioned, being grieved with that course in their town, the rather because himself and others, who were no members, were taxed, wrote a book against it, whereupon, besides his arguments, which were not, he cast reproach upon the elders and officers. This book he published underhand, which occasioned much stir in the town. At length he and two more were convicted before the court, where he acknowledged his fault in those reproachful speeches and in publishing it, whereas it had been his duty to have acquainted the court or magistrates with his grievance, etc., but for the arguments in the point there was nothing required of him, and was fined ten pounds for that, and some slighting of the court, and one of the publishers, forty shillings. Corn was very scarce all over the country, so as by the end of the second month many families in most towns had none to eat, but were forced to live of clams, mussels, caddos, dry fish, etc. And sure this came by the just hand of the Lord to punish our ingratitude and covetousness. For corn being plenty diverse years before, it was so undervalued as it would not pass for any commodity. If one offered a shopkeeper corn for anything, his answer would be, he knew not what to do with it. So for laborers and artificers, but now they would have done any work or parted with any commodity for corn. And the husbandman, he now made his advantage, for he would part with no corn for the most part, but for ready money or for cattle, at such a price as should be twelve pence, and the bushel more to him than ready money. And indeed it was a very sad thing to see how little of a public spirit appeared in the country, but of self-love too much. 
Yet there were some here and there who were men of another spirit, and were willing to abridge themselves that others might be supplied. The immediate causes of the scarcity were the cold and wet summer, especially in the time of the first harvest. Also the pigeons came in such flocks, above ten thousand in one flock, that beat down and eat up a very great quantity of all sorts of English grain, much corn spent in setting out the ships, catches, etc. Lastly, there were such abundance of mice in the barns that devoured much there. The mice also did much spoil in orchards, eating off the bark at the bottom of the fruit trees in the time of the snow, so as never had been known the like spoil in any former winter. So many enemies doth the Lord arm against our daily bread, that we might know we are to eat it in the sweat of our brow. 1. March 30th. The trial, Mr. Coitmore Master, arrived in a week after one of the catches. He sailed first to Fayal, where he found an extraordinary good market for his pipe staves and fish. He took wine and sugar, etc., and sailed thence to Christopher's in the West Indies, where he put off some of his wine for cotton and tobacco, etc., and for iron, which the islanders had saved of the ships which were there cast away. He obtained license also of the governor, Sir Thomas Warner, to take up what ordnance, anchors, etc., he could, and was to have the one half, and by the help of a diving tub, he took up fifty guns and anchors and cables which he brought home and some gold and silver also which he got by trade and so through the lord's blessing they made a good voyage which did much encourage the merchants and made wine and sugar and cotton very plentiful and cheap in the country two catches also which were gone to the west indies for cotton etc arrived safe not long after and made return with profit another ship also called the increase sent to the mandarius returned safe, and two other ships after, though they went among the Turks. There was a piece of justice executed at New Haven, which, being the first in that kind, is not unworthy to be recorded. Mr. Malbon, one of the magistrates there, had a daughter about blank years of age, which was openly wept, her father joining in the sentence. The cause was thus. Footnote. Winthrop has left a blank space in the manuscript in which to insert the explanation, but does not give it. In footnote. The wife of one onion of Roxbury died in great despair. She had been a servant there, and was very stubborn and self-willed. After she was married, she proved very worldly, aiming at great matters. Her first child was stillborn, through her unruliness and falling into a fever. She fell withal into great horror and trembling, so as it shook the room, etc., and crying out of her torment, and of her stubbornness and unprofitableness under the means, and her lying to her dame and denying somewhat that in licorishness she had taken away, and of her worldliness, saying that she neglected her spiritual good for a low worldly trash, and now she must go to everlasting torments, and exhorted others to take heed of such evils, etc., and still crying out, Oh, ten thousand worlds for one drop of Christ, etc. After she had then been silent a few hours, she began to speak again, and being exhorted to consider of God's infinite mercy, etc., she gave still this answer, I cannot for my life, and so died. The three ministers which were sent to Virginia, viz. Mr. Thompson, Mr. Knowles, and Mr. James from New Haven, departed, 8 October 7th, and were eleven weeks before they arrived. They lay wind-bound some time at Aquaday. Then, as they passed Hellgate between Long Island and the Dutch, their pinnace was bilged upon the rocks, so as she was near foundered before they could run on the next shore. The Dutch governor gave them slender entertainment, but Mr. Allerton of New Haven, footnote, Isaac Allerton, formerly of Plymouth, in footnote, being there, took great pains and care for them, and procured them a very good pinnace and all things necessary. So they set sail in the dead of winter, and had much foul weather, so as with great difficulty and danger they arrived safe in Virginia. Here they found very loving and liberal entertainment, and were bestowed in several places, not by the governor, but by some well-disposed people who desired their company. In their way, the difficulties and dangers which they were continually exercised with put them to some question whether their call were of God or not, but so soon as they arrived there and had been somewhat refreshed, Mr. Thompson wrote back that being a very melancholic man and of a crazy body, he found his health so repaired and his spirit so enlarged, etc., as he had not been in the like condition since he came to New England. But this was to strengthen him for a greater trial, for his wife, a godly young woman, and a comfortable help to him, being left behind with a company of small children, was taken away by death, and all his children scattered, but well disposed of among his godly friends. 4. June 20th. Mr. Knowles returned from Virginia, and brought letters from his congregation and others there to our elders, which were openly read in Boston at a lecture, 
whereby it appeared that God had greatly blessed their ministry there. So as the people's hearts were much inflamed with desire after the ordinances, and though the state did silence the ministers because they would not conform to the order of England, footnote, by act of assembly forbidding nonconformist worship, in footnote, yet the people resorted to them in private houses to hear them as before. There fell out hot wars between the Dutch and the Indians thereabout. The occasion was this. An Indian, being drunk, had slain an old Dutchman. The Dutch required the murderer, but he could not be had. The people called often upon the governor to take revenge, but he still put it off, either for that he thought it was not safe or not just, etc. It fell out that the Mohawks, a people that live upon or near Hudson's River, either upon their own quarrel, or rather, as the report went, being set on by the Dutch, came suddenly upon the Indians near the Dutch and killed about thirty of them. The rest fled for shelter to the Dutch. One marine, a Dutch captain, hearing of it, goeth to the governor, footnote, William Kieft, in footnote, and obtains commission of him to kill so many as he could of them, and accordingly went with a company of armed men, and setting upon them, fearing no ill from the Dutch, he slew about seventy or eighty men, women, and children. Upon this the Indians burnt diverse of their farmhouses and their cattle in them, and slew all they could meet with, to the number of twenty or more, of men, women, and children, and pressed so hard upon the Dutch, even home to their fort, that they were forced to call in the English to their aid, and entertained Captain Underhill, etc., which Marine, the Dutch captain, took so ill, seeing the governor to prefer him before himself, that he presented his pistol at the governor, but was stayed by a stander by. Then a tenant of Marine discharged his musket at the governor, but missed him narrowly, whereupon the sentinel, by the governor's command, shot that fellow presently dead. His head was set upon the gallows, and the captain was sent prisoner into Holland. The people also were so offended at the governor for the damage they now sustained by the Indians, though they were all for war before, that the governor durst not trust himself among them, but entertained a guard of fifty English about his person, and the Indians did so annoy them by sudden assaults out of the swamps, etc., that he was forced to keep a running army to be ready to oppose them upon all occasions. The Indians also of Long Island took part with their neighbors upon the main, and as the Dutch took away their corn, etc., so they fell to burning the Dutch houses. But these, by the mediation of Mr. Williams, who was then there to go in a Dutch ship to England, were pacified and peace re-established between the Dutch and them. Footnote. A characteristic service from Roger Williams. In footnote. At length they came to an accord of peace with the rest of the Indians also. 23rd. One John Cook, an honest young man, being in his master's absence to salute a ship, etc., in the vanity of his mind, thought to make the gun give a great report, and accordingly said to some that he would make her speak. Overcharging her, she brake all into small pieces, and scattered round about some men a flight off. Himself was killed, but no hurt found about him, but only one hand cut off and beaten a good distance from the place where he stood. And there appeared a special providence of God in it, for although there were many people up and down, yet none was hurt, nor was any near the gun when she was fired, whereas usually they gather thither on such occasions. One of our ships, the Sea Bridge, arrived with twenty children and some other passengers out of England, and three hundred pounds worth of goods purchased with the country's stock, given by some friends in England the year before, and those children, with many more to come after, were sent by money given one fast day in London, and allowed by the Parliament and city for that purpose. The House of Commons also made an order in our favor, which was sent us under the hand of H. Elsinge, Clerk Parle D.C., footnote, Clericus Parliamenti Domus Communis, i.e., Clerk of the Common Houses, in footnote, to this effect, viz. Veneris, footnote, i.e., the Veneris, or Friday, March 10th, 1642, 1643, in footnote, 10 Marti, 1642. Whereas the plantations in New England have, by the blessing of Almighty God, had good and prosperous success without any charge of the state, and are now likely to prove very happy for the propagation of the gospel in those parts, and very beneficial and commodious for this kingdom and nation, the commons now assembled in Parliament do, for the better advancement of these plantations and encouragement of the planters, etc., ordain that all merchandises, goods exported, etc., into New England to be spent, used, or employed there, or being of the growth of that country, shall be imported hither, or put abroad to be spent, etc., in the voyage going or returning, and all and every the owners thereof be free of all customs, etc., in England and New England, and all other ports, until this house shall take further order. 
This to be observed and allowed by all officers and persons whatsoever upon showing forth of this order, signed by the said clerk without any other warrant. Our general court, upon receipt of this order, caused the same, with our humble and thankful acknowledgment of so great a favor from the Honorable Assembly, to be entertained verbatim among our records in perpetuum re memoriam. One Richard Blank, servant to one Blank Williams of Dorchester, being come out of service, fell to work at his own hand and took great wages above others, and would not work but for ready money. By this means in a year, or little more, he had scraped together about twenty-five pounds, and then returned with his prey into England, speaking evil of the country by the way. He was not gone far after his arrival, but the cavaliers met him and eased him of his money, so he knew no better way but to return to New England again, to repair his loss in that place which he had so much disparaged. Month 3rd, May 10. Our court of elections was held when Mr. Ezekiel Rogers, pastor of the church in Rowley, preached. He was called to it by a company of freemen, whereof the most were deputies chosen for the court, appointed, by order of the last court, to meet at Salem about nomination of some to be put to the vote for the new magistrates. Mr. Rogers, hearing what exception was taken to this call as unwarrantable, wrote to the governor for advice, etc., who returned him answer. That he did not account his calling not to be sufficient, yet the magistrates were not minded to strive with the deputies about it, but seeing it was noised in the country, and the people would expect him, and that he had advised with the magistrates about it, he wished him to go on. In a sermon he described how the man ought to be qualified whom they should choose for their governor, yet dissuaded them earnestly from choosing the same man twice together, and expressed some dislike of that with which such vehemency as gave offense. But when it came to trial, the former governor, Mr. Winthrop, was chosen again, and two new magistrates, Mr. William Hibbins and Mr. Samuel Simons. At this court came the commissioners from Plymouth, Connecticut, and New Haven, viz. from Plymouth, Mr. Edward Winslow and Mr. Collier, from Connecticut, Mr. Haynes and Mr. Hopkins, with whom Mr. Fenwick of Saybrook joined, from New Haven, Mr. Theophilus Eaton and Mr. Grigson. Our court chose a committee to treat with them, viz. the governor and Mr. Dudley, and Mr. Bradstreet, being of the magistrates, and of the deputies, Captain Gibbons, Mr. Ting the treasurer, and Mr. Hathorne. Footnote. The men mentioned in this entry were of the highest repute in their respective colonies, as was proper, since the business in hand was as grave as any in which New Englanders were ever concerned. Thomas Grigson and William Ting are the only ones not heretofore described. The former was perhaps, next to Theophilus Eaton, the chief citizen of New Haven, where he was the treasurer. The latter filled the same office in Massachusetts, was one of the richest men in the community, and though not a magistrate, was for eight successive terms a deputy. In footnote. These coming to consultation encountered some difficulties, but being all desirous of union and studious of peace, they readily yielded each to one other in such things as tended to common utility, etc. So as in some two or three meetings they lovingly accorded upon these ensuing articles, which, being allowed by our court and signed by all of the commissioners, were sent to be also ratified by the general courts of other jurisdictions, only Plymouth commissioners having power only to treat, but not to determine, deferred the signing of them till they came home, but soon after they were ratified by the general court also. Footnote. No event of our early history is more significant than the confederation of the four colonies, Massachusetts, Plymouth, Connecticut, and New Haven, a distinct foreshadowing of the great American Union. Its importance has been emphasized by all our historians. The League, a precedent for which has been the Federation of the States of the Netherlands, was initiated by Connecticut and New Haven, which, more exposed to pressure than their brethren farther east, the Dutch on the Hudson elbowing sharply, and the most formidable savages being close at hand, sought support from their friends longer established. It must be carefully noted that not all the English were included. The enterprises of Sir Ferdinando Gorges were, as always, looked upon askance for reasons which Winthrop assigns, as were also the undertakings at Providence and Aquidneck. The independent spirit which breathes through the document is unmistakable, and has been referred to by both liberal and Tory historians, the one side approving, the other condemning. About this time, says Palfrey, volume 1, page 633, the English Parliament appoints a commission for colonial government, the term used implying an understanding quite different from that of the colonists. In fact, the Parliament of 1643 was disposed to be scarcely less arbitrary than the King, or the later Parliament of George III. In footnote. 
Those of Sir Ferdinando Gorge, his providence, being Pascaquac, were not received nor called into the confederation, because they ran a different course from us both in their ministry and civil administration. For they had lately made Acamenticus, a poor village, a corporation, and had made a tailor their mayor, and had entertained one whole, an excommunicated person and very contentious for their minister. At this court of elections there arose a scruple about the oath which the governor and the rest of the magistrates were to take, viz. about the first part of it. You shall bear true faith and allegiance to our sovereign lord King Charles. Seeing he had violated the privileges of Parliament, and made war upon them, and thereby had lost much of his kingdom and many of his subjects, whereupon it was thought fit to omit that part of it for the present. About this time two plantations began to be settled upon Merrimack, Pentakit called Haverhill, and Cochichawick called Andover. The Articles of Confederation between the plantations under the government of the Massachusetts, the plantations under the government of New Plymouth, the plantations under the government of Connecticut, and the government of New Haven, with the plantations in combination therewith. Whereas we all came into these parts of America with one and the same end, an aim, namely, to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to enjoy the liberty of the gospel and purity with peace, Whereas we all came into these parts of America with one and the same end and aim, namely, to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity with peace, and whereas by our settling, by the wise providence of God, we are further dispersed upon the sea coasts and rivers than was at first intended, so that we cannot, according to our desire, with convenience communicate in one government and jurisdiction. And whereas we live encompassed with people of several nations and strained languages, which hereafter may prove injurious to us in our posterity, and for as much as the natives have formerly committed sundry insolences and outrages upon several plantations of the English, and have of late combined themselves against us, and seeing by reason of the sad distractions in England, which they have heard of, and by which they know we are hindered both from that humble way of seeking advice, and reaping those comfortable fruits of protection, which at other times we might well expect, we therefore do conceive it our bounden duty, without delay, to enter into a present consociation amongst ourselves for mutual help and strength in all future concernment, that, as in nature and religion, so in other respects, we be and continue one, according to the tenor and true meaning of the ensuing articles. 1. Wherefore it is fully agreed and concluded between the parties above named, and they jointly and severally do, by these presents, agree and conclude that they all be, and henceforth be called by the name of the United Colonies of New England. Second, these United Colonies, for themselves and their posterities, do jointly and severally hereby enter into a firm and perpetual league of friendship and amity, for offense and defense, mutual advice and succor upon all just occasions, both for preserving and propagating the truth and liberties of the gospel, and for their own mutual safety and welfare. Third, it is further agreed that the plantations which at present are, or hereafter shall be settled within the limits of Massachusetts, shall be forever under the government of the Massachusetts, and shall have peculiar jurisdiction amongst themselves in all cases as an entire body, and that Plymouth, Connecticut, and New Haven shall each of them exceeding the number hereby agreed, they may crave help thence, and seek no further for the present. The charge to be borne as in this article is expressed, and at their return to be victualled, and supplied with powder and shot, if there be need, for their journey, by that jurisdiction which employed or sent for them. But none of the jurisdictions do exceed these numbers till by a meeting of the commissioners for this confederation a greater aid appear necessary. In this proportion to continue till upon knowledge of the numbers of each jurisdiction, which shall be brought to the next meeting, some other proportion be ordered. But in any such case of sending men for present aid, whether before or after such order or alteration, it is agreed that at the meeting of the commissioners for this confederation, the cause of such war or invasion be duly considered, and if it appear that the fault lay in the party invaded, that then that jurisdiction or plantation make just satisfaction both to the invaders whom they have injured, and bear all the charge of the war themselves without requiring any allowance from the rest of the confederates towards the same. And further, that if any jurisdiction see any danger of an invasion approaching, and there be time for a meeting, that in such case three magistrates of that jurisdiction may summon a meeting at such convenient places as themselves shall think meet, to consider and provide against the threat and danger, provided when they are met they may remove to what place they please, 
Only while any of these four confederates have but three magistrates in their jurisdiction, a request or summons from any two of them shall be accounted of equal force with the three mentioned in both the clauses of this article, till there may be an increase of magistrates there. 6. It is also agreed that for the managing and concluding of all affairs peculiar to and concerning the whole confederation, commissioners shall be chosen by and out of each of these four jurisdictions, fees, two for the Massachusetts, two for Plymouth, two for Connecticut, and two for New Haven, all in church fellowship with us, which shall bring full power from their several general courts respectively, to hear, examine, weigh, and determine all affairs of war, peace, leagues, ages, charges, and numbers of men for war, division of spoils, and whatever is gotten by conquest. Receiving of more confederates or plantations into the combination with any of these confederates, and all things of like nature which are the proper concomitants or consequences of such a confederation for amity, offense, and defense, not intermeddling with the government of any of the jurisdictions, which by the third article is preserved entirely to themselves. But if those eight commissioners, when they meet, shall not agree, yet it is concluded that any six of the eight agreeing shall have power to settle and determine the business in question. But if six do not agree, that then such propositions with their reasons, so far as they have been debated, be sent and referred to the four general courts, fees, the Massachusetts, Plymouth, Connecticut, and New Haven. And if at all the said general courts the business so referred be concluded, then to be prosecuted by the Confederation and all their members. It is further agreed that these eight commissioners shall meet once every year, besides extraordinary meetings according to the fifth article, to consider, treat, and conclude of all affairs belonging to this confederation, which meeting shall ever be the first Thursday in September, and that the next meeting after the date of those presents, which shall be accounted the second meeting, shall be at Boston in the Massachusetts, the third at Hartford, the fourth at New Haven, the fifth at Plymouth, the sixth and seventh at Boston, and so in course successively. If in the meantime some middle place be not found out and agreed upon, which may be commodious for all the jurisdictions. 7. It is further agreed that at each meeting of these eight commissioners, whether ordinary or extraordinary, they all, or any six of them agreeing as before, may choose their president out of themselves, whose office and work shall be to take care and direct for order and a comely carrying on of all proceedings in their present meeting, but he shall be invested with no such power or respect as by which he shall hinder the propounding or progress of any business, or any way cast the scales otherwise than in the preceding articles as agreed. 8. It is also agreed that the commissioners for this confederation hereafter at their meetings, whether ordinary or extraordinary, as they may have commission or opportunity, do endeavor to frame and establish agreements and orders in general cases of a civil nature, wherein all the plantations are interested for preserving peace amongst themselves, and preventing, as much as may be, all occasions of war or differences with others, as about free and speedy passage of justice in each jurisdiction to all the confederates equally, as to their own, receiving those that remove from one plantation to another without due certificates, how all the jurisdictions may carry it towards the Indians, that they neither grow insolent nor be injured without due satisfaction, lest war break in upon the confederates through miscarriages. It is also agreed that if any servant run away from his master into any of the confederate jurisdictions, that in such case, upon certificate of one magistrate in the jurisdiction out of which the said servant fled, or upon other due proof, the said servant shall be delivered either to his master or any other that pursues and brings such certificate or proof, and that upon the escape of any prisoner or fugitive for any criminal case, whether breaking prison or getting from the officer, or otherwise escaping, upon the certificate of two magistrates of the jurisdiction out of which the escape is made, that he was a prisoner or such an offender at the time of the escape, the magistrate, or some of them of the jurisdiction where for the present the said governor or fugitive abideth, shall forthwith grant such a warrant as the case will bear, for the apprehending of any such person and the delivery of him into the hand of the officer or other person who pursueth him, and if there be help required for the safe returning of any such offender, then it shall be granted unto him that craves the same, he paying the charges thereof. Footnote. A rather curious forecast of the fugitive slave clause of the Constitution the indentured servants, as often appears, being scarcely less in bondage than African slaves. In footnote. 9. And for that the justice wars may be of dangerous consequence, especially to the smaller plantations in these united colonies, 
it is agreed that neither the Massachusetts, Plymouth, Connecticut, nor New Haven, nor any of the members of any of them, shall at any time hereafter begin, undertake, or engage themselves, or this confederation, or any part thereof, in any war whatsoever, sudden exigencies with the necessary consequences thereof accepted, which are also to be moderated as much as the case will permit, without the consent and agreement of the aforenamed eight commissioners, or at least six of them, as in the sixth article is provided, and that no charge be required of any of the confederates, in case of a defensive war, till the said commissioners have met and approved the justice of the war, and have agreed upon the sum of money to be levied, which sum is then to be paid by the several confederates in proportion according to the fourth article. Tenth, that in extraordinary occasions, when meetings are summoned by three magistrates of any jurisdiction, or two as in the fifth article, if any of the commissioners come not, due warning being given or sent, it is agreed that four of the commissioners shall have power to direct a war which cannot be delayed, and to send for due proportions of men out of each jurisdiction, as well as six might do if all met. But not less than six shall determine the justice of the war, or allow the demands or bills of charges, or cause any levies to be made for the same. Eleventh, it is further agreed that if any of the confederates shall hereafter break any of the present articles, or be other way injurious to any one of the other jurisdictions, such breach of agreement or injury shall be duly considered and ordered by the commissioners for the other jurisdictions, that both peace and this present confederation may be entirely preserved without violation. Footnote. Plainly in these articles no secession at will of any of the contracting parties was allowable. And footnote. Lastly, this perpetual confederation, and the several articles and agreements thereof being read and seriously considered both by the General Court for the Massachusetts and the commissioners for the other three, were subscribed presently by the commissioners, all save those of Plymouth, who, for want of sufficient commission from their General Court, deferred their subscription till the next meeting, and then they subscribed also, and were to be allowed by the General Courts of the several jurisdictions, which accordingly was done, and certified at the next meeting held at Boston. 7 September 7th, 1643. Boston, 329, footnote. The date is clear in the manuscript, but Savage believes there is reason for making it May 19th, as in the Plymouth Records, instead of 29. Three years later, 1856, the publication of Bradford's history confirmed his view. The text, with some differences, especially in the ending, may be seen in Bradford, pages 382 to 388, of the edition in the present series. Also in the Plymouth Records, Volume 9, Colonial Records of Connecticut, Volume 3, and Old South Leaflets, Number 169. In footnote, 1643. 4. June 12th. Mr. Latour arrived here in a ship of 140 tons and 140 persons. The ship came from Rochelle. The master and his company were Protestants. There were two friars and two women sent to wait upon Latour, his lady. They came in with a fair wind without any notice taken of them. They took a pilot out of one of our boats at sea and left one of their men in its place. Captain Gibbon's wife and children passed by the ship as they were going to their farm, but being discovered to Latour by one of his gentlemen who knew her, Latour manned out a shallop which he towed after him to go speak with her. She, seeing such a company of strangers making towards her, hastened to get from them and landed at the governor's garden. Latour landed presently after her, and there found the governor and his wife, and two of his sons, and his son's wife, and after mutual salutations he told the governor the cause of his coming, these, that this ship being sent him out of France, de Alny, his old enemy, had so blocked up the river to his fort at St. John's with two shops and a galliot, as a ship could not get in, whereupon he stole by in the night in a shallop, and was came to crave aid to convey him into his fort. The governor answered that he could not say anything to it till he had conferred with other of the magistrates. So after supper he went with him to Boston in Latour's boat, having sent his own boat to Boston to carry home Mrs. Gibbons. Diverse boats, having passed by him, had given notice hereof to Boston and Charlestown, his ship also arriving before Boston. The towns betook them to their arms, and three shelves with armed men came forth to meet the governor and to guard him home. But here the Lord gave us occasion to take notice of our weakness, etc. For if Latour had been ill-minded towards us, he had such an opportunity as we hope neither he nor any other shall ever have the like again. For coming by our castle and saluting it, there was none to answer him. For the last court had given order to have the castle island deserted, 
a great part of the work being fallen down, etc., so as he might have taken all the ordnance there. Then, having the governor and his family, and Captain Gibbon's wife, etc., in his power, he might have gone and spoiled Boston, and having so men, and having so many men ready, they might have taken two ships in the harbor and gone away without danger or resistance. But his neglecting this opportunity gave us assurance of his true meaning. So being landed at Boston, the governor, with a sufficient guard, brought him to his lodging at Captain Gibbon's. This gave further assurance that he intended us no evil, because he voluntarily put his person in our power. The next day the governor called together such of the magistrates as were at hand, and some of the deputies, and propounding the cost of them, and Latour being present, and the captain of a ship, etc., he showed his commission, which was fairly engrossed in parchment, under the hand and seal of the vice-admiral of France, and grand prior, etc., to bring supply to Latour, whom he styled his majesty's lieutenant journal of Lacade, and also a letter from the agent of the Company of France, to whom he hath reference, informing him of the injurious practices of D'Aulny against him, and advising him to look to himself, etc., and superscribe to him as lieutenant general, etc. Upon this it appeared to us, that being dated in April last, that notwithstanding the news which D'Aulny had sent to our governor the last year, whereby Latour was proclaimed a rebel, etc., yet he stood in good terms with the state of France, and also with the company. Whereupon, though we could not grant him aid without advice of the other commissioners of our confederacy, yet we thought it not fit nor just to hinder any that would be willing to be hired to aid him, and accordingly we answered him that we would allow him a free market, footnote, market, that he might hire any ships which lay in our harbor, etc. This answer he was very well satisfied with and took very thankfully. He also desired leave to land his men that they might refresh themselves, which was granted him, so they landed in small companies that our women, etc., might not be affrighted by them. This direction was duly observed. But the training day at Boston falling out the next week, and Latour having requested that he might be permitted to exercise his soldiers on shore, we expected him that day, so we brought forty men in their arms. They were all shot. Footnote. They were all muskets. In footnote. They were brought into the field by our train band, consisting of a hundred fifty, and in the forenoon they only beheld their men exercise. When they had dined, Latour and his officers with our officers, and his soldiers invited home by the private soldiers, in the afternoon they were permitted to exercise, our governor and others of the magistrates coming then into the field, and all ours stood and beheld them. They were very expert in all their postures and motions." When it was near night, Latour desired our governor that his men might have leave to depart, which being granted, his captain acquainted our captain therewith. So he drew our men into a march, and the French fell into the middle. When they were to depart, they gave a volley of shot and went to their boat, the French showing much admiration to see so many men of one town so well armed and disciplined, Latour professing he could not have believed it if he had not seen it. Our governor and others in the town entertained Latour and his gentlemen, with much courtesy, both in their houses and at table. Latour came duly to our church meetings, and always accompanied the governor to and from thence, who all the time of his abode here was attended with a good guard of halberts and musketeers. Those who engrossed the ships, understanding his distress, and the justice of his cause, and the magistrate's permission, were willing to be entertained by him. Footnote. The visit of Latour to Boston is a picturesque episode, at this moment, France was on the brink of becoming involved in the English Civil War. In the summer of 1643, the cause of Parliament, with which New England sympathized, was much depressed, while the King's party, most zealous in which was Queen Henrietta Maria, a French Catholic princess, seemed likely to triumph. France was on the point of taking active part with the Cavaliers. When therefore Latour suddenly appeared in the harbor of the little town in a ship well armed and manned, great caution in dealing with him was necessary. The fact that the ship's captain and part of the crew were Huguenots from the Rochelle seemed to justify a policy of forbearance, as those were on good terms with Latour. It was a portentous sight indeed when a company of French soldiers, fully armed and drilled, maneuvered on the training field. Dropping their muskets and drawing their swords, they made a rapid charge, described, Savage says, in a note attached to the manuscript, burned in 1825. The more timorous feared this might be in earnest. Latour's audacious visit was a bold bid for support from the Puritans against his rival, the Alney. He might easily have carried off the governor and burned the unprepared settlement, but his disposition was friendly, and he withdrew, leaving Boston quite dazed over the transaction. 
The controversy as to whether the heads had done wisely or foolishly is preserved in the prolix pages of labored argument, fortified pro and con by far-fetched biblical precedents, which follow the narrative of Latour's visit. In footnote. But the rumor of these things soon spreading through the country were diversely apprehended not only by the common sort but also by the elders, whereof some in their sermons spoke against their entertainment, and the aid permitted them. Others spake in justification of both. One blank, a judicious minister, hearing that leave was granted them to exercise their men in Boston, out of his fear of popish leagues and care of our safety, spake as in way of prediction that, before that day were ended, store of blood would be spilled in Boston. Diverse also wrote to the governor, laying before him great dangers, others charging sin upon the conscience in all these proceeding, so as he was forced to write and publish the true state of the cause, and the reasons of all their proceedings, which satisfied many, but not all. Also the masters and others who were to go in the ships desired advice about their proceedings, etc., whereupon the governor appointed another meeting, to which all of the near magistrates and deputies, and the elders also were called, and there the matter was debated upon these heads. First, whether it were lawful for Christians to aid idolaters, and how far we may hold communion with them. Second, whether it were safe for a state to stuff for him to have aid from us against Alni. To the first question, the arguments on the negative part were these. 1. Jehoshaphat is reproved for the like. Wouldst thou help the wicked? The answer to this was, first, this must be met only in such case as that was, not simply according to the words of that one sentence taken apart from the rest, for otherwise it would be unlawful to help any wicked man, though a professed Protestant, and though our own countryman, father, brother, etc., and that in any case, though ready to be drowned, slain, famished, etc., Jehoshaphat aided him in a brotherly league of amity and affinity. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, etc. Second, Ahab was declared a wicked man by God and denounced to destruction. Answer, Ahab was in no distress, and so needed no aid. Second, argument, Jehoshaphat joining after with Ahazia in making ships is reproved, etc. Answer, there is difference between helping a man in distress, which is a duty imposed, and joining in a course of merchandise where the action is voluntary, and it appears by this their joining that the League of Amity continued between the two kingdoms. Third, argument, Josiah stood evil in aiding the king of Babylon against Pharaoh Nebo. Third, argument, Josiah stood evil in aiding the king of Babylon against Pharaoh Necho. Answer 1. The king of Babylon was in no distress, nor did desire his help, nor is it said he intended to his aid. Second, Josiah, no doubt, did not break any known general rule, being so strict an observer of all God's commandments, for it was not lawful for him to stop Pharaoh's army from going through his country. But his sin was that either he did not believe the message of God by Pharaoh in that particular case, or did not inquire further about it from his own prophets, and so it is expressed in that story. Fourth, argument. Amaziah, king of Judah, is reproved for hiring an army out of Israel, because God was near with Israel. Answer, this is not to the question, which is of giving aid, and not of hiring aid from others, nor was Amaziah in any distress, but only sought to enlarge his dominion. Fifth, by aiding papists we advance and strengthen popery. Answer one, we are not to omit things necessary and lawful for a doubtful ill consequence, which is but accidental. Second, such aid may as well work to the weakening of popery by winning some of them to the love of the truth, as has sometimes fallen out, and sometimes by strengthening one part of them against another, they may both be the more weakened in the end. For the second question, whether it be safe, etc., the arguments on the negative part were these. First, papists are not to be trusted, seeing it as one of their tenets that they are not to keep promise with heretics. Answer, in this case we rely not upon their faith, but their interest. It being for their advantage to hold in with us, we may safely trust them. Besides, we shall not need to hazard ourselves upon their fidelity, having sufficient strength to secure ourselves. Second, we may provoke the state of France against us, or at least to Alney, and so be brought into another war. Answer. It appears by the commission and letter before mentioned that Latour stands in good terms with the state of France and the company, etc. It is usual in all states in Europe to suffer aid to be hired against their confederates without any breach of the peace, as by the states of Holland against the Spaniards, and by both out of England without any breach of the peace or offense to either. 
As for Da'alne, he hath carried himself so, as we could look for no other but ill measures from him. If he were able, though we should not permit Latour to have help from us, for he hath taken Penobscot from us with our goods to a great value. He made prize of our men and goods also at Isle Sable, and kept our men as slaves a good space, but never made satisfaction for our goods. Likewise he entertained our servants which ran from us, and refuseth to return them, being demanded. He also furnisheth the Indians about us with guns and gunpowder. And lastly he wrote last year to our governor, forbidding our vessels to pass beyond his fort in the open sea, and threatening to make prize if he should meet, etc., and if the worst should happen that can be feared, yet if our way be lawful, and we innocent from wrong, etc., we may and must trust God with our safety, so long as we serve his providence, in the use of such means as he affords us. Third, argument. Solomon tells us that he that meddleth with a strife which belongs not to him, takes a dog by the ear, which is very dangerous. Answer. This is a strife which doth belong to us, both in respect of Latour seeking aid to us in his distress, and also in respect it so much concerns us to have to Alne subdued or weakened. And if it were not wisdom in us to stop the course of providence, which offers to do that for us without our charge, which we are alike otherwise to be forced to undertake at our own charge. Fourth, it is not safe to permit this aid to go from us, especially without advice of the general court, lest it should miscarry, and so prove a dishonor and weakening to us. Answer. 1. For the general court it could not have been assembled under fourteen days, and such delay, besides the necessary charge it would put Latour unto, and ourselves also by the strong watches we are forced to keep, it might have lost the opportunity of relieving him, or it might have put him upon some dangerous design of surprising our ships, etc. Besides, if the court had been assembled, we knew they would not have given him aid without consent of the commissioners of the other colonies, and for a bare permission we might do it without the court and to have deferred this needlessly had been against that rule. Say not to thy neighbor, Go and come again, and to-morrow I will give thee, when there is power in thy hands to do it. As for the dangers of miscarriage, it is not so much as in other our voyages to Spain or England, or etc., and if the rule be safe that we walk by, the success cannot alter it. Fifth, we hear only one party, we should as well hear the other, otherwise we deal not judicially, and perhaps may aid a man in an unjust quarrel. Answer 1. We heard formerly to Alne's allegations against Latour, and notwithstanding all that, Latour his cause appears just, for they being both the subjects of the same prince, the ship coming by permission from their prince's authority, to Alne ought to permit him to enter peaceably. Second, our men that go will first offer parley with the Alne, and if Latour his cause be unjust, they are not to offend the others. Third, Latour being now in desperate distress, he is first to be succored, before the cause be further inquired unto, according to the example of Abraham, who, hearing of the distress of his kinsman Lot, stayed not till he might send to Chedilaramar to have his answer about the justice of his cause. Yet there was strong presumption that his cause was just, and that Lot and all the rest were lawful prisoners, for they had been twelve years his subjects, and were in rebellion at this time. But he stays not to inquire out the cause, the distress not permitting it, but goes personally to rescue them. As put case, an Englishman or Spaniard should be driven into our harbor by a pirate, and should come and inform us so, and desire us to let him have aid to convey him safe to sea, might we not lawfully send out aid with him, before he had sent to the pirate to understand the cause? It would be time enough to demand that when our aid came up with him. So if our neighboring Indian should send us to desire aid against some other Indians who were coming to destroy them, should we first send to the other Indians to inquire the justice of the cause? No, but we should first send to save them, and after examine the cause. The arguments on the affirmative part are many of them touched, and the former answers to the arguments on the other part. The rest are these. First, by the royal law, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If our neighbor be in distress, we ought to help him without any respect to religion or other quality, but an idolater in distress is our neighbor, as appears by that parable, Luke 10, where it is plainly concluded that the Samaritan was neighbor to the distressed traveler, and our Saviour bids the lawyer, being a Jew, to do likewise, that is, even to a Samaritan, if in distress. And by the law of relations the distressed Jew was neighbor to the Samaritan, and the Samaritan in distress should have been so to him, though as opposite in religion as Protestants and Papists. If such an one be not our neighbor, then we have no relation to him by any command of the second table, 
for that requires us to love our neighbor only, and then we may deceive, be, and otherwise damnify him, and not sin, etc. Second, argument out of Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Do good to all, but especially to the household of faith, by which it appears that under all he includes such as were not believers, and those were heathen idolaters, and if we must do good to such, we must help them in distress. Third, we are exhorted to be like our Heavenly Father in doing good to the just and unjust, that is to all, as occasion is offered, even such as he causeth the sun to shine upon, and the rain to fall upon, though excommunicated persons, blasphemers, and persecutors. Yet if they be in distress, we are to do them good, and thereby to relieve them. Fourth, we may hold some kind of communion with idolaters, as first, we may have peace with them, Second, commerce, Ezekiel 27, 17, speaking of Tyrus, who are idolaters, he saith, Judah were thy merchants in wheat, etc., and the Jews were not forbidden to trade with the heathen in Nehemiah's time, so it were not on the Sabbath. Third, in drinking and eating, and such like familiar converse, 1 Corinthians 10, if an heathen invite a Christian to his table, he might go, etc., and so he might as well invite such to his table, as Solomon did the Queen of Sheba, and the ambassadors of other princes round about him, who would not have resorted to him as they did, if he had not entertained them courteously. And he both received presents and gave presents to the queen of Sheba, and others who were then idolaters. In Nehemiah 5.17 he saith, that with the Jews there were also at his table usually such of the heathen as came to him, so that was not then, nor indeed at all by the law, unlawful for the Jews to eat with heathen, though the Pharisees made it unlawful by their traditions. The fourth and last kind of communion is succor and distress. To the second question, the arguments on the affirmative part were these, with others expressed before us in the answers. First, to only is a dangerous neighbor to us. If he have none to oppose him, or to keep him employed at home, he will certainly be dealing with us. But if Latour be not now helping, he is undone. His fort, with his wife, children, and servants, will all be taken. He hath no place to go unto. The ship cannot carry back him and all his company to France. We'll leave them on shore here, and how safe it will be for us to keep them is doubtful, but to let them go will be more dangerous, for they must then go to Daalni, and that will strengthen him greatly, both by their number, and still also by their present knowledge of our state and place, which, in regard to our own safety, lays a necessity upon us in aiding Latour, and aiding him so as he may subsist, and be able to make good his place against his enemy. Second, Latour being in urgent distress, and therefore as our neighbor to be relieved, if it be well done to us, we may trust in God and not be afraid of any terror. 1 Peter 3, 6. Third, it will be no wisdom for Daalne to begin with us, for he knows how much stronger we are than he in men and shipping, and some experience we have had hereof, and that when our friends of Plymouth hired a ship in our harbor, and thereof went and battered his house at Penobscot, yet he took no occasion thereby against us, nor ever attempted anything against them, though their trading house at Kennebec be an hindrance to him, and easy for him to take at his pleasure. There were other instances brought to the lawfulness, both in Joshua his aiding the Gibeonites, who were Canaanites, and had deluded him, and he might hereupon have left them to be spoiled by their neighbors. So when Jehoshaphat aided Jerem against Moab, for he had put away Baal, Elisha speaks honorably to him, and doth not reprove him, but for his presence sake saves the house by miracles, etc., the like rumors and fears were raised upon our first expedition against the Pequods, 1636. The governor of Plymouth wrote to Mr. Winthrop, then deputy governor, in dislike of our attempt, and in apprehension of the great danger we had incurred, that we had provoked the Pequods and no more, and had thereby occasioned a war, etc. But we found, through the Lord's special mercy, that the provocation of war proved a blessing to all the English. Our brethren of Connecticut wrote also to us, declaring their fears, and the danger we had cast them into by warring upon the Pequods, etc. And indeed we committed an error, in that we did not first give them notice of our intention, that they might take the more care of their own safety, but they could not be ignorant of our preparations. The governor by letters informed the rest of the commissioners of the United Colonies of what had passed about Latour, but the reason why he did not defer him at first for his answer, till some more of the magistrates and deputies might have been assembled, and the elders likewise consulted with, was this. Conceiving that he stood still under the same sentence of the arrest from the state of France, there would have been no need of advice in this case, for he must have given him the same answer he gave his lieutenant the last year, and upon the same ground viz. 
that however he might trade here for such commodities as he stood in need of, yet he could expect no aid from us, for it would not be fit nor safe for us to do that which might justly provoke the state of France against us. But being met, and seeing the commission from the vice admiral, etc., that occasion of danger being removed, we doubted not, but we might safely give him such answer as we did, without further trouble to the country or delay to him. See more of this, blank, leaves after. The sow business not yet being digested in the country, footnote, for the sow business, see page 64. Palfrey well describes how through this dispute over a trifling matter the bicameral feature became established in the New England legislatures, in footnote. Many of the elders being yet unsatisfied, and the more by reason of a new case stated by some of the plaintiff's side and delivered to the elders, wherein they dealt very partially, for they drew out all the evidence which made for the plaintiff, and thereby framed their conclusion without mentioning any of the defendant's evidence. This being delivered to the elders, and by them imparted to some of the other side, an answer was presently drawn which occasioned the elders to take a view of all the evidence on both parties, and a meeting being procured both of magistrates and elders, near all in the jurisdiction, and some of the deputies, the elders there declared, that notwithstanding their former opinions, yet, upon examination of all the testimonies, they found such contrariety in crossing of testimonies, as they did not see any ground for the court to proceed to judgment in the case, and therefore earnestly desired that the court might never be more troubled with it. To this all consented except Mr. Bellingham, who still maintained his former opinion, and would have the magistrates lay down their negative voice, and so the cause be heard again. This stiffness of his and singularity in opinion was very unpleasing to all the company, but they went on notwithstanding, and because the principal end of the meeting was to reconcile differences and take away offenses, which were risen between some of the magistrates by occasion of this sow business and the treaties of Mr. Saltonstall against the council, so as Mr. Bellingham and he stood divided from the rest, which occasioned much opposition even in open court, and much partaking in the country. But by the wisdom and faithfulness of the elders, Mr. Saltonstall was brought to see his failings in that treatise, which he did ingeniously acknowledge and bewail, and so was reconciled with the rest of the magistrates. They labored also to make a perfect reconciliation between the governor and Mr. Bellingham. The governor offered himself ready to it, but the other was not forward, whereby it rested in a manner as it was. Mr. Dudley also had let fall a speech in the court to Mr. Rogers of Ipswich, which was grievous to him and other of the elders. The thing was this, Mr. Rogers being earnest in a cause between the town and Mr. Bradstreet, which also concerned his own interest, Mr. Dudley used a speech to him, quote, Do you think to come with your eldership here to carry matters? End quote, etc. Mr. Dudley was somewhat hard at first to be brought to see any evil in it, but at last he was convinced and did acknowledge it, and they were reconciled. The deputies also, who were present at this meeting and had voted for the plaintiff in the case of the sow, seemed now to be satisfied, and the elders agreed to deal with the deputies of their several towns, to the end that the cause might never trouble the court more. But all this notwithstanding, the plaintiff, or rather one G. Story, her solicitor, being of an unsatisfied spirit and animated, or at least too much countenanced by some of the court, preferred a petition at the court of elections for a new hearing. And this being referred to the committee for petitions, it was returned that the greater part of them did conceive the cause should be heard again, and some others in the court declared themselves of the same judgment, which caused others to be much grieved to see such a spirit of godly men, that neither the judgment of near all the magistrates, nor the concurrence of the elders in their mediation, nor the loss of time and charge, nor the settling of peace in court and country could prevail with them to let such a cause fall, as in ordinary course of justice it might, as nothing could be found in, by any one testimony, to be of criminal nature, nor could the matter of the suit, with all damages, have amounted to forty shillings. But two things appeared to carry men on in this course, as it were in captivity. One was, the deputies stood only upon this, that their towns were not satisfied in the cause, which, by the way, shows plainly the democratical spirit which acts our deputies, etc. The other was, the desire of the name of victory, whereas on the other side the magistrates, etc., were content for peace's sake, and upon the elders' advice to decline that advantage, and to let the cause fall for want of advice to sway it either way. Now that which made the people so unsatisfied and unwilling the cause should rest as it stood, 
was the 20 pounds which the defendant had recovered against the plaintiff in an action of slander for saying he had stolen the sow, etc., and many of them could not distinguish this from the principal cause, as she had been adjudged to pay 20 pounds for demanding her sow, and yet the defendant never took of this more than 3 pounds for his charges of witnesses, etc., and offered to remit the whole if she would have acknowledged the wrong she had done him. But being accounted a rich man and she a poor woman, this was so wrought with the people as being blinded with unreasonable compassion, they could not see or not allow justice her reasonable course. This being found out by some of the court, a motion was made that some who had interest in the defendant would undertake to persuade him to restore the plaintiff the three pounds, or whatever it were, he took upon that judgment, and likewise to refer other matters to reference which were between the said story and him. This the court were satisfied with, and proceeded no further. There was yet one offense for which the elders desired might also be removed, and for that end some of them moved the governor in it, and he easily consented to them so far as they had convinced him of his failing therein. The matter was this. The governor had published a writing about the case of the sow, as is herein before declared, wherein some passages gave offense, as he being willing to remove. So soon as he came into the general court, he spake as followeth. His speech is set down verbatim to prevent misrepresentation, as if he had retracted what he had wrote in the point of the case. I understand diverse have taken offense at a writing I set forth about the sow business. I desire to remove it and to begin my year in a reconciled estate withal. The writing is of two parts, the matter and the manner. In the former I had the concurrence of others of my brethren, both magistrates and deputies, but for the other viz the manner, that was wholly mine own, and so as whatsoever was blameworthy in it, I must take it to myself. The matter is point of judgment, which is not at my own disposing. I have examined it over and again, by such light as Scoth hath afforded me from the rules of religion, reason, and common practice, and truly I can find no ground to retract anything in that. Therefore I desire I may enjoy my liberty herein, as every of yourselves do, and justly may. But for the manner, whatsoever I might allege from my justification before men, I now pass it over, and now set myself before another judgment seat. I will first speak to the manner in general, and then to two particulars. For the general, howsoever that which I wrote was upon great provocation by some of the adverse party, and upon invitation from others to vindicate themselves from that aspersion which was cast upon us, yet there was no sufficient warrant for me to break out into any distemper. I confess I was too prodigal of my brethren's reputation. I might have obtained the cause I had in hand without casting such blemish upon others as it did. For the particulars, one, for the conclusion, viz. now let religion and sound judgment give judgment to the case, whereby I might seem to conclude the other side to be void both of religion and reason. It is true a man may, as the case may be, appeal to the judgment of religion and reason, but, as I there carried it, I did arrogate too much to myself and ascribe too little to others. The other particular was the profession I made of maintaining what I wrote before all the world, which, though it may modestly be professed, as the case may require, yet I confess it was now not so beseeming me, but was indeed a fruit of the pride of mine own spirit. These are all the Lord hath brought me to consider of, wherein I acknowledge my failings, and humbly entreat you will pardon and pass them by. If you please to accept my request, your silence shall be a sufficient testimony thereof unto me, and I hope I shall be more wise and watchful hereafter. The sow business had started another question about the magistrate's negative vote in the general court. The deputies generally were very earnest to have it taken away, whereupon one of the magistrates wrote a small treatise, wherein he laid down the original of it from the patent, and the establishing of it by the order of the general court in 1634, showing thereby how it was fundamental to our government, which, if it were taken away, it would be a mere democracy. He showed also the necessity and usefulness of it by many arguments from scripture, reason, and common practice, etc. Yet this would not satisfy, but the deputies and common people would have it taken away, and yet it was apparent, as some of the deputies themselves confessed, that most did not understand it. An answer also was written, by one of the magistrates as was conceived, to the said treatise, undertaking to avoid all the arguments both from the patent and from the order, etc. This the deputies made great use of in the court, supposing they had now enough to carry the cause clearly with them, so as they pressed earnestly to have it presently determined. But the magistrates told them the matter was of great concernment, even to the very frame of our government. It had been established upon serious consultation and consent of all the elders. It had been continued without any inconvenience or apparent mischief these fourteen years, 
Therefore it would not be safe nor of good report to alter on such a sudden, and without the advice of the elders. Offering withal, that upon such advice and consideration it should appear to be inconvenient, or not warranted by the patent and the said order, etc., they should be ready to join with them in taking it away. Upon these propositions they were stilled, and so an order was drawn up to this effect, that it was desired that every member of the court would take advice, etc., and that it should be no offense for any, either publicly or privately, to declare their opinion in the case, so it were modestly, etc., and that the elders should be desired to give their advice before the next meeting of this court. It was the magistrates' only care to gain time, that so the people's heat might be abated, for then they knew they would hear reason, and that the advice of the elders might be interposed, and that there might be liberty to reply to the answer, which was very long and tedious, which accordingly was done soon after the court, and published to good satisfaction. One of the elders also wrote a small treatise, wherein scholastically and religiously he handled the question, laying down the several forms of government, both simple and mixed, and the true form of our government, and the unavoidable change into a democracy if the negative voice were taken away, and answered all objections, and so concluded for the continuance of it, so as the deputies and the people also, having their heat moderated by time, and their judgments better informed by what they had learned about it, let the cause fall, and he who had written the answer to the first offense appeared no further in it. End of section 16. Section 17 of History of New England, 1630 to 1649. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of New England, 1630 to 1649 by John Winthrop. Section 17, 1643, Part 2. Our supplies from England failing much, men began to look about them and fell to a manufacture of cotton, whereof we had store from Barbados, and of hemp and flax, wherein Rowley, to their great commendation, exceeded all other towns. The governor acquainted the court with a letter he received from Mr. Wheelwright, to entreat the favor of the court that he might have leave to come into the bay upon a special occasions, which was readily granted him for fourteen days, whereupon he came and spake with the verse of the elders, and gave them such satisfaction as they intended to intercede with the court for the release of his banishment. Seymour, 344, footnote, i.e. under May, 1644, in footnote. Sacco, Ninoco, and Pumham, two sachems near Providence, having under them between two and three hundred men, finding themselves overborne by Biantunema, the sachem of Narangaset and Gorton and his company, who had so prevailed with Biantunema, as he forced one of them to join with him in setting his hand or mark to a writing, whereby a part of his land was sold to Gorton and his company, for which Miantunema received a price, but the other would not receive that which was for his part, alleging that he did not intend to sell his land, though through fear of Miantunema he had put his mark to the writing, they came to our governor, and by Benedict Arnold, footnote, Benedict Arnold, long a trusted and useful man, especially helpful for his knowledge of Indian tongues and his faculty for dealing with the tribes, afterward eleven times governor of Rhode Island, the area described in the deed of January 12, 1642-1643, was about equivalent to that of the present townships of Warwick and Coventry, R.I., in footnote. Their interpreter did desire we would receive them under our government, and brought withal a small present of wampum about ten fathom. The governor gave them encouragement, but referred them to the court, and received their present, intending to return it them again, if the court could not accord to them but at the present he acquainted another of the magistrates with it. So it was agreed, and they wrote to Gorton and his company to let them know what the sachems had complained of, and how they had tendered themselves to come under our jurisdiction, and therefore if they had anything to allege against it, they should come or send to our next court. We sent also to Miantunema to signify the same to him. Whereupon, in the beginning of the court, Miantunema came to Boston, and being demanded an open court, before diverse of his own men and Kutchemekin and other Indians, whether he had any interest in the said two sachems as his subjects, he could prove none. Guchamican also in his presence affirmed that he had no interest in them, but they were as free sachems as himself. Only because he was a great sachem, they had sometimes sent him presents, and aided him in his war against the Quats. And Benedict Arnold affirmed, partly upon his own knowledge, and partly upon the relation of diverse Indians of those parts, that the Indians belonging to these sachems did usually pay their deerskins, or charge tribute belonging to the chief sachem, 
always to them, and never to Miantenema, or any other sachem of Narangnesep, which Miantenema could not contradict. Whereupon it was referred to the governor and some other of the magistrates and deputies to send for the two sachems after the court, and to treat with them about their receiving into us. But before this, Gorton and his company, twelve in number, sent a writing to our court of four sheets of paper, full of reproaches against our magistrates, elders, and churches, of familistical and absurd opinions, and therein they justified their purchase of the sachem's land, and professed to maintain it to the death. They sent us word also after, as Benedict Arnold reported to us, that if we sent men against them, they were ready to meet us, being assured of victory from God, etc., Whereupon the court sent two of the deputies to speak with them, to see whether they would own that writing which was subscribed by them all. Whereupon the court sent two of the deputies to speak with them, to see whether they would own that writing which was subscribed by them all. When they came, they with much difficulty came to find out Gorton and two or three more of them, and upon conference they did own and justify the said writing. They spake also with the two sachems, as they had commission, and giving them to understand upon what terms they must be received under us. They found them very pliable to all, and opening to them the Ten Commandments, they received this answer, which I have set down as the commissioners took it in writing from their mouths. 1. Question. Whether they would worship the true God that made heaven and earth, and not blaspheme him? Answer we. We desire to speak reverently of Englishmen's God, and not to speak evil of him, because we see that Englishmen's God doth better for them than other gods do for others. 2. That they should not swear falsely. Answer. We never knew what swearing or an oath was. Third, not to do any unnecessary work on the Lord's day within the gates of proper towns. Answer, it is a small thing for us to rest on that day, for we have not much to do any day, and therefore we will forbear on that day. Fourth, to honor their parents and superiors. Answer, it is our custom so to do, for inferiors to be subject to superiors, for if we complain to the governor of the Massachusetts that we have wrong, if they tell us we lie, we shall willingly bear it. Fifth, not to kill any man, but upon just cause and just authority. Answer, it is good, and we desire so to do. Six, seven, not to commit fornication, adultery, bestiality, etc. Answer, though fornication and adultery be committed among us, yet we allow it not, but judge it evil, so the same we judge of stealing. Eighth, for lying they say it is an evil, and shall not allow it. Ninth, whether you will suffer your children to read God's word, that they may have knowledge of the true God, and to worship him in his own way. Answer. As opportunity serveth by the English coming amongst us, we desire to learn their manners. After the court, the governor, etc., sent for them, and they came to Boston at the day appointed, viz. the 22nd of the 4th month, June, and a form of submission being drawn up, and they being by Benedict Arnold, their neighbor and interpreter, who spake their language readily, made to understand every particular, in the presence of diverse of the elders and many others, they freely subscribed their submission, as it here followeth verbatim. Being told that we did not receive them in as confederates, but as subjects, they answered, that they were so little in respect of us as they could expect no other. So they dined in the same room with the governor, but at a table by themselves, and having much countenance showed them all by present, and being told that they and their men should be always welcome to the English, provided they brought a note from Benedict Arnold, that we might know them from other Indians, and having some small things bestowed upon them by the governor, they departed joyful and well satisfied. We looked at it as a fruit of our prayers, and the first fruit of our hopes, that the example would bring in others, and that the Lord was by this means making a way to bring them to civility, and so to conversion to the knowledge and embracing of the gospel in his due time. Soon after their departure, we took order that me and Tenema and the English in those parts should have notice of their submission to us, that they might refrain from doing them injury. Their submission was as followeth. This writing is to testify that we, Pumham, Sachem of Shawamach, and Sakanonico, Sachem of Patuxet, etc., have and by these presents do, voluntarily and without any constrained persuasion, but of our own free motion, put ourselves, our subjects, lands and estates under the government and jurisdiction of the Massachusetts, to be governed and protected by them, according to their just laws and orders, so far as we shall be made capable of understanding them, and we do promise for ourselves and our subjects and all our posterity to be true and faithful to the said government, in aiding to the maintenance thereof to our best ability, and from time to time to give speedy notice of any conspiracy attempt or evil intention of any which we shall know or hear of against the same, and we do promise to be willing from time to time to be instructed in the knowledge and worship of God, in witness thereof, etc. Footnote. These Indian lands at Shawomet and Patuxet lay south of Providence and were very much beyond the bounds of the Massachusetts Charter. 
We have here an unusual detail, a specimen of the Massachusetts treatment of the Indians. In footnote. The Lady Moody, a wise and anciently religious woman, being taken with the air of denying baptism to infants, was dealt with all by many of the elders and others, and admonished by the Church of Salem, whereof she was a member. But persisting she still, and to avoid further trouble, etc., she removed to the Dutch against the advice of all her friends. Many others, infected with Anabaptism, removed thither also. She was after excommunicated. Footnote. The Lady Deborah Moody, a person highly connected, occupied for a time the estate at Sagas once owned by Humphrey. She acquired influence in the parts to which she immigrated and rendered help to Peter Stuyvesant. In footnote. 5. July 5th. There arose a sudden gust at northwest so violent for half an hour as it blew down multitudes of trees. It lifted up their meeting house at Newbury, the people being in it. It darkened the air with dust, yet through God's great mercy it did no hurt, but killed only one Indian with the fall of a tree. It was straight between Lynn and Hampton. Second, here arrived one Mr. Carmen, master of the ship called Blank of 80 tons. He went from New Haven and Timber, December last, laden with clapboards for the Canaries, being earnestly commended to the Lord's protection by the church there. At the island of Palma, he was set upon by a Turkish pirate of 300 tons and 26 pieces of ordnance and 200 men. He fought with her three hours, having but twenty men and but seven pieces of ordnance that he could use, and his muskets were unserviceable with rust. The Turk lay across his hoss, so he was forced to shoot through his own hoodings, and by these shot killed many Turks. Then the Turk lay by his side and boarded him with near a hundred men, and cut all his ropes, etc., but his shot having killed the captain of the Turkish ship and broken his tiller, the Turk took in his own ensign and fell off from him, but in such haste as he left about fifty of his men aboard him. Then the master and some of his men came up and fought with those fifty hand to hand, and slew so many of them as the rest leaped overboard. The master had many wounds on his head and body, and diverse of his men were wounded, yet but one slain. So with much difficulty he got to the island, being in view thereof, where he was very courteously entertained and supplied with whatsoever he wanted. Continuation about Latour the governor, with the advice of some of the magistrates and elders, wrote a letter to D'Alny, taking occasion in answer to his letter in Nineber, November, at last to this effect, viz. Whereas he found by the arrest he sent last autumn that Latour was under displeasure and censure in France, thereupon we intended to have no further to do with him than by way of commerce which is allowed. And if he had made prize of any of our vessels in that way, as he threatened, we should have righted ourselves so well as we could without injury to himself or just offense to his majesty of France, whom we did honor as a great and mighty prince, and should endeavor always to behave ourselves towards his majesty, and all his subjects as became us, etc. But Latour coming now to us, and acquainting us how it was with him, etc., and here mentioning the vice-admiral's commission and the letters, etc., though we thought not fit to give him aid, as being unwilling to intermeddle in the wars of any of our neighbors, yet considering his urgent distress, we could not in Christianity or humanity deny him liberty to hire for his money any ships in our harbor, either such as came to us out of England or others. And whereas some of our people were willing to go along with him, though without any commission from us, we had charged them to labor by all means to bring matters to a reconciliation, etc., that they should be assured that if they should do or attempt anything against the rules of justice and good neighborhood, they must be accountable, therefore, unto us at their return. Footnote. Savage thinks the inexpedient and calamitous policy of Winthrop as regards Latour referable to pressure brought to bear upon him by the Boston merchants who saw a chance to make money out of Frenchmen. In footnote. Beside the former arguments, there came sense to Boston one Mr. Hook, a godly gentleman and a deputy of the court for Salisbury, who related of the good usage and great courtesy which Latour had showed to himself and other passengers, who were landed as a fort about nine years since as they came from England, and how the ship leaving them there, and only a small shallop to bring them to these parts, and a dangerous bay of twelve leagues to be passed over, he would not suffer them to depart before he had provided his own pinnace to transport them. And whereas he was charged to have killed two Englishmen at Machias not far from his fort, and to have taken away their goods to the value of five hundred pounds, Mr. Vines of Sacco, who was part owner of the goods and principal trader, etc., being present with Latour, the governor heard the cause between them, which was thus. Mr. Vines being in a pinnace trading in those parts, Latour met him in another pinnace, and bought so many of his commodities as Mr. Vines received then of him four hundred skins, and although some of Mr. Vines, his company, had abused Latour, whereupon he had made them prisoners in his pinnace, 
Yet at Mr. Vine's entreaty he discharged them with grave and good counsel, and acquainted Mr. Vine's with his commission to make prize of all such as should come to trade in those parts, and thereupon desired him peaceably to forbear, etc. Yet at his request he gave him leave to trade the goods he had left in his way home, so as he did not fortify or build in any place within his commission, which he said he could not answer it if he should suffer it, whereupon they parted friendly. Mr. Vines landed his goods at Machias, and there set up a small wigwam, and left five men and two murderers, footnote, murderers were small cannon, in footnote, to defend it, and a shallop, and so returned home. Two days after Latour comes, and casting anchor before the place, one of Mr. Vines' men came on board his pinnace, and while they were in parley, four of Latour his men went on shore. One of the four which were in the house, seeing them, gave fire to a murderer, but at not taking fire, he called to his fellow to give fire to the other murderer, which he was going to do. The four French retreated, and one of their muskets went off. Latour saith it was by accident, and that the shot went through one of his fellow's clothes, but Mr. Vines could say nothing to that. It killed two of the men on shore, which Latour then professed himself innocent of and very sorry for, and said further that the five men were at that time all drunk, and not unlikely having store of wine and strong water, for had they been sober, they would not have given fire upon such as they had conversed friendly with but two days before, without one spitting them stand or asking them wherefore they came. After this, Latour coming to the house and finding some of his own goods, though of no great value, which had a little before been taken out of his fort at St. John's by the Scotch and some English of Virginia, when they plundered all his goods to a great value and abused his men, he seized the three men and the goods and sent them into France according to his commission, where the men were discharged with the goods adjudged lawful prize. Mr. Vines did not contradict any of this, but only that he did not build or fortify at Machias, but only set up a shelter for his men and goods. For the value of the goods, Mr. Vines showed an invoice which came to three or four hundred pounds, but Latour said he had another under the men's hands that were there, which came not to half so much. In conclusion, he promised he would refer the class to judgment, and if it should be found that he had done them wrong, he would make satisfaction. 5. July 14th. In the evening, Latour took ship, the governor and diverse of the chief of the town accompanying him to his boat. There went with him four of our ships and a pinnace. He hired them for two months, the chiefest, which had sixteen pieces of ordnance at two hundred pounds a month. Yet she was of but a hundred tons, but very well manned and fitted for fight, and the rest proportionable. The owners took only his own security for their pay. He entertained also about seventy land soldiers, volunteers, at forty shillings per month a man, but he paid them somewhat in hand. Of the two friars which came in the ship, the one was a very learned, acute man. Diverse of our elders who had conference with him reported so of him. They came not into the town, lest they should give offense, but once, being brought by some to see Mr. Cotton and confer with him, and when they came to depart, the chief came to take leave of the governor and the two elders of Boston, and showed himself very thankful for the courtesy they found among us. In the afternoon they set sail from Long Island, the wind north and west, and went out at Broad Sound at half flood, where no ships of such burthen have gone out before, or not more than one. Three heirs, the governor, etc., committed in managing this business. First, in giving Latour an answer so suddenly, the very next day after his arrival. Second, in not advising with any of the elders as their manner was in matters of less consequence. Third, in not calling upon God as they were wont to do in all public affairs before they fell to consultation, etc. The occasions of these errors were first their earnest desire to dispatch him away, and conceiving at first that they should have given him the same answer they gave his lieutenant the last year, for they had not then seen the vice-admiral's commission. Second, not then conceiving any need of counsel, the elders never came into the governor's thoughts. Third, Latour and many of the French coming into them at first meeting, and some taking occasion to fall in parley with them, there did not appear then a fit opportunity for so solemn an action as calling upon God, being in the midst of their business before they were aware of it. But this fault hath been many times found in the governor to be over sudden in his resolutions. For although the course were both warrantable and safe, yet it had beseemed men of wisdom and gravity to have proceeded with more deliberation and further advice. Those about Ipswich, etc., took great offense at these proceedings, so as three of the magistrates and the elders of Ipswich and Raleigh, with Mr. Nathaniel Ward, wrote a letter to the governor in assistance in the bay, and to the elders here, protesting against the proceedings, and that they would be innocent of all the evil which might ensue, etc., with diverse arguments against it, whereof some were weighty, but not to the matter, for they supposed we had engaged the country in a war, as if we had permitted our ships, etc., 
to fight with the Alni, whereas we only permitted them to be hired by Latour to conduct him home. The governor made answer to this protestation, so did Mr. Dudley and the pastor of Boston. Footnote. The papers in the controversy are preserved in Hutchinson, Collection of Papers, 115 to 134, pages 129 to 149 of the Prince Society edition, in footnote. 5th July. Letters came to our governor from Mr. Haynes, governor at Hartford, certifying of a war begun between Ancus, Sachem of Mohegan, and Sequassen, Sachem upon Connecticut, and that upon Ancus's complaint of the others assaulting him, etc., he sent for Sequassen and endeavored to make them friends, but Sequassen chose rather to have war, so they were forced to leave them to themselves, promising to be aiding to neither, etc. Soon after, Ancus set upon Sequassen and killed seven or eight of his men, wounded thirteen, burned his wigwams, and carried away the booty. Upon this, Miantenema, being allied to Sequassen, sent to Mr. Haynes to complain of Ancus. He answered that the English had no hand in it, nor would encourage them, etc. Miantenema gave notice hereof also to our governor by two of our neighbor Indians who had been with him, and he was very desirous to know if we would not be offended if he made war upon Ancus. Our governor answered, if Ancus had done him or his friends wrong and would not give satisfaction, we should leave him to take his own course. 5th July 22nd. A Dutch sloop arrived with letters in Latin, signed by the secretary there in the name and by the command of the governor and senate, directed to the governor and senate of U.P., footnote, United Providences, in footnote, of New England, wherein first he congratulates our late confederation, then he complains of unsurfable wrongs done to their people upon Connecticut, more of late than formerly, and of misinformation given by some of ours to the state's ambassador in London, and desire to know by a categorical answer whether we will aid or desert them, meaning of Hartford, that so they may know their friends from their enemies, etc. The governor appointed a meeting of some of the next magistrates on the second day next, but the rain hindered some of them. It was put off to the fifth day. Here arrived a bark of the Earl of Warwick from Trinidad. She came for people and provisions, but our people, being well informed of the state of those places, were now become wiser and could stay here where they were in better condition than they could be in those parts. So he altered his design and went toward Canada, and by the way guarded home a pinnace of Latours which came hither for provisions. The wife of one blank hat, of whom mention was made before, being cast out of the church of Boston, the Lord was pleased so to honor his own ordinance, that whereas before no means could prevail with her either to reclaim her from her wicked and blasphemous courses and speeches, etc., or to bring her to frequent the means, within a few weeks after her casting out she came to see her sin and lay it to heart, and to frequent the means, and so was brought to such manifestation of repentance and a sound mind as the church received her in again. The day appointed for considering of the letter from the Dutch proved again so wet as but few met, and of those some would have another day appointed, and all the magistrates to be called to it. But others thought it not fit, both in regard the messenger hasted away, and also for that no direct answer could be returned without a general court. At length advising with some of the elders who were at hand, and some of the deputies, a returned answer to this effect, in the name of the governor only, viz. After gratulation, etc., of their friendly respect, and our earnest desire of the continuance of that good correspondency, which hath been between themselves and us ever since our arrival in these parts, that our chief counsel, to whom their letters were directed, being far dispersed, etc., he was necessitated, with the advice of some other of the magistrates, to return this answer to them for the present, being rather a declaration of our own conceptions than the determination of our chiefest authority, from which they should receive further answer in time convenient. We declared our grief for the difference between them and our brethren of Hartford, which we conceive might be composed by arbiters, either in England or Holland or here, that by our confederation we were bound to seek the good and safety of each other as our own, which we hoped would not hinder the continuance of that amity and correspondency between themselves and us, and that the ground of their difference, being only for a small parcel of land, was a matter of so little value in this vast continent, as was not worthy to cause a breach between two people so nearly related both in profession of the same Protestant religion and otherwise. Therefore we would seriously request them, as we would do also the others, that until the justice of the cause were decided by one of the ways before named, there might be abstinence on both sides from injury and provocation, and if any should happen on their part, that it might be duly examined, and we were assured, they being a people fearing God, they durst not allow themselves in any unrighteous course, they should receive equal satisfaction. See more page blank. 
We received news of a great defeat given the Narangaskets by Ankets, and of fifteen Dutch slain by the Indians, and much beaver taken, and of Mr. Lamberton, etc. 6. August. Ankes, being provoked by Sequassen, a sachem of Connecticut, who would not be persuaded by the magistrates there to a reconciliation, made war upon him, and slew diverse of his men and burnt his wigwams, whereupon Miantenema, being his kinsman, took offense against Ancus, and went with near a thousand men and set upon Ancus before he could be provided for defense, for he had not then with him above three or four hundred men. But it pleased God to give Ancus the victory, after he had killed about thirty of the Narangnesets and wounded many more, and among these two of Canonicus' sons and a brother of Miantenema, who fled. But having on a coat of mail, he was evilly overtaken, which two of his captains perceiving, they laid hold on him and carried him to Ancus, thereby hoping to procure their own pardon. But so soon as they came to Ancus, he slew them presently. And Miantenema standing mute, he demanded of him why he would not speak. If you had taken me, saith he, I would have besought you for my life. The news of Miantenema's captivity coming to Providence, Gorton and his company, who had bought of him the lands belonging to the sachems who were come under our jurisdiction, wrote a letter to Ancus, willing him to deliver their friend Miantenema, and threatened him with the power of the English if he refused, and they sent their letter in the name of the governor of Massachusetts. Upon this, Ancus carries Miantenema to Hartford to take advice of the magistrates there, and at Miantenema's earnest entreaty he left for him with them, yet as a prisoner. They kept him under guard, but used him very courteously, and so he continued till the commissioners of the United Colonies met at Boston, who, taking into serious consideration what was safest and best to be done, were all of opinion that it would not be safe to set him at liberty, neither had we sufficient ground for us to put him to death. In this difficulty we called in five of the most judicious elders, it being in the time of the General Assembly of the Elders, and propounding the case to them, they all agreed that he ought to be put to death. Upon this concurrence we enjoined secrecy to ourselves and them, lest if it should come to the notice of the Narangnesets they might set upon the commissioners, etc., in their return, to take some of them to redeem him, as Miantenema himself had told Mr. Haynes had been in consultation amongst them, and agreed that, upon the return of the commissioners to Hartford, they should send for Ancus and tell him our determination, that Miantenema should be delivered to him again, and he should put him to death as soon as he came within his own jurisdiction, and that two English should go along with him to see the execution, and that if any Indians should invade him for it, we would send men to defend him. If Ancus should refuse to do it, then Miantenema should be sent in a penance to Boston, there to be kept until further consideration. The reasons of this proceeding with him were these. First, it was now clearly discovered to us that there was a general conspiracy among the Indians to cut off all the English, and that Miantenema was the head and contriver of it. Second, he was of a turbulent and proud spirit, and would never be at rest. Third, although he had promised us in the open court to send the Bequad to Ancus, who had shot him in the arm with intent to have killed him, which was by the procurement of Miantenema as it did probably appear, yet in his way homeward he killed him. Fourth, he beat one of Pumham's men and took away his wampum, and then bid him go and complain to the Massachusetts. According to this agreement, the commissioners, at the return to Connecticut, sent for Ancus, and acquainted him therewith, who readily undertook the execution, and taking me and Tenema along with him, in the way between Hartford and Windsor, where Ancus hath some men dwell, Ancus's brother, following after me and Tenema, clave his head with a hatchet, some English being present. And that the Indians might know that the English did approve of it, they sent twelve or fourteen musketeers home with Ancus, to abide a time with him for his defense, if need should be. Footnote. The conduct of Massachusetts toward Miantenema seems to students in general ungrateful and cruel. No Indian character of that time is more dignified and engaging. The most powerful of New England chieftains, he was friendly to the newcomers. He resisted the Pequot blandishments in 1636, which saved the colonies from destruction. His treatment of Providence, Rhode Island, in particular, had been kind. Possibly Massachusetts was influenced by his kindness to the outcast Gorton, but no sufficient reason appears why he should have been given over to death. Still, there may have been undercurrents of treachery, and we must not forget that the English hold was then very precarious and remained so until after Philip's war. In footnote. Month 6, August. About the 20th of this month, the ships which went with Latour came back safe, not one person missing or sick. But the report of their actions was offensive and grievous to us, for when they drew near to Latour's place, to Alney, having discovered them, set sail with his vessels, being two ships and a pinnace, and stood right home to Port Royal. 
Ours pursued them, but could not fetch them up, but they ran their ships on ground in the harbor and began to fortify themselves. Whereupon ours sent a boat to Daalni with the governor's letter and a letter from Captain Hawkins, who by agreement among themselves was commander-in-chief. The messenger who carried the letters, being one who could speak French well, was carried blindfolded into the house, and there kept six or seven hours, and all the Alni's company applied for their fortifying with palisados, and the friars as busy as any, and encouraging the women, who cried pitifully, telling them that we were infidels and heretics. De Alni would not open Latour's letter, because he did not style him lieutenant general, etc., but he returned answer to the governor and to Captain Hawkins, and sent him a copy of the arrest against Latour, and showed the original to the messenger, but refused to come to any terms of peace. Upon this Latour urged much to have our men to assault him, but they refused. Then he desired that some of ours might be land with his to do some mischief to Alni. Captain Hawkins would send none, but he gave leave to any that would go. Whereupon some thirty of ours went with Latour's men, and were encountered by Alni's men, who had fortified themselves by his mill, were beaten out with loss of three of their men, and none slain on our side nor wounded. Only three of Latour's men were wounded." So they set the mill on fire and burnt some standing corn, and retired to their ships with one prisoner whom they took in the mill. Denali shot with his ordnance at their boats as they went aboard, but missed them, nor did our ships make one shot at him again, but set sail and went to Latour's fort. While they lay there, Denali's pinnace came, supposing he and his ships had still been there, and brought in her four hundred moose skins and four hundred beaver skins. These they took without any resistance and divided them. One third Latour had in the pinnace, one third to the ships, and the other to the men. So they continued there till their time was near expired, and were paid their hire and returned, one ship coming a good time before the other, and the pinnace went up John's River some twenty leads, and loaded with coal. They brought a piece of white marble, whereof there is great shore near his fort, which makes very good lime. Footnote. The English thus became much further involved in the quarrel between the Frenchmen than was intended. In footnote. Month 7, September. The Indians near the Dutch, having killed fifteen men, as is before related, proceeded on and began to set upon the English who dwelt under the Dutch. They came to Mrs. Hutchinson's in way of friendly neighborhood, as they had been accustomed, and taking their opportunity, killed her and Mr. Collins, her son-in-law, who had been kept prisoner in Boston, as is before related, and all her family, and such of Mr. Throckmorton's and Mr. Cornhill's families as were at home, and all sixteen, and put their cattle into their houses, and there burnt them. But by a good providence of God, there was a boat came in at the same instant, to which some women and children fled, and so were saved. But two of the boatmen going up to the houses were shot and killed. Footnote. Here ends a painful tragedy of Anne Hutchinson's life. The location was a point now known as Pelham Neck, near New Rochelle, New York. It is still marked by the local nomenclature, for although the name of Anne's Huck has disappeared, Hutchinson Creek still perpetuates her memory. In footnote. These people had cast off ordinances and churches, and now at last their own people, and for larger accommodation had subjected themselves to the Dutch and dwelt scatteringly near a mile asunder, and some that escaped, who had removed only for want, as they said, of hay for their cattle, which increased much. Now coming back again to Aquaday, they wanted cattle for their grass. These Indians having killed and driven away all the English upon the main as far as Stamford, for so far had the Dutch gained possession by the English, they passed on to Long Island and there assaulted the Lady Moody in her house diverse times, for there were forty men gathered thither to defend it. These Indians at the same time set upon the Dutch with an implacable fury, and killed all they could come by, and burnt their houses and killed their cattle without any resistance, so as the governor and such as escaped betook themselves to their fort at Manhattan, and there lived and eat up their cattle. Fourth, there was an assembly at Cambridge of all the elders in the country, about fifty in all, such of the ruling elders as would were present also, but none else. They sat in the college and had their diet there after the manners of scholars' commons, but somewhat better, yet so ordered as it came not to above sixpence the meal for a person. Mr. Cotton and Mr. Hooker were chosen moderators. The principal occasion was because some of the elders were about to set up some things according to the presbytery as of Newbury, etc. The assembly concluded against some parts of the presbyterial way, and the Newbury ministers took time to consider the arguments, etc. Footnote. An echo of the dispute between Presbyterianism and the rising independency, which in England had now become acute. In footnote. Upon the complaint of the English of 
Patuxet near Providence, who had submitted to our jurisdiction, and the two Indian sachems there, of the continual injuries offered them by Gorton and his company, the general court sent for them, by letter only, not in way of command, to come answer the complaints, and sent them letters of safe conduct. But they answered our messengers disdainfully, refused to come, but sent two letters full of blasphemy against the churches and magistracy, and other provoking terms, slighting all we could do against them. So that, having sent three times, and receiving no other answer, we took testimonies against them, both of English and Indians, and determined to proceed with them by force. And because they had told our messengers the last time that if we had anything to say to them, if we would come to them, they would do us justice therein, therefore I wrote to them, to this effect, viz. To the end that our justice and moderation might appear to all men, we would condescend so far to them as to send commissioners to hear their answers and allegations, and if thereupon they would give us such satisfaction as should be just, we would leave them in peace. If otherwise, we would proceed by force of arms, and signified withal that we would send a sufficient guard with our commissioners. For seeing they would not trust themselves with us upon our safe conduct, we had no reason to trust ourselves with them upon their bare courtesy. And accordingly we sent the next week Captain George Cook, Lieutenant Atherton, and Edward Johnson, footnote, Cook returning to England became a colonel in Cromwell's army. Atherton at a later time became major general of the colonial forces, and while holding that position was killed by a fall from his horse in 1665. Johnson was the author of the Wonderworking Providence, in footnote. With commission and instructions, the instructions would here be inserted at large, and with them forty soldiers. They came to Providence, and by the way received another letter from Gorton, of the light contents with the former, and told them plainly they were prepared for them, etc. Being come near, they found they had put themselves all into one house, which they had made musket-proof with two flankers. But by the mediation of others of Providence, they came to parley, and then offered to refer their cause to arbitrators, alleging that we were parties, and so not equal judges, so as some of them might be of Providence or of Aquide, and offered their cattle for security to abide the order, etc. Our commissioners, through importunity of themselves and others of Providence, were content to send to us to know our minds about it. The letter came to us when a committee, appointed by the general court, were met about the tidings of me and Tenema's death. So calling in to us five or six of the elders who were near at hand, we considered of the motion, and agreed that it was neither seasonable nor reasonable, neither safe nor honorable for us to accept such a proposition. First, because they would never offer us any terms of peace before we had sent our soldiers. Second, because the ground of it was false, for we were not parties in the case between the Indians and them, but the proper judges, they being all within our jurisdiction by the Indians and English their own grant. Third, they were no state, but a few fugitives living without law or government, and so not honorable for us to join with them in such a course. Fourth, the parties whom they would refer it unto were such as were rejected by us, and all the governments in the country, and besides, not men likely to be equal to us or able to judge of the cause. Fifth, their blasphemous and reviling writings, etc., were not matters fit to be compounded by arbitrament, but to be purged away only by repentance and public satisfaction, or else by public punishment. And lastly, the commission and instructions being given them by the general court, it was not in our power to alter them, so accordingly we wrote to our commissioners to proceed, which accordingly they did, and approached the house, where they had fortified themselves, with trenches so near as they might fire the house, which they attempted two or three times, but they within quenched it. At last three of them escaped out and ran away, and the rest yielded and were brought to Boston, and were committed to the prison. It was a special providence of God that neither any of them nor of ours were slain or hurt, though many shot passed between them, but every man returned safe and hail. See more, page blank. Here wants the beginning which may be supplied out of the record 64. Other affairs were transacted by the commissioners of the United Colonies, as writing letters to the Swedish governor in Delaware River, concerning the foul injuries offered by him to Mr. Lamberton and those people whom New Haven had planted there, and also to the Dutch governor about the injuries his agent there had also offered and done to them, as burning down their trading house, joining with the Swedes against them, etc. But this was inserted in the letter which the general court sent to him in further answer of that which he sent to them, as is expressed here before, in which letter we declared the complaints which had been made by our confederates both of Hartford and New Haven, of their injurious dealings, as well at Hartford and New Haven as at Delaware, 
Also, our opinion of the justice of the cause of Hartford in respect of title of the land in question between them, which we could not change, except we might see more light than had yet appeared to us by the title the judge insisted upon, nor might we desert either of our confederates in a righteous cause. And we gave also commission to Mr. Lamberton to go treat with the Swedish governor about satisfaction for those injuries and damages, and to agree with him about settling their trade and plantation. This Swedish governor demeaned himself as if he had neither Christian nor moral conscience, getting Mr. Lamberton into his power by feigned and false pretenses, and keeping him prisoner and some of his men, laboring by promises and threats to draw them to accuse him to have conspired with the Indians to cut off the Swedes and Dutch, and on that and not prevailing these ways, then by attempting to make them drunk, so that he might draw something from them, and in the end, though he could gain no testimony, yet he forced him to play blank weight of beaver before he would set him at liberty. He is also a man very furious and passionate, cursing and swearing, and also reviling the English of New Haven as runagates, etc., and himself with his own hands put irons upon one of Mr. Lamberton's men, and went also to the houses of those few families planted there, and forced some of them to swear allegiance to the crown of Sweden, though he had no color of title to that place, and such as would not, he drove away, etc. All these things were clearly proved by Mr. Lamberton's relation, and by other testimony upon oath, but this was before we sent with the commission. Footnote. The settlement of the New Haven men was near the present site of Salem, New Jersey. The story is told by Professor Keene and Windsor's Narratives in Critical History, Volume 4, pages 451 to 457, from the reports of Governor Johann Prince and other Swedish sources, in footnote. About this time our governor received letters from Philip Bell, Esquire, Governor of Barbados, complaining of the distracted condition of that island in regard of diverse sects of families sprung up there, and their turbulent practices, which had forced him to proceed against some of them by banishment, and others of mean quality by whipping and earnestly desiring us to send them some godly ministers and other good people. The governor imparted the letter to the court and elders, but none of our ministers would go thither, and the governor returned answer accordingly. 8. October 12th. The new sachem of Narangasat, Miantunama's brother called Pesicus, a young man about twenty, sent a present to our governor of these, an otter coat and girdle of wampum, and some other wampum, and all worth about fifteen pounds, and desired peace and friendship with us, and withal that we would not aid Ancus against him, whom he intended to make war upon in revenge of his brother's death. Our governor answered the messengers that we were willing to have peace and friendship with him, and to that end had sent messengers to Canonicus, whom it seemed they met with by the way, but we are desired withal that there might be peace with all Indians also, both Ancus and others, and that we had also sent to Usamakin to that end. Therefore, except their sachem would agree to it, we could not receive his present. They replied that they had no instructions about the matter, but would return back and acquaint their sachem with it, and return to us again, and desired to leave their present with our governor in the meantime, which he agreed unto. Thirteenth, Captain Cook and his company, which were sent out against Gorin, returned to Boston, and the captives, being nine, were brought to the governor's house in a military order, viz., the soldiers being in two files, and after every five or six soldiers a prisoner. So being before his door, the commissioners came in, and after the governor had saluted them, he went forth with them, and passing through the files, welcomed them home, blessing God for preserving and prospering them, and he gave them all thanks for their pains and good carriage, and desired of the captain a list of their names, that the court, etc., might know them, if hereafter there should be occasion to make use of such men. This good acceptance and commendation of their service gave many of them more content than their wages, which yet was very liberal, ten shillings per week, and they to victual themselves, and it is needful in all such commonwealths where the state desires to be served by volunteers. Then having conferred privately with the commissioners, he caused the prisoners to be brought before him in his hall, which was a great assembly, and there laid before them their contemptuous carriage toward us, and their obstinacy against all the fair means and moderation we had used to reform them and bring them to do right to those of ours whom they had wronged, and how the Lord had now justly delivered them into our hands. They pleaded in their excuse that they were not of our jurisdiction, and that though they had now yielded themselves to come and answer before us, yet they yielded not as prisoners. The governor replied that they were brought to him as taken in war, and so our commissioners had informed, but if they could plead any other quarter or agreement our commissioners had made with them, we must and would perform it, to which they made no answer. 
So the governor committed them to the marshal to convey to the common prison, and gave order they should be well provided for both lodging and diet. Then he went forth again with the captain, and the soldiers gave him three volleys of shot, and so departed to the inn, where the governor had appointed some refreshing to be provided for them above their wages. The next Lord's Day in the forenoon the prisoners would not come to the meeting, so as the magistrates determined they should be compelled. They agreed to come, so as they might have liberty after sermon to speak if they had an occasion. The magistrate's answer was that they did leave the ordering of things in the church to the elders, but there was no doubt but they might have leave to speak, so as they spake the words of truth and sobriety. So in the afternoon they came and were placed in the fourth seat right before the elders. Mr. Cotton, in his ordinary text, taught them out of Acts 19 of Demetrius pleading for Diana's silver shrines or temples, etc., after sermon, Gorton desired leave to speak, which being granted, he repeated the points of Mr. Cotton's sermon, and coming to that of the silver shrines, he said that in the church there was nothing now but Christ, so that all our ordinances, ministers, sacraments, etc., were but men's inventions for show and pomp, and no other than those silver shrines of Diana. He said also that if Christ lived eternally, then he died eternally, and that it appeared both by his letters and examinations that he held that Christ was incarnate in Adam, and that he was that image of God wherein Adam was created, and that the chief work and merit was in that his incarnation, in that he became such a thing, so mean, etc., and that his being born after of the Virgin Mary and suffering, etc., was but a manifestation of his sufferings, etc., in Adam. Likewise in his letter he condemned and reviled magistracy, calling it an idol, alleging that a man might as well be a slave to his belly as to his own species, Yet being examined, he would acknowledge magistracy to be an ordinance of God in the world as marriage was, viz. No other magistracy but what was natural, as a father over his wife and children, and an hereditary prince over his subjects. When the general court was assembled, Gorton and his company were brought forth upon the lecture day at Boston, and there, before a great assembly, the governor declared the cause and manner of our proceedings against them, and their letters were openly read and all objections answered as first, that they were not within our jurisdiction. To this was answered, first, that they were either within Plymouth or Mr. Fenwick, footnote, i.e. Saybrook, in footnote, and they had yielded their power to us in this cause. Second, if they were under no jurisdiction, then had we none to complain unto you for redress for our injuries, and then we must either right ourselves and our subjects by force of arms, or else we must sit still under all their reproaches and injuries, among which they had sent this insolent passage, quote, we do more disdain that you should send for us to come to you than you could do if we should send for the chiefest among you to come up to us and be employed according to our pleasure in such works as we should appoint you. End quote. As for their opinions, we did not meddle with them for those, otherwise than they had given us occasion by the letters to us, and by their free and open publishing them amongst us, for we wrote to them only about civil controversies between them and our people and gave them no occasion to vent their blasphemies and revilings, etc. And for their title to the Indian's land, we at diverse times desired them to make it appear, but the hours refused, even to our commissioners, whom we sent last to them, and since they were in prison, we offered to send for any witnesses they would desire, but still they refused, so that our title appearing good, and we having now regained our possession, we need not question them any more about that. Their letters being read, they were demanded severally if they would maintain those things which were contained therein. They answered they would, in that sense wherein they wrote them. After this they were brought before the court severally to be examined, diverse of the elders being desired to be present, and because they had said they could give a good interpretation of all they had written, they were examined upon the particular passages. But the interpretation they gave being contradictory to their expressions, they were demanded then if they would retract those expressions, but that they refused, and said still that they should then deny the truth. For instance, in one or two, the letters were directed, one to their neighbors of the Massachusetts, and the other of them to the great honored idol general of the Massachusetts, and by a messenger of their own delivered to our governor, and in many passages in both letters, particularly applied to our courts, our magistrates, our elders, etc., Yet in their examinations about the reproachful passages, they answered, that they meant them of the corrupt estate of mankind in general, and not of us, etc. So whereas in their letters they impute it to us as an error, that we teach that Christ died actually only when he suffered upon Pontius Pilate, and before only in types, upon their examination they say that their meaning was, that his death was actual to the faith of the fathers under the law, 
which is in effect no other than we would hold, yet they accounted an error in us, and would not retract that charge. One of the elders had been in the prison with them, and had conferred with them about their opinions, and they expressed their agreement with him in every point, so as he intended to prove for favor for them, but when he heard their answer upon their examination, he found how he had been deluded by them, for they excel the Jesuits in the art of equivocation, and regard not how false they speak to all other men's apprehensions, so they keep to the rules of their own meaning. Gorton maintained that the image of God wherein Adam was created was Christ, and so the loss of that image was the death of Christ, and the restoration of it in regeneration was Christ's resurrection, and so the death of him that was born of the Virgin Mary was but a manifestation of the former. In their letters, etc., they condemned all ordinances in the church, calling baptism an abomination, and the Lord's Supper the juice of a poor silly grape turned into the blood of Christ by the skill of our magicians, etc., Yet upon examination they would say they did allow them to be the ordinances of Christ, but their meaning was that they were to continue no longer than the infancy of the church lasted, and but to novices then, for after the revelation was written they were to cease, for there is no mention of them, say they, in that book. They were all illiterate men, the ablest of them could not write true English, no not common words, yet they would take upon them the interpretation of the most difficult places of scripture, and rest them any way to serve their own turns as to give one instance for many. Mr. Cotton pressing them with that in Acts 10, Who can forbid water why they should not be baptized? So he commanded them to be baptized, they interpret thus. Who can deny but these have been baptized, seeing they have received the Holy Ghost, etc.? So he allowed them to have been baptized. The shift they were put to, that they might maintain their former opinion, that such as have been baptized with the Holy Ghost need not the outward baptism. The court and the elders spent near a day in discovery of Gorton's deep mysteries which he had boasted of in his letters, and to bring him to conviction, but all was in vain. Much pains was also taken with the rest, but to as little effect. They would acknowledge no error or fault in their writings, and yet would seem sometimes to consent with us in the truth. After all these examinations, the court began to consult about their sentence. The judgment of the elders also had been demanded about their blasphemous speeches and opinions, what punishment was due by the word of God. Their answer was first in writing, that if they should maintain them as expressed in their writings, their offense deserved death by the law of God. The same some of them declared after an open court. But before the court would proceed to determine of their sentence, they agreed first upon their charge, and then calling them all publicly, they declared to them what they had to charge them with out of their letter and speeches. Their charge was this, fees. They were charged to be blasphemous enemies of the true religion of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of all his holy ordinances, and likewise of all civil government among his people, and particularly within this jurisdiction. Then they were demanded whether they did acknowledge this charge to be dust, and did submit to it, or what exceptions they had against it. They answered they did not acknowledge it to be just, but they took no particular exceptions to it, but fell into some caviling speeches, so they were returned to prison again. But fell into some caviling speeches, so they were returned into prison again. Being in prison, they behaved insolently towards their keeper and spake evil of the magistrates. Whereupon some of the magistrates were very earnest to have irons presently put upon them. Others thought it better to forbear all such severity till their sentence were passed. This latter opinion prevailed. After diverse means had been used, both in public and private, to reclaim them, and all proving fruitless, the court proceeded to consider of their sentence, in which the court was much divided. All the magistrates, save three, were of opinion that Gorton ought to die. But the greatest number of the deputies dissenting, that vote did not pass. In the end, all agreed upon this sentence, for seven of them, viz., that they should be dispersed into seven several towns, and there kept to work for their living, and were irons upon one leg, and not to depart the limits of the town, nor by word or writing maintain any of their blasphemous or wicked errors upon pain of death, only with exception for speech with any of the elders, or any other license by any magistrate to confer with them, this censure to continue during the pleasure of the court. There were three more taken in the house with them, but because they had not their hands to the letters, they were dismissed, two of them upon a small ransom, as captives taken in war, and the third freely, for that he was but in his master's house, etc., a fourth, being found to be an ignorant young man, was only enjoined to abide in Watertown upon pains of the court's displeasure only. At the next court they were all sent away, because we found that they did corrupt some of our people, especially the women, by their heresies. About a week after, we sent men to fetch so many of their cattle as might defray our charges, both of the soldiers and of the court, 
which spent many days about them and for their expenses in prison. It came to an all about 160 pounds. There were three who escaped out of the house, these being sent for it to come in. Two of them did so, and one of them, because his hand was not to the letters, was freely discharged. The other was sent home upon his own bond to appear at the next court. Only some of his cattle were taken towards the charges. There was a fourth who had his hand to the first letter, but he died before his soldiers went, and we left his whole estate to his wife and children. Their arms were all taken from them, and some of the guns the court gave, one fowling piece to Pumham, another to Sacanoco, and the liberty granted them to have powder as being now within our jurisdiction. Footnote. The treatment of Gorton as associates, given in such detail by Winthrop, is also the subject of numerous scattered entries in the Records of Massachusetts, Volume 2, page 51, etc. Though the story is repulsive, the procedure is consistent with Massachusetts custom. The come outers were severely punished, but their offense was great. The New England magistrates were, quote, just asses, unquote, they declared, and denunciation and contempt were poured out upon what the colonists revered. There was danger that Gorton might secure a numerous following. In England, at last, he had found a tolerance such as New England was not yet ready to grant. In footnote. The Lord Bartmore, being owner of much land near Virginia, being himself a papist, and his brother Mr. Calvert, the governor there, a papist also, but the colony consisted both of Protestants and papists, he wrote a letter to Captain Gibbons of Boston, and sent him a commission, wherein he made tender of land in Maryland to any of ours that would transport themselves thither, with free liberty of religion, and all other privileges which the place afforded, paying such annual rent as should be agreed upon. But our captain had no mind to further his desire herein, nor had any of our people temptation that way. Footnote. The liberality of Maryland contrasts remarkably with the narrowness of Massachusetts. For consideration of Maryland toleration, see John Fisk, Old Virginia and Her Neighbors, Volume 1, page 319, in footnote. 5th, July 13th. One Captain John Chaddock, son of him that was governor of Bermuda, a godly gentleman, but late removing from them with his family and about a hundred more to Trinidado, where himself and his wife and most of his company died, arrived here in a man of war of about a hundred tons, set forth by the Earl of Warwick. He came hither for planters for Trinidado, Mr. Humphrey having told the Earl that he might be supplied from hence, but here was not any that would enter upon that voyage, etc. So Latour having a pinnace here at the same time, they hired Captain Chaddock for two months at two hundred pounds a month, partly to convey the pinnace home from the danger of Daalney his vessels, and partly for other service against Daalney there. But when they came, they found that Alne had gone into France, and a new fort raised at Port Royal, and a pinnace ready to go forth to trade, so they kept her in so long till the season was over, and as two months out, then he returned to Boston. When he was come in near the town, his men going up upon the main yard to hand in the sail, the main tie break, and the yard falling down, shook off five men into the sea, and though it were calm and smooth water, yet not having their boat out, three of them were drowned. One of these had taken some things out of the deserted castle as they went out. Notwithstanding the sad accident, yet so soon as they came on shore they fell to drinking, etc., and that evening the captain and his master, being at supper and having drank too much, the captain began to speak evil of the country, swearing fearfully that we were a base heathen people. His master answered that he had no reason to say so, for it was the best place that he ever came in. Upon these and other speeches the captain arose and drew his sword, and the master drew forth his pistol, but the company staying them from doing any mischief, the captain swore blood and wounds he would kill him. For this they were brought before the court, and the captain fined twenty pounds and committed to the marshal till he gave security for it. The master for that he was in a drink, as he ingenuously acknowledged, etc., was fined only ten shillings, but was set at liberty from the captain, who had formerly misused other of his men, and was a very proud and intemperate man. But because his ship was the Earl of Warwick's, who had always been forward to do good to our colony, we wrote to him that the fine should be reserved to be at his lordship's disposing when he should please to command or call for it. See the next page. 10. December 27th. By order of the general court, all the magistrates and the teaching elders of the six nearest churches were appointed to be forever governors of the college, and this day they met at Cambridge and considered of the officers of the college and chose a treasurer, H. Pelham, Esquire, being the first in that office. This day five ships that sailed from Boston, three of them were built here, two of three hundred tons, and the other of one sixty. 
One of them was bound for London with many passengers, men of chief rank in the country and great store of beaver. Their adventure was very great, considering the doubtful state of the affairs of England, but many prayers of the churches went with them and followed after them. End of section 17